Section Zero of Imperialism and World Politics, Part One of Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alistair. Imperialism and World Politics, Part One of Four, by Parker Thomas Moon. Preface Of Greek and Roman imperialism, there are admirable histories, but to what convenient volume can one turn for a similar general account of the greater imperialism of our own times? What Rome required three centuries to achieve has been dwarfed by modern nations in barely fifty years. The imperialism of these last five decades will rank, in the writer's opinion, as one of the major phases of modern history and one of two or three foremost problems in world politics and world economics. Seeing the trees but not the wood is so natural a tendency that world events such as the Industrial Revolution, the rise of democracy, and contemporary imperialism are not easily envisaged in their full magnitude until we have had time to put their many specific incidents together in some intelligible synthesis. In the case of imperialism, making such a synthesis is as difficult as it is important, because it means fitting together into one narrative such apparently unrelated persons as Gladstone and Gandhi, Roosevelt and Cecil Rhodes, Menelik and Mussolini, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and King Thabor, because it means combining in one story the Entente Cordiale and the Chinese Consortium, dollar diplomacy and pound sterling politics, alliances and loans, foreign missions, and raw materials, because it means viewing as parts of one political panorama the Near East and the Far East, Mexico and Morocco, the Philippines and Fiji, Turkestan and Transvaal, Congo and Cuba. Difficult as it may be to accomplish the task at all satisfactorily, such a synthesis seems well worth attempting. That is the primary purpose of this book. The second purpose is to present a more realistic view of world politics than is offered by conventionalised chronological narratives of European diplomacy. Nothing is more striking in the mass of secret treaties and confidential official documents published since the war than the overwhelming evidence that the old diplomacy of Europe was feverishly and more or less frankly devoted to gaining economic or strategic advantages and political prestige by appropriating the backward lands of Asia, Africa, the Balkans and the Pacific. Imperialism was the reality, diplomacy its superficial expression. If this is true, as it appears to be, then the story of international relations before 1914 cannot be interpreted simply as a matter of narrowly European vendettas and erratic personalities. More attention must be given to the mines and railway concessions, the colonial markets and naval bases, in which the diplomats themselves were so vitally interested. By emphasising the fact that the great powers are not nations, but nation empires, and by devoting a series of chapters to the reasons for international rivalry in arenas of conflict, such as North Africa, the Near East, the Middle East, the Far East and the Pacific, the writer has endeavoured to concentrate attention on the things for which the diplomats have contended, rather than on the diplomats themselves. An effort has been made likewise to study the economic and social forces behind diplomacy. To say that Germany threatened France with war about Morocco, or that France seized Tunis, is worse than meaningless. Probably a majority of Frenchmen would have refused to seize Tunis had they been consulted. Certainly on the Moroccan question, the Kaiser and his own ministers were at variance. Nations are rarely units in such matters. The habit of regarding them as units has unfortunately been strengthened of late by passionate controversies respecting the causes of the Great War. Attempting to indict one nation and vindicate another, to make Germany or the Allies guilty or innocent, has the unfortunate effect of obscuring the dynamic factors of which the German and other governments were, and are, instruments. Stressing these factors, the first few chapters of this book analyse the business interests, the social groups, the professional propaganda, the popular sentiments, the theories, and the economic conditions which seem to have dominated imperialist diplomacy. 
Throughout the book, it is to be hoped, the reader will see the exporter, the factory owner, the concession hunter, the missionary, the admiral, peering over the shoulder of the diplomat. The narrative might be more conventional if it culminated in the Great War. Instead, it continues into the present year. Perhaps we are now far enough removed from 1914 to realise that it is historically and psychologically inaccurate to treat European diplomacy before that fatal year as if its sole trend had been towards Sarajevo. The ideas and interests productive of war in 1914 had caused many previous wars, and in large measure they have continued to exist since 1914. The present volume, therefore, is written around ideas and interests rather than around the war and its concluding chapter is devoted not to the indictment of any nation or diplomatist, but to an evaluation of the past achievements and present problems of imperialism. For the problems, the author candidly confesses that he can see no solutions, except more enlightened public opinion and more effective international cooperation. But no panacea is offered. For the purpose of this book is analytical and historical rather than controversial. For specialists, there exists an appalling number of works on various regional and topical subdivisions of the subject. With these, the present volume is not intended to compare or compete. It is designed for the general reader and for college classes as a survey of the causes and motives, the history and the effects of imperialist world politics during the 19th and 20th centuries. It can make no claim to finality. Before the definitive history of imperialism can be composed, there are many monographs to be written by qualified specialists. To exhaust even the existing printed matter bearing on the subject would require a busy lifetime. The writer does not pretend to have utilised more than a modest portion of the innumerable books, pamphlets, articles and archives available on almost every chapter. Nor has any consistent effort been made to cite all sources, or to give extensive bibliographical references since, in a book covering so broad a field, a morass of footnotes could easily swamp the reader without satisfying the scholar. Here and there, however, are a few notes given to indicate some of the more interesting documents published in the postbellum flood of diplomatic revelations, and occasionally other important public papers and secondary works are mentioned. For readers who wish to venture further afield, the footnotes may be supplemented by consulting the selected bibliographies in my syllabus on international relations and the quarterly lists of books and documents in foreign affairs. For their generous courtesy in permitting the use of maps previously published in their own works, I am grateful to Professors Carlton J. H. Hayes for the maps of Asia and Africa from his Political and Social History of Modern Europe and the map of the British Empire adapted from a map in his Brief History of the Great War, Arthur M. Schlesinger, for the maps of the Far East and the Pacific from his Political and Social History of the United States, Edward M. Earle, for the map of the Turkish Railways from his Turkey, the Great Powers and the Baghdad Railway, Leonardo Packard and Charles P. Sinnott, for the map of the lands of the Caribbean Sea from their Nations as Neighbours, and Mr. James A. Williamson, for the map of South Africa from his Brief History of British Expansion. These maps are reproduced with the gracious consent of Macmillan and Company LTD, the publishers of Mr. Williamson's book, and of the Macmillan Company, the publishers of the other books mentioned. Credit is also due to the skilful engravers who transformed eight rude manuscript sketches into intelligible maps. Full acknowledgement of my debt to the scholars and statesmen whose works have been drawn upon, often without special mention, and to the librarians here and in Paris, Geneva and London, who aided and tolerated a troublesome reader, would be impossible in these few lines. Nor can I, finally, find fit words to thank that tenth muse whose constant encouragement made the completion of this task possible and for whose sake I would this were a better book. Parker Thomas Moon, New York, September 3rd, 1926 End of section zero
Section 1 of Imperialism and World Politics, Part 1 of 4, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 1. Significance of Imperialism, World Conquest and World Unrest. The American public is barely beginning to realise the significance of the present-day imperialism, which is now approaching its denouement. Of ancient imperialism, of the empires of Alexander, of Cyrus, of Caesar, we have heard much, and of Napoleon's spectacular exploits every schoolboy has read. But the realms conquered by military emperors of past ages were baubles, trifles compared with the far-flung dominions which have been won, more often with the pen than by the sword, in our own supposedly prosaic generation. It is with this contemporary empire building and its effects on international relations, on our prosperity and our security, on industry and civilization, that this study is concerned. Little as the general public may realize the fact, imperialism is the most impressive achievement and the most momentous world problem of our age. Perhaps this statement should be thrust home. More than half of the world's land surface and more than a billion human beings are included in the colonies and backward countries dominated by a few imperialist nations. Every man, woman and child in Great Britain has ten colonial subjects, black, brown and yellow. For every acre in France there are twenty in the French colonies and protectorates. Italy is one-sixth as large as her colonies, Portugal one-twenty-third, Belgium one-eightieth. The nations of Western Europe are dwarfs beside their colonial possessions. How prevalent imperialism was in Europe before the war, and still remains, is difficult for Americans to appreciate since the average American has been accustomed, at any rate before the disillusionment of 1919, to think that the seizure of territory was somewhat akin to theft, that militarism and aggressive war were out of date among democratic nations, that conquest was contrary to the normal principles of international morality, albeit some slight deviation from such principles might be pardoned or ignored. If we desired Louisiana or Alaska, we purchased it. If we annexed the Philippines, we paid a price in gold. Footnote. The payment in this case was not strictly speaking a purchase price. Confer Infra, page 396. See Imperialism and World Politics, Part 3, Section 7. Subheading, Educating the Filipinos. Footnote ends. This, however, is not and has not been the attitude of imperialist nations of Europe or of Europeanized Japan. French statesmen have vehemently declared the conquest of colonies to be not only merely permissible, but imperative for France, and the Third Republic has won almost five million square miles. Italian patriots have proclaimed it a sacred duty, and Italy, despite all discouragements, has gained almost a million square miles. Englishmen have regarded it, in Kipling's words, as the white man's burden, which civilised peoples dare not shirk, and in the last half-century four million square miles have been added to the British Empire, besides many a veiled protectorate and sphere of influence not formally annexed. Germany at first, under Bismarck's cautious guidance, abstained from African and Asiatic empire building, but at length plunged into world politics rather late to appropriate a million square miles in Africa and the East Indies to dominate the rich Asiatic empire of the Ottoman sultans, and finally to stake all and lose all in the titanic conflict of 1914. Austria-Hungary, as lesser partner in the Central European coalition, strove to master the Balkans. Russian Tsars, not content with their broad domain in Europe and Siberia, stretched acquisitive hands into Central Asia, Persia, Manchuria, and Mongolia, and looked hungrily on Turkey, Tibet, and Afghanistan. Japan, aptly imitating Europe, took Formosa, Korea, part of Manchuria, Shantung, German islands in the Pacific, and, during the Great War, 
attempted at a single stroke to make all China virtually a Japanese protectorate. All the great powers save the United States boldly and frankly set themselves to the epic task in the 19th century of carving out stupendous colonial empires, and even the United States, feeling the same urge to action, reached into the Pacific and into the Caribbean for modest parcels of colonial territory. Nor were the great powers more imperialist than several of the smaller nations. Belgium, with her vast property in Central Africa, Portugal, with colonies larger than the German Kaisers, Spain, clinging tenaciously to a strip of Morocco, together with the pitiable fragments of her former colonial grandeur, and Holland, glorifying in a magnificent East Indian island empire, have vied with the stronger states in seeking the rewards which all hoped to win in the stirring game of world politics. World politics. It is a phrase to conjure with. Imperialism has given birth to worldwide empires, to worldwide diplomacy. Great Britain is not, in truth, a European nation, but the nucleus of a universal power. The tricolour of France flies in the Congo jungle, on Sahara sands, above Indo-Chinese rice fields. European diplomatists act the drama of international relations on a stage as broad as Earth. Often a single diplomatic bargain, signed so easily in a European capital, affects the destinies of unwitting millions in all four quarters of the globe. The Anglo-French Agreement of 1904, for example, dealt with Newfoundland in America, the New Hebrides in Oceania, Siam in Asia, Morocco and Egypt and other colonies in Africa. Such is the meaning of world politics. And imperialism is the root and raison d'etre of world politics. If, from this commanding standpoint, one reviews the recent history of international relations, the alliances, ententes, crises, and wars reveal a new meaning. Almost without exception, they were but surface manifestations of the swift, deep current of imperialism. When France and England trembled on the verge of war in 1898, during the Fashoda Crisis, imperialist rivalry for a million or so square miles of the African Sudan was the cause. The German Emperor's celebrated telegram to President Kruger, congratulating him on having repulsed a British invasion, was more than a breach of international etiquette. It was a revelation of the tense imperialist competition in South Africa, and as such, it both angered and alarmed British statesmen. The Moroccan crises of 1905 and 1911, which so nearly embroiled all European war, were not unique results of some peculiarly German, or peculiarly French, aggressiveness. Rather, they were two of the innumerable explosions which have been caused when the aims of imperialist nations happened to cross. The South African War of 1899 may have been inaugurated by the truculent Boers, but it would never have been fought had English imperialism not been active in South Africa. Nor would the Spanish-American War have occurred if there had been no American interests in Cuba. The greatest war the 20th century had witnessed before 1914 was the purely imperialist Russo-Japanese struggle for Korea and Manchuria. And the greatest of all wars was caused more by imperialism than by any other single factor. Americans who prefer to believe that the catastrophe of 1914 was brought about by the personal vagaries of William Hohenzollern may cherish their belief if they will, but the facts are opposed to it. The very alignment of the European powers was dictated by imperialism, not by race or democracy or kinship of culture. Germany, Austria, Hungary and Turkey were allied by Teutonic domination of the Near East. Republican France and monarchist England were bound together by the far-reaching imperialist bargain of 1904. Liberal England and Tsarist Russia by an agreement of 1907 regarding imperialist interests in Persia, Afghanistan, Tibet. It is easy to heap up the evidence, though no laboured proof is intended here. 
when the German ambassador in 1914 offered to respect the integrity of Belgium and France, the significant question of Sir Edward Grey was whether Germany intended to take the French colonies. During the war, even when hard-pressed on the battlefields of France, the Allies spared troops to conquer German colonies and occupy choice portions of Turkey. When the German government secretly formulated its war aims for communication to President Wilson, a larger share of the world's colonies was the important point. The Allies, for their part, while professing publicly their interest in small nations and the sanctity of treaties, quietly arranged by a series of secret treaties the division to be made of Germany's colonies and of Turkey if victory should be theirs. And when victory was achieved, the Allies made it one of their first concerns at the Paris Peace Conference to wring from President Wilson's unwilling lips an assurance that, though the coveted colonial and Near Eastern territories might be nominally internationalised as mandates, the mandates would be given to the Allies in accordance with the secret treaties. Contrary to a quite general impression, imperialism is not a closed story now that the German colonies have been divided. The climax has not yet been reached. The denouement is still uncertain. Never was imperialist rivalry so keen as after the Great War. We are now entering a period of intensified international economic competition, in which the problem of imperialism is becoming all the more acute, because most of the backward areas available for colonies have already been appropriated. Competition is stimulated by scarcity. There are no longer vast unclaimed reaches of Africa to sate the appetites of rising powers. Moreover, tariff barriers are being erected in hitherto open colonies. Governments are taking a more vital interest and sometimes officially participating in the international scramble for oil, railway and mining concessions. The tide of immigrant surplus population from Europe and Asia is being turned back upon itself by American restrictions, to seek new outlets. Backward peoples are fast becoming educated to the point of providing a really important and rapidly increasing market for manufactures. Raw materials are becoming more and more the stakes of diplomacy. A few instances of the increasing economic importance of the colonies will make these general statements more convincing. The exports of the United States to our own and other colonies amounted in 1900 to less than one-fifth of a billion dollars, in 1913 to two-thirds of a billion, in 1920 to more than a billion and a half. In 20 years, our exports to colonies were multiplied by 8.8, .8, other exports only by 5.4. These figures are mute witnesses to the all-important fact that the United States like other industrial nations, is becoming increasingly dependent on non-European countries as markets for manufactured goods. Colonial markets are growing much more rapidly than European markets. To put it more clearly, non-European countries absorbed only 23% of the exports of the United States before 1900, the average from 1895 to 9, but their share rose to 40% in 1913 then 46% in 1920, and 49.8% in 1923. Almost 60% of the new business which American exporters have gained since the 1890s has been found in Asia, Africa, and America. To generalise, in the decade from 1913 to 1923, the imports of colonies increased by 51%, while the imports of other countries increased by less than 16%. Colonies in 1923 meant $5 billion worth of export business, of which 2 billions had been added in a decade. Conversely, as industrial countries import more raw materials and foodstuffs, colonial sources of supply are drawn upon more and more heavily. To take the United States as an example again, the value of imports from colonies increased almost tenfold in the two decades from 1900 to 1920. From colonies and quasi-colonial backward countries, we get our crude rubber, much of our oil, 
fertilizers for farmlands, fruit and coffee for the breakfast table, chocolate and sugar for the confectioner, tobacco, tea, hemp for rope, and jute for all the millions of bags in which goods are packed for shipment, indispensable manganese for our steel mills. Inconceivably more do the less richly endowed European nations rely upon colonial products. Colonial investments, too, are multiplying, mounting into billions of dollars for the United States, and into tens of billions for the imperialist nations collectively. More will be said later about their importance. Colonies and backward countries, spoils of diplomacy before the war, are vital features of everyday business today. Whether they are closed or open, developed or retarded, monopolised or shared freely, will be a much more significant question tomorrow than it was yesterday. Perhaps even more challenging as an omen of the approaching climax of imperialism is the uneasy stirring of non-European races which have been subjected to enough European rule to become restive. During the last few years, a spirit of rebellious self-determination has seized upon hitherto inert subject races. Nationalist Turkey has turned against European exploitation. Nationalist Egypt has won independence. Indian nationalism has assumed monumental proportions. Nationalist Persia and Afghanistan have cast off British shackles. Filipinos have become more insistent in their pleas for independence. Whether this movement of non-European peoples for self-government will reach peaceful maturity is a grave question for the entire civilised world. But even more interesting is the prospect, of which one can only catch faint glimpses now, beyond the question of self-government. What will be the situation when India's factories now springing up like mushrooms, are numbered by the hundreds of thousands instead of by thousands, when China's industrious masses are harnessed, as more than a million Japanese now are, to modern industrial machinery, when Asiatic manufacturers on a large scale compete with European and American industries. Steadily and surely, and far more rapidly than many casual observers believe, the so-called backward nations are borrowing not only superficial traits of European civilization, but European methods of industry, of war, of government, of education. The day is dawning when the deficiencies which made these peoples backward and impotent in the face of European imperialism will no longer exist, and like Japan, such countries as China, India, Persia, Egypt, Turkey, Siam, and perhaps even parts of Africa, will use the machines and the weapons and respond to the nationalistic and democratic sentiments which have given Europe her seemingly impregnable world mastery. India has 320 millions to Great Britain's 44 millions of inhabitants. China has possibly 400 millions to the 39 of France. Asia and Africa have over a billion to Europe's half billion. The imperialist great powers of today are but pygmies prodding giants into activity. Which will be the great powers of tomorrow? In the following chapters, imperialism will be viewed both as an achievement and as a world problem, the significance of which has been merely suggested in the foregoing rather sketchy introduction. The most natural starting point for a systematic study will be found in the background, beginnings and causes of the movement. After that, we may proceed chapter by chapter with a survey of its development and, at the end, look back over the material to generalise and criticise. End of section one. Section two of Imperialism and World Politics, part one of four, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 2. Two Changes of Mind Most of us are inclined to believe that our convictions are true and will remain true. Few realise with what astounding rapidity the most fundamental political and economic dogmas may be revolutionised if, for no other reason than to illustrate this changeability of ideas, it is worth while to review the interesting process by which Europe was first enamoured of colonial empire, 
then disillusioned, then reconverted to the old faith in the modernised form of imperialism. If one would analyse international relations today, one should first digest the fact that only 50 years ago, the foremost statesmen of Europe were just as firmly convinced of the futility and folly as their predecessors had been and their successors were to be persuaded of, the value and virtue of imperialism. Another purpose, however, will also be served by a preliminary study of the historical and economic antecedents of modern empire building. Like trees, great historical events spring from a soil enriched by the remains of earlier growths. The todays of our lives and the tomorrows arise from the yesterdays. The infant present cannot deny the parent past. The domination of the world by European powers, which in modern times seems so natural as rarely to provoke the student's curiosity, is in reality one of the most astonishing paradoxes of history. During the long millenniums while powerful empires and civilised cities were rising and falling in ancient Egypt, in Babylon, in Asia and China, most of Europe was a savage wilderness. In the case of the Phoenicians, at least, backward Europe received colonists from Asia, and Spain was colonised by Carthage. Only toward the very close of ancient history did Greece and Rome, the southern fringe of the European continent, in contact with Asiatic and African civilization, begin to play any conspicuous role in the world. With the decline of Rome, Europe once more fell into weakness, and again became subject to colonization and conquest by Asiatic and African powers. Into Spain came the Moors from northern Africa, into southeastern Europe the Asiatic Turks fought their way. Surely Europe seemed destined to be the footstool of other continents, not the imperial mistress of the world. The beginnings, however, of Europe's rise to world power became evident about the time of the Crusades, when Christendom, turning at bay, sent its armies to invade the Afro-Asiatic Mohammedan world, and when the Italian city-states such as Amalfi, Venice, Florence, Genoa and Pisa reaching out for the commerce of the East, established their warehouses, von Duchy, in the cities of Asia Minor. From the 12th to the 15th century, the Italian cities monopolised the trade routes linking the Eastern Mediterranean with the Asiatic countries, whence came spices, gems, drugs, and many other luxuries desired by noblemen and burgher. This commercial expansion into the Near East was the prelude to and the economic reason for, the epochal 15th century European voyages of discovery. Subsection. Mercantilism, or the Creed of Princes. One may well inquire why the great explorers of the 15th and 16th centuries were sent out not by the Italian commercial city-states, nor by the opulent Hanseatic League of the German commercial cities, but by the commercially backward countries, predominantly agricultural countries such as Portugal, Spain, England and France. An answer is suggested by even a cursory sketch of certain economic conditions at the time. Gold and silver were relatively scarce in medieval Europe. As commerce expanded, the supply of precious metals became so inadequate as to occasion inconvenience, even anxiety especially in countries which had no mines. Furthermore, the rising national kings needed gold or silver to maintain their courts, to increase their power, to hire soldiers, to pay for wars. Yet it was difficult to obtain the precious metals, except in one of two ways. The Italian city-states which monopolised the Asiatic trade obtained supplies from Asia, and from their lucrative business as middlemen between Europe and Asia. The Germans had mines as well as profitable trade. Other countries resorted to many and curious, but largely futile expedients, such as engaging alchemists to transmute baser metals into gold, or forbidding the export of bullion and coins, or debasing the coinage. It is not difficult to understand, then, why enterprising monarchs in Western Europe hungered for new mines of precious metals why explorers searched so avidly for gold and silver. That would be one solution of the difficulty. 
Or, if a Western European nation could open up a new trade route to Asia and trade directly with the East, not only could it escape paying the extortionate prices of Italian and German middlemen, but it could hope to amass wealth in the role of retailer. The latter solution was found by the little kingdom of Portugal, whose explorers bravely ventured down the unknown West African coast until they rounded the Cape, reached India from the south in 1498, and brought back cargoes of spices by the new all-water route. Naturally, under the prevailing standards of international ethics, they claimed a monopoly of their new route, and sought to exploit it to the ultimate degree. Naturally, the Portuguese king declined an offer from mercantile Venice to purchase wholesale all the spices imported via the Cape. 1521. Portugal's aim was not colonisation, but commercial profit. Trading posts were established along the African coasts, on the shores of the Indian Ocean, at the entrance to the Persian Gulf, and, above all, in the spice-producing East Indies. To Lisbon, the Portuguese vessels, sailing in secrecy under naval convoy, brought their rich freight. And to the Casa de India at Lisbon, wholesale warehouse of oriental spices and luxuries, came Dutch and French and English merchants to buy from Portugal. The king's coffers received, it was estimated, $750,000 a year net profit, and hundreds of Portuguese officials and traders enriched themselves. Spain, on the other hand, failed to find a new route to the Spice Islands, but discovered instead the silver and gold mines of America. It has been estimated that from 1493 to 1640, Spain got in America about 875 tonnes of gold and 45,720 tonnes of silver, and on this treasure the king levied a royalty of 20%, the quinto. Admitting that these figures may be far from scientific accuracy, and that much of this bullion was captured en route by British or other adventurous mariners, and that through commerce much found its way into other countries, and even that the influx of gold and silver may have been injurious to Spain's economic development, the facts remain nevertheless that the Spanish court was brilliant and powerful in the 16th century, and that Spain's colonial conquests appeared to be so marvellously profitable as to excite the cupidity of less fortunate West European monarchs. For a time to be sure, France and England were content to purchase spices from Lisbon and send out a few explorers. The Dutch, at that time subject to Spain, became the chief carriers and distributors of Spanish and Portuguese trade, but toward the end of the 16th century the Dutch rebelled against Spain, and, as Spain and Portugal were united under Philip II's sceptre, began to prey on Portugal's colonial commercial empire. It is not necessary to retell the familiar story here, but merely to emphasise the economic aspect which has so potently affected modern nationalistic economic policies. The East India Company, chartered by the Netherlands in 1602, wrested from Portugal the route round the Cape, the trading posts in the East, and the East Indies, and for generations monopolised the spice trade, despite persistent efforts of French and English to seize a share. Dutch commerce prospered, stately ships crowded Dutch ports, and the trident of Neptune seemed well in the grasp of Holland. The sequence of events which have been so roughly sketched here led almost inevitably to a policy which has continued to sway men's minds even to the present day the policy of mercantilism. Seventeenth-century rulers naturally ascribed Spain's greatness to the fabulous wealth of American colonial mines, Portugal's ephemeral brilliance, to the East Indian trade, and Holland's rise to her colonies and commerce. Less favoured nations, unable to find exclusive trade routes to the Orient, or to tap nature's treasures of silver and gold, must find some other method of gaining wealth if they would not be impoverished. Richelieu, the great French statesman of the early 17th century, looked with envy on the Dutch, whose trade with the East and West Indies was so lucrative. 
France, he claimed, should emulate Holland. Instead of paying so dearly for imports from other countries, France should make her own cloth, raise her own food, and press her own wine, manufacture goods for export, and thus draw money from other countries. And, be it remarked, he considered naval power and colonial empire indispensable features of this economic programme. Similarly, John de Witt, Grand Pensionary of the Netherlands, in his political maxims, linked colonies with commerce and industry as the trinity responsible for Dutch power. How general this conviction became may be inferred from the fact that Prussia, Denmark, Sweden, England and France in the 17th century all made some effort to found colonies, as well as to foster shipping, industry and export trade. The theories inspiring these ventures were oftentimes so crude that the various tyro in economic science can demonstrate their falsity. Nevertheless, in one form or another, with many a variation, the policy of colonial commercialism was so universal in the 17th century, and so remarkably manifested in the 18th century, that it cannot be lightly dismissed as a fallacy. It was the direct application of political national monarchy to the economic conditions of the age. Prefigured in the writings of Moncretien, Richelieu, De Witt, Thomas Munn, Rayleigh, Sir Joshua Child and others, and practised perhaps most conspicuously by Louis XIV's celebrated minister Colbert, this policy of encouraging industries, exports, colonies and shipping came to be known as Colbertism, or more generally mercantilism. Economic policies more or less well suited to the conditions under which they were originated survive long after the conditions have changed. And the policy of mercantilism, dignified in its hoary age, still survives today, though it has donned the garb of modern economic phraseology and adopted an alias, imperialism. It would not be unenlightening to recapitulate the conditions which gave birth to mercantilism, if we would clear our minds of tradition before attempting to judge the validity of mercantilist policies under 20th century conditions. In the 17th and 18th centuries, mercantilism took form in response to a set of political, economic and religious conditions which have since been swept away. It was an edifice built on foundations which have been washed away by the current of progress. One of these foundations was royal autocracy. Footnote. Although mercantilism was practised in Holland and England after autocracy had fallen. Footnote ends. Ambitious and despotic kings of England, of France, of Denmark, of Spain, of Prussia, of Sweden, needed gold for their growing expenditures and men, obtainable for gold, and ships for their incessant wars. Hence the emphasis on obtaining precious metals by commerce, on which kings levied duties, or by discovery of mines, from which kings exacted royalties and hence the emphasis on national merchant marines, easily convertible into naval auxiliaries. Religion played a less important part. Missionary zeal, one needs hardly say, was a significant factor in early explorations and in later colonisation, but missionary zeal is not a reason for wholesale colonial conquests unless, as in early modern times, it be generally assumed that monarchs should dictate the religion of subjects and that conquered natives should be converted without choice. More significant in this analysis was the economic situation. The first naive greed for trade routes and gold mines, notable in the 15th century, was modified by subsequent economic transformations. To begin with, the building of larger ships for ocean voyages and, incidentally, the improvement of roads in Europe made commerce in bulkier goods possible and profitable. Manufacturing industries in Europe, stimulated by this event as well as by other causes, grew amazingly in the 17th and 18th centuries, until home markets were glutted and foreign markets bitterly contested. Woolen cloth and alcoholic beverages, probably the two leading commodities manufactured for export, were goods that could be made in almost every country. Competition was necessarily keen 
and the European market was not only limited but fenced about with mercantilist restrictions and tariffs since each nation endeavoured to cut its own imports to the minimum. Under these conditions, what could be more natural than for each nation to acquire colonies from which it could obtain raw materials and non-competitive colonial products, and to which it could sell manufactures without hindrance or competition? Such were the foundations of mercantilism and of the so-called old colonial system. By the middle of the 18th century, France and England had emerged as leading mercantilist powers, France applying Colbert's principles rigidly to her vast domains in the St. Lawrence and Mississippi Valleys and in the French West Indies, England enforcing the system less consistently in her West Indian and American colonies. Spain still drew millions of pesos from the mines of the huge Spanish colonial empire in America, besides plantation products from the West Indies and Philippines. The Dutch had exploited the spice-producing East Indies so ruthlessly, and the monopolistic management of these colonies had become so corrupt and inefficient, that decay had already set in. Portugal had lost most of the East Indies, and on the African coast retained only a few scant footholds, but still had the immense colony in Brazil, in which gold and diamond mining yielded royalties to the king, and fertile plantations produced coffee and sugar. Prussia had sold its holdings on the Gold Coast of Africa to Holland for 7,200 ducats in 1725, and dropped out of the race. Footnote. The Netherlands in turn sold its Gold Coast holdings to Great Britain in 1867. Confer Herslet, Map of Africa by Treaty, Volume 2, page 674-8. to The Danish posts on the Gold Coast were ceded to Great Britain in 1850. Footnote ends. Denmark and Sweden held minor colonies. Subsection. Laissez-faire, or the creed of merchant princes. Imposing as was its façade, this old colonial edifice of the 18th century was founded on shifting sands. Its fall was not long delayed. Sixty years from 1763 to 1823, witnessed the shattering of the four greatest colonial empires. The French colonial empire was destroyed, or rather annexed, by Great Britain in 1763, at the close of a long series of wars. The British in turn suffered the Declaration of Independence by 13 important American colonies in 1776, seemed to presage the collapse of the empire. The grim hand of destiny touched next the Spanish realm in South America, and in the generation from about 1810 to about 1825, Spain was excluded from the continent. Simultaneously, Brazil separated from Portugal in 1822. He must have been an incorrigible believer whose faith in the old colonial system was not shaken by this series of cataclysms. Turgot's famous dictum, Colonies are like fruits which cling to the tree only till they ripen, uttered in the middle of the 18th century seems now to have been irrefutably proved. As if more proof were needed, in 1837 rebellion raised its head in Canada, and Lord Durham, who was sent to investigate, reported that the Canadian colonists should be granted responsible self-government. One by one, the British colonies of Canada, New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania, New Zealand, Cape Colony and Queensland, received self-government during the two decades that followed Lord Durham's report, and many Englishmen assumed that self-government was a step towards emancipation. Disraeli wrote to the British Foreign Minister in 1852, These wretched colonies will be all independent too in a few years, and they are a millstone around our necks. Gladstone sonorously expressed his conviction in April 1870 that colonies grow until they arrive at that stage of their progression in which separation from the mother country inevitably takes place. In the past they had done so by bloodshed. In the future the mother country should gracefully and peacefully surrender her authority. 
Even more devastating was the change in economic facts and theories in the century from 1775 to 1875. Colonial rebellions might shatter the pillars, but these economic changes swept away the foundations of the old mercantilist colonial system. The altered facts of the economic situation may be considered first. The invention of spinning machines, power looms, steam engines, and new metallurgical processes brought about an industrial revolution in England during this epoch. As the secrets of the inventions were at first carefully guarded, and as establishment of steam power factories was in any case difficult for economically backward peoples, England during the first three quarters of the 19th century was almost unrivalled in the manufacture of machine-made textiles, chiefly cotton cloth, and of iron and hardware, which could be sold at less than handmade goods. Governmental restriction of colonial markets for such goods was quite unnecessary, as long as English industry could undersell its lagging foreign competitors. Moreover, to sparse colonial populations less of such goods could be sold than to populous European nations. What the facts of the economic situation demanded, from the English manufacturer's point of view, was free access to European markets and indifference to colonial aggrandizement. The facts demanded a new political economy antithetical to the principles of mercantilism. By one of the more fateful coincidences of history, a new political economy was at hand, ready for application. Turgot and the French economistes, or physiocrats in the third quarter of the 18th century, had already sketched in broad lines a political economy of individual freedom, which was summed up in the phrase laissez-faire. Adam Smith, father of the classical political economy in England, had expounded somewhat similar but more convincingly elaborated doctrines in The Wealth of Nations, 1776. Greater gain, he argued, was to be obtained by free trade, permitting natural specialisation of industry than by mercantilist regulation of commerce. Some interference with commercial liberty, the Navigation Act, might be justified on the grounds of national defence. But, and this was the important point, it was certainly unprofitable economically. Applying his principles specifically to colonies, Smith asserted that although natural colonial trade would be profitable to all countries, attempts to monopolise colonial trade cause mere loss instead of profit to the body of the people. The overgrowth of British colonial trade had sucked capital away from other branches of business and caused decay in Britain's general foreign trade. Then, too, the colonies were a heavy burden on the national exchequer. From an economic point of view, he concluded, Great Britain would profit by abandoning her empire. The truth of this bold statement seemed to be demonstrated when, after the successful rebellion of the American colonies, Great Britain's exports to the United States rose to higher figures than they had attained before the Revolution. Later British economists of the classical school, Malthus, Ricardo, James Mill, J.R. McCulloch, and others, made the economic value of free trade and the economic absurdity of mercantilism fundamental principles of orthodox political economy. Cobden and Bright popularised the principles of free trade in their great campaign against the Corn Laws. Manufacturers fell into line. It is perhaps significant that the free trade movement became known as the Manchester School, or simply Manchesterism, taking its name from the city which was truly the heart of the cotton industry. Protective duties were taken off 750 articles in 1842 by Peel. The Corn Laws, emblematic of the old system, fell in 1846, and with them vanished the duties on about 150 other articles of food, raw materials, and manufactures. The Navigation Laws, enforcing a mercantilist policy towards shipping, were repealed in 1849. Shortly afterwards, Gladstone's reforms of 1853 and 1860, and the removal of the import duty on timber in 1866, demolished the last ramparts of English mercantilism. While the doctrine of free trade was undermining the economic foundations of colonial imperialism, philosophical and political radicalism attacked the system from another angle. The doctrines of individual liberty, democracy and cosmopolitanism 
which gradually gained popularity among radical thinkers in the early 19th century, and among other classes subsequently, were decidedly anti-imperialistic in their original tendency. Jeremy Bentham, father of British philosophical radicalism, expressed his views in a letter entitled Emancipate Your Colonies, addressed to the French National Convention in 1793 and published in 1830. Colonies, he held, were not only unprofitable, but involved great military and naval expense, danger of foreign war, and political corruption in the mother country. James Mill contributed an article on Colony to the 1818 supplement to the Encyclopaedia Britannica, stressing the expense, corruption, and enmities arising from the old colonial system, and condemning particularly the prevalent practice of settling convicts in colonies. Far from convincing the masses, in the first half of the 19th century these anti-colonial doctrines were shared only by a handful of progressive thinkers. Nevertheless, their influence widened by degrees. Remarkably effective in the work of propaganda was the firebrand Richard Cobden, the popular apostle of free trade and pacifism. The man who called the British government a standing conspiracy to rob and bamboozle the people. This fearless iconoclast assailed British rule in India as utterly unprofitable and unnatural. Ultimately, of course, he predicted, nature will assert the supremacy of her laws, and the white skins will withdraw to their own latitudes, leaving the Hindus to the enjoyment of the climate to which their complexion is suited. But in the meantime, possession of India would breed all kinds of trouble, loss and disgrace. It would cost blood and gold. It might demoralise the British government just as Greece and Rome were corrupted by the East. Recognising the strong hold, however, which colonialism still had upon popular sentiment even in 1842, Cobden declared, The colonial system, with all its dazzling appeal to the passions of the people, can never be got rid of except by the indirect process of free trade which will gradually and imperceptibly loose the bonds, which unite our colonies to us by a mistaken attitude of self-interest. As the years rolled by, the movement gained momentum. Soon we find, in 1862-3, an Oxford professor of history, Goldwyn Smith, proclaiming in a series of letters to the Daily News that although colonies were once profitable in the days of commercial monopoly, there was no longer any reason for retaining them now that trade everywhere is free or becoming free. England should adopt a policy of emancipating her colonies. Such views were by no means allowed to pass unchallenged, but they were shared by more than one official. Henry Thring, Home Office Counsel, who drafted legislation for the government, proposed in 1865 that any colony at maturity should be permitted, as a matter of course, to become independent. Herman Merivale, permanent undersecretary for colonies from 1848 to 1860, accepted the doctrine that colonies eventually secede. Moreover, With the colonial trade thrown open and colonisation at an end, it is obvious that the leading motives which induced our ancestors to found and maintain a colonial empire no longer exist. His successor from 1860 to 1871, Sir Frederick Rogers, Lord Blackford, said he always believed so strongly that he could hardly realise the possibility of anyone seriously thinking the contrary, that the destiny of our colonies is independence. Another colonial official, Sir Henry Taylor, in 1864, referred to the British possessions in America as a sort of damnosa hereditas. Subsection. Anti-imperialism in the mid-Victorian age. The increasing prevalence of anti-imperialistic views helps to explain what would otherwise seem like an astonishing indifference to colonial expansion in Victorian England prior to the 70s and 80s. After the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, which had brought Heligoland, Malta, Tobago, St. Lucia, Mauritius, Trinidad, Guiana, Cape Colony, and Ceylon into the fold. 
British colonial expansion was singularly sluggish for more than half a century. To be sure, the Indian realm was consolidated and expanded. Aden, 1839, and a few other strategic points on the route to India were appropriated. The Australian colonies grew inevitably. New Zealand was annexed, 1840, and the Fiji Islands, 1874, likewise, and Singapore, 1819, and Hong Kong, 1842. While in Africa, Natal was annexed in 1843, Basutuland in 1871, and Griqualand in 1874. But this record of expansion from 1815 to 1875 is indeed meagre compared with the vast gains of later years. And especially it must be emphasised that during this period, in numerous instances, the British government exhibited a positive distaste for colonial aggression. A few specific instances will enforce this point. The first attempts of British settlers in Natal to obtain British protection met with discouraging rebuffs, and only after much hesitation did Lord Stanley, then Secretary of State for the Colonies, consent to the annexation of Natal in 1843. In the case of New Zealand, likewise, Downing Street stubbornly opposed projects of colonisation, and annexation was delayed until 1840, when there was good reason to fear that France might steal a march on her inactive rival. A little later, Great Britain amiably recognised the independence of Transvaal, 1852, and the Orange Free State, 1854, two republics founded by Boer immigrants from British South Africa, despite the fact that the elected delegates of the Orange River colonists desired to remain under British sovereignty. In 1856, when the French promoter de Lesseps proposed digging a canal across the Isthmus of Suez, Lord Palmerston, British Foreign Secretary, instead of welcoming the project, expressed a fear that such a canal might lead to the British occupation of Egypt. A later generation might have regarded the same contingency with imperialist hope. Perhaps the most interesting illustration is to be found in the Fiji Islands. Here, a native chieftain euphoniously named the Kombau, embarrassed by rivals and rebellions, and alarmed by an American claim for $45,000 as an indemnity for injuries to a consul, had first turned to the god of the Christian missionaries for aid, and then, that failing, to Queen Victoria, of whom he had doubtless heard as the mightiest of earthly potentates. He actually offered her in 1859 sovereignty over his islands. Footnote Mr. Pritchard, who acted as the Combau's emissary to England in making the 1859 offer, believed that looms of Lancashire were to be kept going with the cotton which would be grown in Fiji. See Proceedings of the Royal Colonial Institute, Volume 6, 1874-75, pages 86 through 119. The principal speaker at this meeting of the Institute expressed the hope that some day the population of Fiji would be able probably, to read Shakespeare and understand him. That, however, is not wholly typical of imperialist aims. Footnote ends. The Queen's advisers, however, sent out one Colonel Smythe to look this gift horse in the mouth, and Smythe ungratefully recommended refusal of the proffered sovereignty. A second offer was likewise spurned. Only on the third offer did Great Britain accept and that was in 1874, after imperialism had revived in England. Parliament apparently sympathised with this negligent policy. Indeed, in 1865, a committee of the House of Commons recommended the abandonment of all British holdings on the West African coast, saving Sierra Leone, and abstention from further annexations in this region. As Professor Schuyler has convincingly pointed out, the climax of anti-imperialism in England was reached in Gladstone's cabinet of 1868. Gladstone himself, as has been said, was a little Englander at heart, who desired that the inevitable separation of colonies from the mother country should be voluntarily and peacefully permitted. John Bright, a member of the cabinet, favoured the emancipation of Canada and stigmatised British ownership of Gibraltar as contrary to every law of morality and honour. Lord Granville, the colonial secretary, 
and Robert Lowe, Chancellor of the Exchequer, were at least willing to acquiesce in independence for Canada if the latter desired it. In accordance with the spirit of a resolution which had been unanimously adopted by the Commons a few years earlier, favouring withdrawal of British military forces from self-governing colonies, the Gladstone Cabinet adopted the policy of removing imperial troops from New Zealand, notwithstanding indignant protests both from New Zealand and from imperial-minded Englishmen. Disraeli later asserted that the Liberal Party had been striving to disrupt the British Empire, but Disraeli himself, as late as 1866, had written to Lord Derby that England ought to leave the Canadians to defend themselves, recall the Africa squadron, give up the settlements on the west coast of Africa. Between 1866 and 1874, however, Disraeli's views had changed, and it was as an outspoken imperialist that he triumphed in the elections of 1874. These elections, as Professor Schuyler has observed, marked the defeat of anti-imperialism in England. Yet anti-imperialism, as a lost cause, survived the defeat. Gladstone, writing in the 19th Century magazine in 1877, expressed his apprehension lest by intervening in Egypt England might find herself burdened with a North African empire. And in his famous Midlothian campaign of 1880, the veteran liberal leader stoutly resisted the advance of imperialism. History, ironically enough, made Gladstone himself the tool of British aggression in Egypt, but that is another story. If one turns to France or Germany, one reads the same story of anti-imperialism, rising to a climax in the 60s and 70s, then suddenly overwhelmed by imperialism triumphant. France, after having made vain attempts in the war of American independence and again in the Napoleonic period, to regain her lost colonial greatness, found herself in 1815 with a few trifling shreds of former possessions, a dubious sovereignty over Haiti, two islands in the West Indies, fishing rights in Newfoundland, and a microscopic Saint-Pierre and Miquelon nearby, a corner of Guiana, a foothold here and there on the African coast, an undeveloped claim in Madagascar, the Ile de Bourbon, and five unimportant trading posts in India. A total of but 38,000 square kilometres, embracing 400,000 souls. For a time in the 1820s, there seemed to be some chance of acquiring Spain's colonies, but the English foreign minister threatened that England would not tolerate for an instant such a move, and France had to pledge her honour to keep her hands off Spanish America. In 1830, Charles X sent a naval expedition to conquer Algiers, just across the Mediterranean. In 1842, a French protectorate was declared over Tahiti. In 1842, the Gabon River was added, and Louis-Napoleon, in the Second Empire period, engaged in scattered colonial ventures in New Caledonia, Cochin China, and Cambodia, Somaliland and Mexico, all of which, save the last, were successful. But how few and how small these gains were, as compared with later exploits, may be seen most clearly in cold statistics. In the 62 years from 1815 to 1877, the total acquisitions amounted to 928,000 square kilometres and 5,500,000 inhabitants, whereas in the much shorter space of time since 1877, which year may be taken as an approximate dividing point between the era of anti-imperialism and the age of imperialism, France has gained about 14,500,000 square kilometres and 53 million non-European subjects. In the 48 years since 1877, the gain in territory has been almost 16 times as great as in the 62 years before 1877. Moreover, the government of the Second Empire was strongly predisposed in favour of free trade. It made the celebrated Cobden Treaty of 1860 with England, opening a wide breach in the mercantilist tariff wall. Further, on July the 3rd, 1861, it freely opened to all nations the commerce of the French colonies. This was the very negation of colonial mercantilism. 
And under the Third Republic, in the 70s and early 80s, anti-mercantilist principles were so strong that only with great labour could partisans of imperialism carry their projects through the gauntlet of parliamentary criticism. It is hardly too much to say that in the 70s, the prevailing spirit in France was opposed to colonies, either on the economic ground that they were unprofitable, or on the political ground that they were a dangerous diversion of energy from European politics, or on the ground that in the modern age of cosmopolitanism, colonial greed was an anachronism. In Germany, the all-powerful Bismarck shared, until perhaps 1876, the anti-imperialist zeitgeist. In 1868, he wrote to a colleague, von Roon, All the advantages claimed for the mother country are for the most part illusions. England is abandoning her colonial policy. She finds it too costly. He had already refused a protectorate over the Sultan of Sulu in the Pacific. He likewise refused Portugal's offer to sell Mozambique in Africa. When France offered Cochin China and other colonies in lieu of Alsace-Lorraine after the French defeat at Sedan, Bismarck scornfully refused colonial compensation, even though certain Bremen and Hamburg merchants favoured it. He wanted no colonies, he bluntly declared, their only use was to provide sinecures for officials. They were too costly a luxury for Germany. A colonial policy for us would be just like the silken sables of Polish noble families who have no shirts. Many were the pleas from a limited number of interested merchants and travellers in the 70s for the annexation of this or that overseas land, but the stubborn Chancellor rejected them all. And so strong was the anti-mercantilist sentiment of the National Liberal Party, on which Bismarck then depended, and of the majority of the Reichstag, that even after he was personally convinced of the desirability of founding colonies, Bismarck had to humour public opinion most cautiously and reiterate his disclaimer of imperialist intentions. Not until the 80s, when imperialism was everywhere resurgent, could he dare to come out openly in favour of colonial aggrandizement. The turning of the tide came in the 70s and 80s. Its cause need be no mystery. It came because economic and political conditions, and with them theories, had profoundly altered since the middle of the century. End of section 2 Section 3 of Imperialism and World Politics, Part 1 of 4, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 3a. Why Europe Shouldered the White Man's Burden. Subsection. The Logic of Economic Necessity. Europe was converted to imperialism not by logic alone, nor by economic necessity alone, but by a combination of argument and interest, arising from an almost revolutionary alteration of economic and political conditions. The old order, the good old mid-Victorian order, had passed away, and if not a new heaven, at least a new earth was seen by the keen eye of business and politics. First, consider the alteration of economic conditions. Four signal changes appear, and the first of these is the waning of the comfortable supremacy which English cotton mills and iron works had achieved by the inventions of the Industrial Revolution. As long as other nations worked with their hands, while Englishmen worked with machines and steam, England was secure from serious competition, and other nations were slow to install machinery. For approximately three quarters of the 19th century, English industry was as mighty as Gulliver and Lilliput. Even as late as 1870, Great Britain was smelting half the world's iron, and more than three times as much as any other nation. She was making almost half the world's cotton goods. Her foreign commerce was more than twice that of any rival. But during the last quarter of the century, the industries of Germany, the United States, France, and other powers, after a long period of infancy, suddenly waxed mighty. England's share of the iron industry diminished with startling rapidity, until, 
before the close of the century, United States had won first place and Germany was about to forge ahead of England into second place. The following table tells the story. Table ends at about 3 minutes and 35 seconds. Production of pig iron in thousands of tons. 1870. Production in the United Kingdom. 5,960. Production in the United States. 1,670. Production in Germany. 1,390. 1896. Production in the United Kingdom. 8,660. Production in the United States. 8,623. Production in Germany. 6,260. 1897. Production in the United Kingdom. 8,796. Production in the United States. 9,653. Production in Germany. 6,760. 1903. Production in the United Kingdom. 8,935. Production in the United States. 18,009. Production in Germany. 9,860. End of table. Even more important, and this needs emphasis, than the absolute volume of production is the rate of increase, because a high rate means reinvestment of surplus profits in the industry, whereas a low rate means either that the profits will be low and work slack, or else that profits must seek other opportunities for investment. From this point of view, the figures are startling. During the period 1870 to 1903, the period of the great outburst of imperialism, the British iron masters were able to expand their business by a meagre 50%, as compared with the 966% for their aggressive American competitors and 609% for the Germans. Though Great Britain's monopolistic grip on the cotton industry seemed more secure, American and German, not to speak of other foreign competition, began to make itself very uncomfortably felt in the 1870s, 1880s and 1890s. The following table shows the percentage increase in 10-year periods. Table ends about 5 minutes and 35 seconds. Percentage increase in the cotton industry. 1870 to 1880. Percentage increase in Great Britain. 19. Percentage increase in the United States. 90. Percentage increase in the continent of Europe. 33. 1880 to 1890. Percentage increase in Great Britain. 18. Percentage increase in the United States. 42. Percentage increase in the continent of Europe. 53. 1890 to 1900. Percentage increase in Great Britain. 3. Percentage increase in the United States. 50. Percentage increase in the continent of Europe. 25. End of table. Export trade tells the same tale. In the three decades from 1870 to 1900, while American exports were almost quadrupled and German exports doubled, English exporters increased their business by only 45%. While American captains of industry were accumulating fabulous fortunes, in England the pace was on the whole much slower. This fact is particularly impressive for England's two major export industries, iron and cotton goods. In the former, the exports of iron and steel during the decade of the 80s were slightly less than in the 70s. For expansion, the British iron industry had to rely wholly on domestic consumption, and that increased only by 41%. Cotton exports in the 90s stood at almost the same figure as in the late 70s. Here again, Great Britain failed to secure her share in the growth of the world market, and, as the table on the preceding page shows, the domestic market did not afford compensation. This situation meant cutthroat competition. Each of the great industrial nations was making more cloth, more iron and steel, or more of some other manufacture than its own inhabitants could possibly consume. Each had a surplus which must be sold abroad. 
surplus manufactures called for foreign markets, but none of the great industrial nations was willing to be a market for the other's surplus, at least in major competitive fields. All except Great Britain built around themselves forbidding tariff walls. United States, solicitous for infant industries, took the lead in establishing a protective tariff during and after the Civil War, and raised it still higher in 1890 and 1897. Russia built up her tariff by degrees from 1877 onward. Germany began the erection of her tariff wall in 1879, France in 1881, and other countries followed the lead. Businessmen and statesmen were not slow to take alarm. A French Prime Minister, Jules Ferry, described the situation in 1885 clearly enough. What our great industries lack, what they lack more and more is markets. Why? Because Germany is covering herself with barriers. Because beyond the ocean, the United States of America have become protectionist and protectionist to an extreme degree. There appeared, however, one bright ray of hope, one solution, colonies. How earnestly the rulers of Europe in the 80s and 90s viewed this situation, and how hopefully they sought to acquire colonies whose markets could be monopolised by the mother country's industries, cannot fail to impress any reader of political debates and imperialistic literature of the period. I cannot forbear to add one more quotation from The Rise of Our East African Empire, 1893, by Sir Frederick Lugard, who was at the time an influential advocate of imperialism, as well as an administrator most active in securing new domains for his country. As long as our policy is one of free trade, we are compelled to seek new markets, for old ones are being closed to us by hostile tariffs, and our great dependencies, which formerly were consumers of our goods, are now becoming our commercial rivals. It is inherent in a great colonial and commercial empire like ours that we go forward or backward. We are accountable to posterity that opportunities which now present themselves of extending the sphere of our industrial enterprise are not neglected, for the opportunities now offered will never recur again. Surplus manufactures, then, provided the chief economic cause of the imperialist expansion of Europe in the last quarter of the 19th century. Footnote. The tendency of some writers to ascribe imperialism wholly, or chiefly, to capital investment is unhistorical. Footnote ends. And surplus manufactures still provide an incentive to imperialism, though other factors have surpassed this one in importance. Colonies today proved a market for one-fourth, perhaps more, of the manufactures exported by industrial nations. And colonial markets are growing more rapidly than all other markets. Nations owning colonies are striving to monopolise their trade by means of tariff barriers. Even Great Britain, strong as the British tradition of free trade may be, has in the last few years quietly introduced into a number of the British Crown colonies tariffs giving British goods a preference over foreign goods. And the British self-governing colonies are likewise practising imperial preference. Rivalry for colonial markets is a consequence of surplus manufactures. The second great change in the economic world, to be noted as an explanation of Europe's conversion to imperialism in the last quarter of the 19th century, was the revolution in means of communication. To make colonial produce profitable, on a large scale, steamships were needed. To make commercial and military penetration of the interior wilds of Africa and Asia possible, railways were required. To bind colonies close to mother countries, the telegraph had to be invented. To be sure, steamship, locomotive and telegraph were invented long before the age we are considering, but their effect was not felt in the world at large until the last two or three decades of the 19th century. The following table offers the reason. Table ends about 12 minutes and 30 seconds. Railways, 1850, 24,000 miles. 1880, 224,000 miles. 1900, 500,000 miles. Steam shipping has percent of world's total shipping. 1873, 25%, 1890, 
59 per cent, 1900, 77 per cent. Telegraphs, 1850, 5,000 miles, 1880, 440,000 miles, 1900, 1,180,000 miles. End of table. The victory of steam and electricity over space made possible the gigantic increase of colonial trade between 1870 and the present. It also made possible the extension of empires by transporting the troops that conquered the tropics. Incidentally, as it will later appear more clearly, the building of railways, the laying of cables and telegraphs, the operation of shipping lines, were the economic enterprises which themselves were, and still are, prizes of imperialism. The third economic factor to be examined is the demand of industrial nations for tropical and subtropical products. Cotton factories in Lancashire, England, are one of the reasons for British troops in Egypt and India. The millions of bales of raw cotton devoured by busy British spindles and looms had to be produced in southern United States, or in colonies. When the American Civil War cut off supplies of American cotton, England and other countries looked about for other sources of supply, and since that time colonies have become increasingly important as cotton producers. Egypt, for example, produced only 87,000 bales in 1850, but by 1865 this quantity had multiplied by five, by 1890 it had multiplied by nine, and Egypt became the chief producer of fine, long staple cotton. British India likewise multiplied its production, and in many other colonial plantations were laid out. Rubber affords another instance, spectacular in its effects, when the civilised world began to wear rubbers and raincoats, to put tyres on its wagons and bicycles and automobiles, Europeans had to invade tropical jungles and, by persuasion or by force, induce the natives to tap wild rubber trees and vines, which grew in the Congo and Amazon valleys. The Congo became a colony where the natives were compelled to labour, and its rubber output increased from about $30,000 in 1886 to $8 million in 1900. The Amazon, protected by the Monroe Doctrine against European annexation, was subjected to economic imperialism, almost as if it were a colony. And as the demand for rubber grew still more insatiable, vast rubber plantations were established in British colonies in the Malay Peninsula and Ceylon, and in the Dutch East Indies. Rubber means imperialism. Coffee, cocoa, tea and sugar have also founded empires. Coconuts and coconut oil provided motives for the conquest of sunny islands in the South Pacific. The use of phosphate for fertilisation of the soil in France is one of the reasons why France prizes her North African colonies. To obtain tin, the French endeavoured to dominate the southernmost part of China. Gold mines caused the British conquest of Transvaal. The universal hunger of industrial states for coal, iron, and oil has been the leitmotif in world politics. Perhaps, one speculates, these objects of desire might have been bought in the normal manner of trade, without imperialism or conquest, perhaps. But in fact they were not. Sometimes the complaint was that African Negroes failed to appreciate the dignity of labour and preferred their accustomed life of sloth, or that South Sea Islanders were unwilling to toil, conquest and compulsory labour were demanded, or sometimes, when the Europeans laid out plantations or open mines or drilled oil wells in a backward country, they found the native government little to their liking and desired the protection of their own imperial flag. Or, in another case, one European government believed that only annexation of coconut-bearing islands would secure the output to its own citizens. In short, the northern world's desire for tropical products has been one of the conditions causing imperialism. One more economic factor, the fourth, must be added. It is surplus capital, although, as a careful reading of imperialist utterances in the 80s and 90s clearly shows, 
surplus manufactures rather than surplus capital provided the chief incentive at the outset, the latter has become the dominant force in 20th century imperialism. That anyone can possess too much capital will perhaps be denied by impecunious readers if this volume should have such, but by surplus capital is meant a superfluity too great for profitable reinvestment at home. That such surpluses must be created by the industrial expansion of the last century was an inevitable result of the economic laws governing capitalist production. The large incomes from factories, mines, rentals, return a profit on the capital. Owners of the capital receive larger profits than they care to spend. Wealthy capitalists reinvest most of their income. Fortunes accumulated from rents and finance must also be invested. Now, it is a commonplace business law that the capital investment in an industry cannot be indefinitely increased by reinvestment of earnings, and still obtain a profitable return, unless the industry can be indefinitely expanded. But unlimited expansion is usually impossible. The world's demand for cotton stockings or for steel girders cannot be arbitrarily increased. If capital accumulation is proceeding more rapidly than industrial and agricultural expansion, the excess of capital must either be invested in relatively unprofitable enterprises, such as construction of new railways along comparatively undesirable routes at a profit lower than in the past, or lent out at lower rates of interest to be used in relatively unprofitable enterprises, or invested in less advanced countries where capital is scarcer and returns larger. To make this abstract statement more convincing, we may turn to a French economist, Paul Leroy Beaulieu, who in 1886 observed, The same capital which will earn 3 or 4% in agricultural improvements in France will bring 10, 15, 20% in an agricultural enterprise in the United States, Canada, La Plata, Australia, or New Zealand. Sums invested in building new railways in France would hardly earn 2 or 3%, but in new countries they would earn 10 to 20%. Here we see plainly enough the reason why the investment of French capital in foreign countries, rapidly increasing after the middle of the 19th century, reached a total of 50 billion francs by 1914. Why British capitalists before 1914 invested £2 billion sterling in British colonies or dependencies and almost two in other undeveloped countries. Why Germans invested 28 billion marks abroad before 1914. Only a very small percentage of these staggering sums was invested before 1875, the age of large-scale foreign investments, like the age of imperialism, began in the 1870s. Those who like to speculate on the future may find food for thought in the fact that the investment of surplus capital in colonies and backward countries is still on the increase, and that the accumulated profits of the Great War enabled the United States to become, very suddenly, the foremost investing nation in the world, sending out its capital at an average rate of a billion dollars a year. Footnote the Department of Commerce has estimated that the private investments of United States citizens have reached a total in 1925 of nine and a half billions of dollars. Of this sum, 43% is invested in Latin America, 27% in Canada and Newfoundland, 7.5% in Asia and Oceania, and 22% in Europe. It is significant that almost four fifths of the total is placed in non European, undeveloped, relatively weak countries, and that the greater portion is in industrial and railway enterprises rather than in government bonds. These figures, of course, do not include the war debts owed to the United States government by European governments. On this subject, see R. W. Dunn, American Foreign Investments, New York, 1926. Footnote ends. Money lending countries of Europe, in the past, have shown a marked tendency to annex their creditors in Africa and Asia. Need America do the same? Is investment in backward countries a certain cause of imperialism? Why investments have so often led to annexations needs just a word of explanation. French bankers lend money, let us say, to Morocco. 
It is a speculative venture, but the rate of interest is attractive. Morocco, being inefficiently governed by its native rulers, fails to pay interest. The French bankers appeal to their own government, and presently Morocco is a French protectorate, a French colony in which efficient French officials make sure that French investors receive their due. Whether there is any other way, one may well ask, but the question of solutions must be left for consideration after we have mastered the facts. Subsection The Logic of Nationalism The economic stage is now set for imperialism, with surplus manufactures, steam transportation, raw materials and surplus capital ready to play their roles. The cast is not complete, however, until we add another actor, the new doctrine of politico-economic nationalism. Upon this, all the plot hinges. For if most men still believed, as they did a half century or so ago, that the state has no concern with economics, the economic factors mentioned above would have been impotent to spur national governments to imperialist deeds. But the mid-Victorian doctrine of liberalism, which brooked no government intervention in business affairs, was, after all, a mid-Victorian doctrine and it soon yielded the centre of the stage to the rival doctrine of economic nationalism, or neo-mercantilism, a reincarnation of that early modern mercantilism which we have been at pains to describe. If ever there was a spirit of the age, the spirit of the second half of the 19th century was political nationalism. Germany achieved national unity by blood and iron, by blood and iron was Italy welded into nationhood. The Civil War cemented the American Union. The Balkan nations emerged from the Near Eastern turmoils. The Poles valiantly, but vainly, fought in 1863 to regain national independence. Russia began to practice the nationalist policy of Russification. Disraeli revived British patriotism. The same ferment was at work among the Czechoslovaks and Yugoslavs and Magyars of Austria-Hungary. And in France, nationalism became a bitter passion after the loss of Alsace-Lorraine. The nationalist wars of the period 1848 to 1878 were succeeded by imperialist conquests. Nationalism means that people considering themselves similar in language, race, culture or historical traditions should constitute a separate sovereign state. Imperialism, on the contrary, means domination of non-European native races by totally dissimilar European nations. Antithetical as these two principles may seem, the latter is derived from the former through economic nationalism or neo-mercantilism. German economists in the middle of the 19th century were particularly prominent in developing this doctrine if Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations lay the theoretic foundations for free trade England, Friedrich List's National System of Political Economy, Das National System der Politischen Ökonomie, 1841, offered a basis for the protectionist policies of continental nations. List boldly blasphemed against the first article in the creed of the orthodox or classical British and French economists, namely, that by the working of natural law, the free pursuit of self-interest by each individual would produce the greatest welfare for society collectively. Instead, List offered the dogma that the nation is a continuous and supremely important entity whose well-being must be promoted by wise regulation of business. Private interests must bow to national needs. Nations with infant industries should adopt educational tariffs until industry, agriculture and commerce reached mature development and harmonious balance. List is cited as one among a host of European theorists who led the movement of ideas in favour of economic nationalism. And such doctrines fitted in well with practical exigencies of politics. The votes of working men demanded labour legislation. Industrialists demanded tariff protection. Humanitarians pleaded for social reform. And each of these urgent political forces made for greater control over economic matters by the national state. In tariffs, in labour legislation, in social reforms, economic nationalism became the order of the day in the waning years of the century.
Imperialism naturally ensued, once it was assumed that government should promote business. From then it follows that nations may legitimately reach out for colonial empire in order to preempt markets for their surplus manufactures, protect investments of their surplus capital, obtain business and coaling stations for their shipping, and secure raw materials. Such is the logic which combined with economic facts to make imperialism a necessity. More humanly interesting, doubtless, than the abstractions and statistics through which it has been necessary to make our way thus far, is the story of the actual conversion of England, France, Germany, and other nations to imperialism. Conversions are always interesting, and this one is a peculiarly intriguing display of man's ability to combine egotism and altruism in a plausible amalgam. On the eve of conversion, individual sinners often possess a dual personality, an unregenerate dominant ego, and a more devout but suppressed self struggling to gain the upper hand. Without carrying over the ethical implications of this metaphor, we may say that the conversion of a nation to imperialism meant not an instantaneous fault fuss on the part of the entire people, but the triumph of a hitherto submerged imperialist agitation reinforced by general economic and political changes over a gradually weakening anti-imperialist party. Subsection England's Absence of Mind That England acquired an empire in fits of absence of mind is a remark which Englishmen have been curiously fond of quoting perhaps because it parries any charge of self-seeking imperialism. Not absence of mind, but absence of Gladstone, the historian might almost say. It was the brilliant mind of Benjamin Disraeli, unrestrained by the respectable humanitarian moralities of a Gladstone, that conceived the idea of brazenly reintroducing imperialism into British politics, scandalised though the Gladstonians might be. It required Disraeli to divine that the British public, growing weary of high-minded but unexciting commercialism, was ready for an emotional debauch and would welcome the thrill of a patriotic outburst. He made the rearing of a great British empire in Asia seem a romantic feat of daring, not a sordid business enterprise. He appealed to the popular imagination the British Empire was a magnificent structure to be consolidated and enlarged, not permitted to disintegrate. He announced his campaign on June 24th, 1872, in his famous Crystal Palace speech, adopting imperialism as one of the three chief aims of the Conservative Party. To be sure, in addition to this adventurous paladin, imperialism had its lesser nights, a clever youth, Sir Charles Dilke, returning from extensive travels, had published a fascinating two-volume description of Greater Britain in 1866-67, to and the rather surprising demand of the public for new editions attested the influence of the book. Footnote. Dilke anticipated latter-day imperialism by emphasising the economic and military value of uncivilised, i.e., tropical exploitation colonies, while disparaging the alleged worth of white colonies such as Canada. Footnote ends. A small but influential group of enthusiasts, with the historian Bury at their head, had founded the Royal Colonial Institute, 1868, to promote the ideal of a united empire as opposed to the Gladstonian belief in inevitable disintegration. Footnote. Proceedings of the Royal Colonial Institute, Volume 1, 1869, London, 1870, giving the names of those most actively participating and the speeches. Viscount Bury was president. The lists of fellows of the Institute, given in subsequent proceedings, afford a fair index of the organisation's rapid increase of influence. Its members desired not merely to consolidate the existing empire, but to expand it. For instance, Lieutenant Cameron is cheered when he declares, I hope the day is not far distant when we shall see 
the Union Jack flying permanently in the centre of Africa. Volume 7, page 282, June 13th, 1876. The same year, Coleman Phillips urges expansion in the Pacific. He bid page 193. There are similar exhortations in almost every meeting during this period. Footnote ends. Sir George Grey, a former explorer and colonial governor, returning to England in 1868, had made a valorous but vain attempt to enter politics as a champion of imperialism. Professor John Seeley was just beginning, 1869. The brilliant lectures at Cambridge on modern history, which subsequently won so many converts to imperialism. Another and very influential historian, J. A. Froude, entered the lists in 1869, and in 1870-71, his articles in Fraser's magazine were trenchant attacks on the prevalent anti-imperialist or indifferentist attitude. Several prominent politicians, too, had been converted before Disraeli. A number of British cotton manufacturers had been quietly working since the American Civil War to develop colonial cotton growing, and one might add, the Rothschilds and other financiers with whom Disraeli was at times connected were beginning to become interested in the profits to be made by investment in colonial and backward countries. Thanks partly to the efforts of these lesser profits to make straight the path, but more to the magnetic quality of Disraeli himself, the British parliamentary elections of 1874 swept Gladstone's Little England cabinet out of office and returned Disraeli and the Conservatives to power. For six years, Disraeli's ministry pursued a forward policy of aggressive imperialism and flamboyant patriotism. The Fiji Islands in the South Pacific, twice refused by earlier governments, were promptly annexed in October 1874. The next year, 1875, came the celebrated episode of the Suez Canal shares, a chance to purchase control of the French company which had just dug the Suez Canal, had been offered to the British Foreign Office in 1870 during Gladstone's administration, and had been declined. But when Disraeli's Foreign Minister, Lord Derby, learning through a London journalist, the Khedive of Egypt was offering his block of 176,602 shares in the company to French purchasers, brought this news to Disraeli, the impulsive Premier seized the opportunity eagerly. Without waiting for a parliamentary appropriation, which might have been difficult to obtain, Parliament was not sitting, Disraeli bewitched his hesitant Foreign Secretary and Cabinet to give him a free hand, borrowed four million pounds sterling from the Rothschilds, who, by the way, made a hundred thousand pounds on the transaction, and hastily purchased the shares for Great Britain. Though Gladstone, of course, was opposed, and cautious spirits were a bit breathless, Disraeli's coup was popularly applauded. Footnote. Buckle Opsit, Volume 5, pages 413 and 439 FF. As there were 400,000 shares in all, Great Britain acquired not a majority interest, but practically a controlling interest. Footnote ends. Hard on the heels of this event came the dispatch of a financial investigator, Stephen Cave, to examine the state of Egypt's public treasury with special reference to British loans to Egypt. And thus began the English intervention in Egyptian finance, which led later to British conquest. In the following spring, 1876, Disraeli again startled Parliament by introducing a royal titles bill enabling Queen Victoria, that housewifely model of virtuous royalty, to assume the resounding title of Empress of India the title that had been born in Oriental splendour by Muslim despots. Here again was a challenge to Gladstonian anti-imperialism, a trumpet blast announcing the new imperialism. Disraeli said, You have a new world, new influences at work, new and unknown objects and dangers with which to cope. The Queen of England has become the sovereign of the most powerful of Oriental states. And again, British Parliament followed its master. In the same year, the declaration of a British protectorate over the Khanate of Baluchistan. An important country on the northwestern borders of British India, 
showed clearly enough that empire meant conquest. Another winter passed, and the returning spring smiled on the annexation of Transvaal, the Boer Republic in South Africa, which an earlier generation of British statesmen had allowed to become independent. But the climax was yet to come. When Russia in 1877 launched her armies against Turkey, obviously bent on conquest, and Constantinople seemed within the Tsar's reach, Disraeli sent the Mediterranean squadron to guard the Sultan's city, and war between Britain and Russia was hourly expected. Popular excitement reached a fever pitch. London re-echoed with the music hall ballad of the day. We don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do. We've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too. Jingoism, in a word, was the spirit in which the country supported Disraeli, Great Britain's threatening mean, the hostile attitude of Austria, and Bismarck's diplomacy, induced Russia to submit the whole question of carving up the Turkish Empire to a Congress of the Great Powers at Berlin in 1878. To this, Disraeli went in person, armed with a secret Anglo-Russian convention regarding the Balkans and Armenia, a secret convention with Austria, and a secret Anglo-Turkish treaty pledging England to defend Asiatic Turkey against Russia and permitting England to occupy and administer the Turkish island of Cyprus, ostensibly to facilitate the fulfilment of this pledge. To mollify the indignation felt by the French when these bargains were disclosed, a hint was dropped to the French delegate at the Berlin Congress that Great Britain would not object, should France take Tunis. Here we have imperialist world politics in full swing, Disraeli returned home from Berlin, boasting he had brought back peace with honour, meaning peace with Cyprus, and there were at least some in Parliament who would have him bring more of this kind of honour. Whether it was honour, however, and whether it was peace, could be questioned. Gladstone heaped vials of his wrathful oratory on his rival for sanctioning the iniquitous provisions of the Berlin Treaty as regards the Macedonian Christians, for dishonourably annexing Transvaal, and for embarking on the aggressive policy of jingo imperialism. Dishonour rather than honour, he felt, had Disraeli brought upon England, and jingoism did not mean peace. The annexation of Transvaal, mentioned above, brought on a cruel war with the fierce tribe of Zulus in South Africa, while aggressive imperialism in India led to trouble with the Mohammedan mountaineers of Afghanistan on the border of India. Learning that Russian intrigue was active at the Afghan court, the British government sent a mission, followed by an army, into the country, and imposed what amounted to a British protectorate. But in September 1879, the British resident and embassy in Afghanistan were butchered by Afghan mutineers, and a new invasion, new bloodshed, ensued. Aghast at the consequences of Disraeli's imperialism, many Englishmen turned to the Pacific Gladstone, whose anti-imperialist Midlothian campaign produced a liberal landslide in the 1880 elections. Gladstone's return to power for the years 1880 through 1885 was not so definite a setback to imperialism as might have been supposed. To be sure, Gladstone endeavoured to refrain from aggression. He even undid the work of his predecessor, in the case of Transvaal, by restoring independence to the Boer Republic. But against this courageous fulfilment of a campaign pledge, there was a storm of indignation in England, for, unfortunately, the Boers had won a minor victory over British troops shortly before and the grant of independence could be interpreted as a cowardly surrender. Emancipation of Transvaal had the effect of stimulating, rather than discouraging, imperialism. Furthermore, Gladstone found himself involved in the financial control Disraeli had established, with France, over Egyptian finances, and presently the force of circumstances coupled with pressure from British financiers and diplomatic officials drove Gladstone into the military occupation of Egypt. Let him promise as solemnly as he would to withdraw his troops. Gladstone had become helplessly enmeshed. He had done what he had denounced Disraeli for intending. He had conquered the Nile. 
imperialism had gained the upper hand in England. On every hand there were evidences in the 80s of imperialist awakening. Professor Seeley's book on The Expansion of England, portraying imperial expansion as Britain's historic mission, was published in 1883, took the public by storm, sold 80,000 copies in two years, and won its author knighthood on the recommendation of Lord Rosebery. Rosebery himself, then a prominent liberal, destined to become Prime Minister in later years, had just returned from a trip around the world in 1883. When he read Seeley's pages, he became a convinced imperialist, and as Foreign Minister in Gladstone's cabinets, of 1886 and 1892, and as Premier in 1894 through 5, he was in a position to give influential support to his new faith. Rosebery's conversion was significant as an indication that imperialism, no longer confined to Disraeli's conservative followers, had invaded the Liberal Party too. It was another Liberal, Mr William E. Forster, who founded the Imperial Federation League in 1884, to work for closer ties between self-governing colonies and the mother country. The colonial conferences, beginning in 1887, lent additional force to this movement. Kipling's Indian tales and ballads cast a romantic glamour of poetry over even the most sordid features of this conquest. There is no need to follow through all its details the story of the development of this imperialist agitation in England, yet in passing, it is not inappropriate to notice four men who may stand as types of the many who toiled to extend Britain's empire. There is Sir Harry Johnston, versatile combination of explorer, anthropologist, administrator, historian, and, in his last years, novelist, whose autobiography tells a story of indomitable labours to extend the advantages of British rule to barbarous African tribes, and of hardly less courageous efforts to arouse lethargic Downing Street officials, careless of abuses in colonial administration and negligent of opportunities for expansion. There is Cecil Rhodes, business adventurer and magnificent egotist, amassing millions by ruthless monopoly of South African gold and diamonds, dreaming of continents as British provinces, and using all the power of his wealth and personality to advance, by fair means or foul, the imperialism of which he was so lusty a son. There is the stalwart figure of Sir Edward Grey, high-minded Liberal Foreign Secretary for many a year, earnestly desiring to promote fair dealing and peace among nations, yet so permeated with what, by his time, had become an unquestioned faith in Britain's world mission, that he barters in secret with France and Russia and Germany for the division of spoils in Asia and Africa. Last, there is Joseph Chamberlain, successfully aggressive manufacturer, entering British politics as a radical liberal in Gladstone's time, but wrecking the old party, and later joining hands with the Tories, fearlessly preaching a doctrine of stark commercial imperialism. The empire, he said, is commerce. India, he candidly claimed, was by far the greatest and most valuable of all the customers we have, or ever shall have. His arithmetic may have gone astray in computing India's commerce, but his argument was plausible. British capital and British working men must have employment. They could get employment only if there was a market for their manufactures. The colonies would afford the market, now and for future generations. Annexing colonies, said Chamberlain, quoting a happy phrase of Lord Rosebery's, is pegging out claims for posterity. Chamberlain could not persuade England to adopt a preferential tariff in 1906, but he did help mightily to persuade British manufacturers that civilising Africans and Asiatics was a profitable business. End of section 3「Why Europe Shouldered the White Man's Burden » Subsection – French Logic – Ex Post Facto it has been a favourite axiom of English critics that French men pursue logic à outrance, 
regardless of practical expediency. As a matter of fact, French statesmen are adept in the fine art of making expediency appear logical. It was to justify the conquests upon which they had already launched that the rulers of the Third Republic elaborated their remarkable theory of imperialism. The logic was ex post facto. The Third French Republic inherited a colonial empire of less than one million square kilometres and five million inhabitants, an empire whose total commerce amounted to only 600 million francs, a third of which was with foreigners, an empire which cost the French treasury 30 million francs a year in administrative expense, an empire which was quite generally considered by French economists, politicians and businessmen to be burdensome and unprofitable. Few voices were raised in its defence in the first decade of the Republic. It is rarely necessary to argue in defence of possessions. It was the new acquisitions that required a justification. Tunis and Tonkin were the conquests that needed apology. The seizure of Tunis in 1881 would probably not have occurred had not the adjoining country of Algeria on the North African coast been a French possession since 1830, when a desperate king had endeavoured to save his tottering throne by a brilliant foreign venture. Tonkin, likewise, neighboured a French possession, Cochin China, which had been acquired by the ambitious Louis Napoleon. A merchant's ambition to found an establishment there led to a minor military expedition, only 180 men, but by almost miraculous fortune, this handful of soldiers had won for the French Republic in 1874 a protectorate over the extensive empire of Annam. This protectorate in turn led to a controversy with the Chinese government which claimed sovereignty over Annam and to war against the pirates who infested the border province of Tonkin. Hence the famous Tonkin expedition of 1883 which resulted later in a further extension of French empire. The Tunis expedition of 1881 and the Tonkin expedition of 1883, costly affairs both, required parliamentary votes of credit and parliamentary justification. There was strong opposition in the chamber. One speaker pointed out that French colonies furnished less than 200 million francs out of a total French commerce amounting to nine billions. Another declared, Instead of throwing yourself into the pursuit of new colonies which are supposed to be attractive because of alleged veins of gold which you do not know, not having seen them, and of alleged coal mines of whose existence you are ignorant, although you proclaim them and indicate them on your fanciful maps in order that public opinion may accompany you in this distant adventure. France will tell you not to look so far away. It is in France that you should look, and it is the poverty in France that must be alleviated. Georges Clemenceau violently rebuked the imperialist cabinet. The tempter has led you to a high mountain, has shown you the nations at your feet, inviting you to make your choice, and you have made it. It was to defend himself against such assaults that Jules Ferry stepped up to the tribune as master of imperialist logic. He had been responsible as premier for both Tunis and Tonkin. He has been called the apostle of the contemporary colonial renaissance. An apostle's creed of imperialism might easily be compiled from his speeches delivered in the early 80s. Footnote Born in 1832, Ferry became a prominent journalist and politician. As Minister of Public Instruction in the Waddington Cabinet of 1879 and the Freycinet Cabinet of 1879 through 80, he took particular interest in advocating anti-clerical school legislation. But after he became Premier in September 1880, he embarked on the Tunisian venture, which hastened his downfall in November 1881. He was again Minister of Public Instruction in the Freycinet Cabinet of 1882 and Premier from February 1883 to March 1885, during which period he took the portfolio of foreign affairs and followed an imperialist policy in Tonkin and Madagascar. He was shot by a fanatic and died in 1893. Consult A. Rombeau, Jules Ferry, Paris, 1903, and Discours et Opinions de Jules Ferry, 
edited by Paul Robicke, Paris, seven volumes, especially volumes four and five. Footnote ends. There are three articles in the Creed. First, an industrial nation needs colonial markets, since other nations, notably Germany and the United States, have erected protective tariffs. Second, the superior races have a right as regards inferior races. They have a right because they have a duty. They have a duty of civilizing the inferior races. France must combat the slave trade. That horrible traffic. In Africa, she must continue her work of promoting justice, material and moral order, equity, social virtues. In Africa. Is it possible to deny, he asked, that it is good fortune for the unhappy populations of equatorial Africa to fall under the protectorate of the French nation or of the English nation? There have been Englishmen since then who have denied it, but in Faree's day the effects of imperialistic exploitation were not yet apparent. It was easy for Frenchmen to believe in the mission civilisatrice as for Englishmen to shoulder the white man's burden. Third, for a marine and naval power, coaling stations were vital. A warship could not carry coal for more than fourteen days cruising, and for that reason... We needed Tunis, for that reason we needed Saigon and Cochin China, for the reason we need Madagascar and Arin Diego Sorez, which we will never leave. In conclusion, if France refrained from imperialism, she would descend from the first rank to the third or fourth. In a preface to a book on Tonkin and the mother country, he put the commercial argument with telling force. Colonial policy is the daughter of industrial policy. The protectionist system is a steam engine without safety valve if it does not have, as correlative and auxiliary, a healthy and serious colonial policy. European powers of consumption are saturated. New masses of consumers must be made to arise in other parts of the globe, else we shall put modern society into bankruptcy and prepare for the dawn of the twentieth century a cataclysmic social liquidation of which one cannot calculate the consequences. It was the economic argument, after all, that had made most appeal to the upper classes. The shrewd opportunist Gambetta, speaking with regard to Tunis in 1881, was blunt enough about it. Do you not feel the nations are stifling on this old continent? Do you not seek to create distant markets, exchanges, and to favour everywhere a necessary expansion. And necessary for what, gentlemen? Necessary for the increase of material prosperity. Chantin, Minister of Colonies in 1895, frankly said that he was in reality a second Minister of Commerce. Investment of capital was more emphasised at a later period, but even in 1895, Del Casse, the man who was later to become the guiding genius of French imperialism, was stressing the need of governmental protection and aid for French investments in the colonies. Still, his main point was that France enjoyed at least 200 million francs of her trade with her possessions, more than enough to compensate for the deficits in colonial budgets and easily enough to warrant the outlay of several hundred thousands to round out the empire, with a few more conquests. Alfred Rambeau and Paul Lois Beaulieu may be taken as typical of the academic protagonists of imperialism. Few at first, ever more numerous as the decades passed, Rambeau, historian of Russia and the East, and first professor of contemporary history at Sorbonne, had been deeply impressed by Russian expansion and also by Napoleonic conquests. His imagination was touched also by Seeley's Expansion of England, a translation of which he joined with J.B. Bayer in publishing in 1885. Why should not France also have a great historic mission of expansion, 
Such was the question that suggested itself to him. In 1886, he edited a volume containing contributions from explorers and public men under the title La France Coloniale, setting forth the arguments for French imperialism. Possibly the fact that he had served as chef du cabinet for Jules Ferry, 1879-81, may help to explain Rambeau's conversion to imperialism. Loire Beaulieu, on the other hand, was primarily an economist. As a novice, he had won a prize in 1870 for an essay on the then rather academic topic of colonisation. After he became a professor of economics and finance, his mind continually reverted to this theme. In 1874, he published his treatise De la colonisation chez le peuple moderne. At that time, as he said, Public opinion in France is still almost indifferent to colonialization, and his book was put forward as a scientific study rather than as a propagandist appeal. But when he put out a second edition in 1882, Tunis had been taken, and France was beginning to manifest all the fervour of a new taste. The change in public opinion was reflected in his new preface, no longer dispassionately academic, but rather ardently imperialist. Every day that passes, he wrote, convinces us more and more of the importance of colonialization in general, and its importance above all for France. He was seizing every opportunity to proclaim, by tongue or by pen, that France has been a great colonial power, that she can and should become one again. To be sure, France had an annual increase of population of only 100,000 souls, sufficient to provide only modest contingents of colonists. But even these would suffice. And after all, the true sinews of colonisation are capital funds rather than immigrants. And of capital, France had an abundance. French foreign investments amounted already, in 1882, to 20 or 25 billion francs, and each year this figure was growing by at least a billion. Even a quarter of this surplus capital could be directed to the French colonies. France would succeed in creating a great African empire and a smaller one in Asia. Colonisation, he concluded, is for France a question of life and death. Either France will become a great African power, or in a century or two she will be no more than a secondary European power. She will count for about as much in the world as Greece or Romania in Europe. The third edition, appearing in late 1885, found public opinion a little weary and discouraged. To revive confidence was the writer's patent intention, while frankly admitting the vices of French imperialism, administrative arbitrariness, over-centralisation, government interference with individual concerns, lack of perseverance. He nevertheless held out bright hopes for his fellow countrymen. The concluding pages of his book glorified imperialism in dithyrambic strains. Colonisation is the expansive force of a nation, its power of reproduction, its dilation and multiplication across space. It is the submission of the universe, or a vast part of it, to the language, the manners, the ideas and laws of the mother country. From every point of view. Whether one restricts his view to the consideration of prosperity and material power, of authority and political influence, or lists his eyes to the contemplation of intellectual greatness. One incontestable truth appears, namely, The nation that colonizes is the premier nation. If it is not today, it will be tomorrow. But enough of such panegyrics. French imperialism in the 80s was chiefly the work of Jules Ferry, twice Premier and his foreign minister, Jules Barthélemy Saint-Hilaire, a professor of ancient philosophy turned politician, who had been invited to inspect the Suez Canal project in 1855, and thenceforth cherished a weakness for Africa. It was taken up by the eminent historian Gabriel Hanoto, foreign minister from 1894, to 1898, who saw in it something of historical inevitability as well as commercial gain. It was pushed to extreme lengths by Del Casse, Poincare, 
and Clemenceau in the early 20th century. Footnote. It should not be implied that these men were alone in their work. Behind them were businessmen, officials, officers, supporting and often originating their policies. The influence of the Camille de l'Afrique Française was especially noteworthy. See files of its bulletin, and also H. Alice, Nos Africans, page 552. Footnote ends. During the Fourie decade of the 80s, France acquired 60,000 square miles in Asia and 1 million in Africa. In the Hanotot decade, the 90s, 30,000 in Asia, 300,000 in Africa. In the first two decades of the 20th century, the period of Del Casse, Poincare, and Clemenceau, about a million and a third in Africa. Such achievements might be censured by a socialist minority, but they gave the imperialists a confidence well expressed by Victor Beauregard in 1924. The study of history reveals a conclusion which has the certainty of an axiom. France, more than any other nation, has a genius for colonization. And he added, The future of France is in her colonies. Subsection Bismarck's Caution It has often been said that Germany was born too late into the family of European nations to acquire her place in the sun, her fair share of imperial possessions. Reiteration has made the statement seem plausible. In truth, however, Germany became a united empire, the most powerful state on the continent, in ample time to participate in the imperialist world division of the 80s and 90s. It was Bismarck's stiff-necked and hard-headed opposition, and the strong free-trade anti-imperialist convictions of the Reichstag majority, that imposed a handicap on German empire-building. In no other country was so wordy a debate, so convulsive an internal struggle, required in the process of conversion to imperialism. Theoretical writings had to be reinforced by missionary activity, commercial and financial interests, intensive propaganda and political pressure before Germany was won over. Footnote. The controversy is best described in M.E. Townsend, Origins of Modern German Colonialism, Maximilian von Hagen, Bismarck's Colonial Politik, Stuttgart, 1924, and A. Zimmermann, Gesicht der Deutschen Colonial Politik, Berlin, 1914. Footnote ends. For did not Bismarck stubbornly refuse the French colonies in 1870-71? Rebuff proposal after proposal for the annexation of this or that choice morsel in the 70s, and repeatedly proclaim his opposition to imperialism, while hundreds of projects for the establishment of colonies were neatly bound in volumes with true German orderliness, and placed on the shelf with their forerunners. A well-informed German writer claims that 30 volumes of such plans had accumulated by the year 1885. Theory alone was too weak to convince Bismarck. All through the 19th century there were theoretical exponents of imperialism. Friedrich List, the influential nationalist economist, wrote in 1841 that Colonies are the best means of developing manufactures export and import trade, and finally, a respectable navy. Rocher, in 1848, asserted that Germany must expand on the sea and over the sea into foreign lands if it wants to make up for the sins of past generations. New areas for production and consumption must be secured for our national interest be they gained by means of political or economic colonization. An official in the Prussian Foreign Office, Lothar Boucher, in 1867, reminded his compatriots that List's colonial program should be fulfilled, and specified the Philippines, St. Thomas, and Timor as desirable colonies. Among the great historians who did so much to stimulate German nationalism, Trichka was conspicuous, but not at all unique, in urging imperialism. Every virile nation, he roundly asserted, has established colonial power. Missionary societies reinforced the nationalist theorists. Consider, for instance, the Barman-Rhine mission, 
which established 10 or more mission stations in southwest Africa, engaged extensively in trade, and, through its inspector, requested the protection of the German government. German missions were active in the Pacific Islands too, and devout Germans at home were eager to have the flag follow the gospel. But not until the colonial movement became a business proposition. As one historian so well says, did it make a serious impression on the anti-imperialist government. German industry and trade, having sunk thick roots in German soil during the middle of the 19th century, began to branch out into all parts of the world. The Oswald Company developed trade with Zanzibar and the eastern coast of Africa, and even obtained an offer of a protectorate over Zanzibar in 1874, an offer rebuffed by Bismarck. Wormann sent German vessels to carry the trade of the West African coast, and to supply the Negroes with salt and gin. Footnote, Wormann had established factories, i.e. warehouses and stores, in Liberia, 1852, Gabun, 1862, and Cameroon, 1868. M. von Hagen, Opsit, page 18. Footnote ends. By 1880, 335,080 marks worth of German goods were annually shipped to West Africa, and 6,735,090 marks of African goods entered the port of Hamburg. It was a Bremen merchant, Luderitz, interested in African trade, who founded Germany's first colony in southwest Africa in 1883. It was a Hamburg merchant, Gudefroy, who prepared the foundations for a German empire in the Pacific by building up trade with Samoa and other South Sea islands. He had a virtual monopoly of trade in copper, dried coconut meat, from which oil was extracted. It was no exaggeration to call him the South Sea King. By 1875, Germany had 50 ships trading with Samoa and the Tonga Islands. To commercial interests was added the power of finance. Not only were great merchants such as Wormann and Gordefroy identified with important banks, the former with Disconto, the latter with the Nord Deutsche Bank, but Puissant Jewish financiers, Bleichroder, von Hansemann, etc., were friends and advisers of Bismarck and played no insignificant role in swaying the Chancellor. Propaganda arising in part from missionary and commercial interests, in part from disinterested patriotism, in part from the numerous German explorers of African wilds, became exceedingly active in the 70s and 80s. Scores of books and hundreds of articles and pamphlets were poured out by busy presses to urge imperialism on Germany. Typical and prominent among the propagandists was Friedrich Fabry who by long service as inspector of the Barman Rhine mission in southwestern Africa had become an impassioned devotee of imperialism. In a persuasive little book entitled Does Germany Need Colonies, written in 1879, obviously for popular consumption, Fabry argued that the great stream of emigration flowing from Germany to America was the ominous symptom of an economic crisis. Germany must have colonial markets, new fields of investment, outlets for surplus population, if she would live. German culture, moreover, must be spread among the backward races. Fabry generously marked out a colonial empire to be acquired, Samoa, New Guinea, Madagascar, North Borneo, Formosa, besides commercial penetration of Central Africa and the Near East. And he suggested a method, that of letting the flag follow the trader in these regions. A second figure towering tall in the legion of propagandists was Wilhelm Hubischleiden, lawyer, businessman, publicist, and, for a time, explorer in tropical Africa. His voluminous writings, especially in his books Ethiopian Studien über West Africa, 1879, and Deutsche Kolonisation, in 1881, and his personal influence were devoted to the conversion of the younger generation from self-satisfied nationalism and from equally insidious cosmopolitanism 
to the new gospel of Weltpolitik, of imperialism. Germany, he wrote, must break away from the Anglo-Saxon free trade and cosmopolitanism. These were devices which had enabled England to obtain 70% of the world's trade at the expense of competing nations. Germany's future greatness, her honour as a nation, her prosperity, depended upon learning to think imperially in terms of Weltpolitik. Ethiopia, West Central Africa, and South America were to be the fields of German colonisation. Huber Schleiden, it is interesting to note, was a prominent member of the Westdeutsche Verein für Kolonisation und Export, founded by Fabry in 1880, and joined with other members in founding a Guinea company in 1882, supported by Hamburg merchant princes, for the establishment of colonies on the western coast of Africa. This venture failed, but others took its place. A most powerful agency of propaganda was the Colonial Verein, founded in 1882 by a merchant, Friedrich Collin, a traveller, Friherr von Malzahn, and a widely read and travelled prince, Hohenlohe Langenberg, an interesting group of journalists, explorers, shippers, merchants, and geographers. Our acquaintances Fabry and Hubis Schleiden were, of course, to be found in this array. By 1885, the Colonial Verein had more than 10,000 members, many of whom were influential in the business world, the press, the universities, and the government. While the Colonial Verein devoted itself chiefly to general propaganda in favour of imperialism, the Gesellschaft für Deutsche Kolonisation, founded by Dr. Karl Peters in 1884, had the more practical aim of raising capital to establish colonies in East Africa. As an imaginative youth, Peters had caught the fever of imperialism while on a visit to England. Returning to Germany in 1883, and finding it impossible to carry the colonial Verein with him in his enthusiastic projects, Peters in 1884 founded the Gesellschaft für Deutsche Kolonisation, issued 50 mark shares, and raised 4 million marks capital. With characteristic impetuosity, he made his way through the most romantic adventures, to eastern Africa to buy up land from the natives. His exploit will be described more fully in its proper place, but his name belongs here as one of the chief apostles who evangelised Germany for imperialism. Footnote. Compare Infra, page 123. See Imperialism and World Politics, part 2, section 1. Chapter 7. The Conquest and Exploitation of East Africa. Footnote ends. All of these forces of economic theory, of religion, of commerce and finance, of propaganda, conspired to alter Bismarck's anti-imperialist policy. In the years 1875 through 1883 occurred his conversion. As early as 1876 he told the merchant Luderitz, who desired to make Transvaal a German colony, that he favoured colonisation in principle, but must wait for further development of national spirit before taking action. This may have been little more than ordinary political suavity, but we find Bismarck showing by his deeds an increased interest in Africa and the Pacific. He protests to Spain against interference with German trade in the Sulu Islands, he allows trade treaties to be made with swarthy potentates in the unclaimed South Sea Islands. His change of heart was hastened by a political crisis. When sensing the decline of liberalism and needing increased federal revenues, he decided to adopt a protective tariff in 1879 and relied on the Conservatives and Centre instead of the National Liberal Party. Bismarck needed the support which the rising imperialist faction could give his new protectionist policy. To have influential imperialist merchants actively supporting him in the free trade cities of Hamburg and Bremen was no small consideration, and Bismarck was willing to pay for such support in the coinage of political favours. Intent purely on European affairs, the shrewd Chancellor kept his opinions to himself pretty largely, until a favourable opportunity for action should arise. The opportunity came in 1879. 
The Goodefroy firm, ambitiously reaching out for trade among the islands of the South Pacific, had formed a merger in 1878. The Deutsche Handels und Plantagengesellschaft der Sudsee Inseln, German Trade and Plantation Company of the South Sea Islands. Getting into financial difficulties, Goodefroy had borrowed heavily from London bankers Bering Brothers and had pledged as security a large block of shares in the South Sea merger. Goodefroy's bankruptcy in 1879 placed German ownership of this merger, therefore, in grave jeopardy. It was time for Bismarck to act. Godefroy was perhaps the most influential firm in Hamburg and loyal to the administration. Bismarck's method was characteristically cautious. With his encouragement, a new company, the Deutsche See Handelgesellschaft, was formed in January 1880 with two prominent Jewish financiers, Bleichroder and Hansemann, as directors in chief representing the Chancellor. For his part, Bismarck rushed through the Bundesrat a bill to guarantee the company with an annual subsidy of 4% from the Imperial Treasury for 20 years or until its dividends should reach a satisfactory figure. In the Reichstag, however, the Samoan subsidy bill encountered furious opposition from the Liberal parties whose leaders refused to be deceived either by official attempts to disguise the bill as a purely commercial measure, or by contradictory official declarations that it is not a question of party or free trade or protection, but one of the honour and glory of Germany. The waving of the national flag and blaring of trumpets, as one opposition speaker put it, was of no avail. The bill was rejected, 128 to 112. Between the rejection of the Samoan subsidy bill in April 1880 and the establishment of Germany's first protectorate in 1884, Bismarck discreetly felt his way favouring imperialism but hesitating to arouse sleeping dogs in the Reichstag. It was during these years that the colonial Verein and similar organisations let loose a flood of propaganda, while imperialist merchants planned ventures with more or less secret connivance from the government, which could be presented to the Reichstag as fait accompli. The propaganda had its effect, and the imperialist activities of England and France at this time gave an additional stimulus to German imperialism, with the result that by 1884, Germany was ready. In that year, Bismarck proclaimed a protectorate over southwest Africa. Rapidly other protectorates followed, Cameroon and Togoland on the western coast of Africa, part of East Africa also, and part of New Guinea and the adjacent islands in the South Seas. Bismarck, however, was too much preoccupied with his system of alliances in Europe ever to become a furious imperialist. He remained unwilling to make conquests and annexations, as the French did, simply for the sake of rounding out a colonial empire. On the contrary, he insisted that the way must first be paved by German merchants. The flag might follow trade, but would not precede it. As a result, Bismarck carved out only a relatively modest colonial empire. It was after the accession of Wilhelm II and the dismissal of Bismarck, 1890, that German imperialism reached its apogee. Inclined by temperament to the grandiose and flamboyant, and keenly interested in Germany's commercial expansion, the new Kaiser threw himself without reservation or reticence into the enterprise of enlarging Bismarck's empire. In the period 1890 to 1914, the protectorates in Africa were extended. The German flag was hoisted over hundreds of South Sea islands. A port was obtained on the Chinese coast. Through the Baghdad Railway, German imperialism penetrated and dominated Turkey. And even more than these additions would have been made, had there been less opposition from jealous competitors. German parties still opposing imperialism were converted or defeated. Even in the Socialist Party, an influential faction willingly learned to mouth the arguments for empire. Subsection. Others share the burden. Italy, like Germany, achieved nationhood just before the dawn of the day of imperialist world politics. Unlike Germany, however, 
the new nation of Italy was industrially backward and politically weak. Although many Italian patriots, mindful of Rome's ancient grandeur, cherished imperial aspirations, the country was neither weak enough to be permitted by other great powers to acquire colonies which might be exploited by them, nor strong enough to risk the enmity of powerful neighbours. With self-abnegation born of impotence, Italians looked on, furious but helpless, while imperialist France appropriated the most natural field for Italian expansion, Tunis, on the African coast just south of Italy, the site of ancient Rome's vanquished rival, Carthage. Italy could do nothing until she had allies sufficiently powerful to bolster her claims. Grasping this fact, the then Premier, Agostino de Pretis, sued for the favour of Germany and, after difficult negotiations, obtained admission to a triple alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1882, the year after the French seizure of Tunis. He also made a beginning of empire by taking possession of a port, Massawa, on the western coast of the Red Sea, but he could do no more. His successor, the astute Francesco Crispi, obtained from Germany, when the Triple Alliance was renewed in 1887, a secret pledge of aid in case France should attempt to conquer Tripoli or Morocco. Tripoli, at least, he hoped to gain for Italy. He also enlarged Italy's foothold on the Red Sea coast, obtained another foothold, farther south, in Somaliland, and intrigued to gain possession of the great state of Abyssinia, which lay between these two Italian colonies. But an evil fate pursued him. A disastrous battle with the natives shattered his hopes in Abyssinia, nor could he create any favourable opportunity for the realisation of his designs on Tripoli. Italian imperialism was checked, the imperial impulse being balked rather than sated, did but grow stronger, and, as the individual consciousness of actual inferiority seeks compensation in dreams of power, the ruling class of Italy waxed more ardently imperialist, and dreamed more extravagant projects to restore Rome's ancient sway over the Mediterranean coastlands. In the 20th century, Italy was ready to send her armies once more into Africa for conquest and during the Great War and after to manifest an imperialist hunger too keen to be sated with the colonial crumbs that fell from the Allies' table. Very different was the case of Russia, as an ever-expanding empire of peasants and horsemen. Russia had pushed eastward into Siberia, southward toward Constantinople and toward the Caucasus, and westward to the Baltic, long before the fever of modern imperialism infected Western Europe. Russia's early expansion was the work of restless frontiersmen seeking new homes in virgin lands, and of ambitious stars seeking warm water, outlets, windows to the west. It was not the imperialism of surplus manufactures, surplus capital, and national pride. But in the late 19th century, Though Russia as a whole remained agricultural, giant industries developed in Russian cities, capitalists arose, and imperialist doctrines identical with those of Western Europe gained currency among the ruling classes. Capitalist projects for railway construction in Manchuria, capitalist interests in Persia, intensified the historic aggressiveness of Russia, and French financiers, after about 1890, supplied for Russian imperialism surplus capital, which Russia herself lacked. For instance, the Russian Asiatic Bank, the agent of Russian imperialism in the Far East, was financed with French capital. Austria-Hungary, like Russia, developed imperialism as an intensification of historic expansionist policies and sought to dominate neighbouring countries rather than to acquire overseas colonies. The emancipation of Germany and Italy from Vienna's control, occurring on the eve of the imperialist era, turned the Habsburg monarchy to seek compensation in the Balkan Peninsula. The desire for compensation was stimulated by economic interests of bankers and exporters, as well as by the political motive of bolstering up a tottering throne by means of a strong foreign policy, 
and, after 1890, by the German Drang nach Osten. Austrian capitalists purchased Balkan railways, while Austrian diplomats conducted subtle intrigues looking toward annexation of Bosnia and domination of the Balkan states. For most small nations, imperialism was out of the question. They lacked capital, and, above all, they lacked strength to vie successfully with great powers. The Netherlands, Portugal, Spain and Denmark, however, possessed colonies which had been obtained in earlier times. In these cases, pride of possession was enhanced by the outburst of imperialism among the great powers. Portugal and Spain even attempted to expand their holdings in Africa. Belgium entered the race largely because of the initiative of an unusually ambitious and foresighted ruler, Leopold II, who perceived the first flush of the dawning day of imperialism, early enough to carve out for himself a huge empire, the Congo Free State, in Central Africa, before the great powers had parceled that continent out among themselves. This venture, a personal enterprise of Leopold II, rather than a national undertaking, ultimately gave Belgium possession of the Congo and an important place among imperialist nations. Belgian imperialism, like Russian imperialism, afforded an indirect outlet for French surplus capital. Imperialism, in the form that has been so conspicuous since 1875, is a peculiarly European product, but it has been acclimated in non-European nations in proportion as they progressed in the economic institutions and political ideas characteristic of Western Europe. Japan, apt imitator of Europe, became strongly and aggressively imperialist toward the close of the 19th century, after textile and metallurgical industries, export commerce and finance had developed on European lines, to the point of requiring foreign markets for surplus goods, foreign supplies of raw material, foreign investments for surplus capital, and, after Japanese political sentiment, forsaking old ideals of exclusion and conservatism, had become poignantly eager to maintain national prestige by doing successfully what the European great powers were doing. America has not yet been converted, certainly not wholly converted, to European imperialism. Traditional principles enshrined in the Declaration of Independence have militated against imperialism in theory while an abundance of unoccupied land, a prodigal profusion of undeveloped resources, and a lack of surplus capital and surplus manufactures until very recently, have obstructed it in practice. The westward expansion of the United States, accomplished prior to the age of imperialism, was dictated partly by slaveholding interests, eager to add new territory and new votes to the strength of the cotton-raising slaveocracy, and partly by the westward urge of pioneer and prospector, and partly by an exuberant confidence in America's manifest destiny to expand. But conquering overseas possessions was quite another matter, distasteful to the prevalent opinions. Not until the close of the 19th century had American nationalism and American business enterprise reached the stage attained a generation earlier in Europe. At the time of the Spanish War of 1898, there was a vigorous imperialist movement, but after the excitement of the war had subsided, imperialism too declined. Washington officials and New York businessmen have since then cooperated in more or less imperialistic enterprises in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean area, but America has not yet embarked on a policy of open, enthusiastic, aggressive imperialism, frankly eager for colonial possessions the world over. But, of this, more must be said in a later chapter, when we have more of the facts before us. Up to this point, our inquiry has shown that an anti-imperialist free trade Europe was converted to imperialism rather suddenly in the 70s and 80s, when England began to feel the competition of other industrial rivals when manufacturing nations began to raise protective tariff walls around their own markets and to compete bitterly for foreign markets, when steamships and railways provided facilities for world commerce and conquest, 
When greedy factories and hungry factory towns called out for raw materials and foodstuffs, when surplus capital rapidly accumulating sought investments in backward countries, when the doctrine of economic nationalism triumphed over the old individualistic liberalism, the next step in our investigation is to discover the dynamics of imperialism, borrowing to some extent the method of the sociologist. We must inquire more specifically what classes or groups of men and what motives have been responsible for imperialism. End of section four. Section five of Imperialism and World Politics, part one of four by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 4 Dynamics of Imperialism. Subsection Men and Motives. Language often obscures truth. More than is ordinarily realised, our eyes are blinded to the facts of international relations by tricks of the tongue. When one uses the simple monosyllable France, one thinks of France as a unit, an entity when to avoid awkward repetition we use a personal pronoun in referring to a country, when, for example, we say, France sent her troops to conquer Tunis, we impute not only unity but personality to the country. The very words conceal the facts and make international relations a glamorous drama in which personalised nations are the actors, and all too easily we forget the flesh-and-blood men and women who are the true actors. How different it would be if we had no such word as France, and had to say instead, 38 million men, women and children, of very diversified interests and beliefs, inhabiting 218 square miles of territory. Then we should more accurately describe the Tunis expedition in some such way as this. A few of these 38 million persons sent 30,000 others to conquer Tunis. This way of putting the fact immediately suggests a question or rather, a series of questions. Who were the few? Why did they send the 30,000 to Tunis? And why did these obey? Empire building is not done by nations, but men. The problem before us is to discover the men, the active, interested minorities in each nation, who are directly interested in imperialism, and then to analyse the reasons why the majorities pay the expenses and fight the wars necessitated by imperialist expansion. Subsection Business Interests First and foremost among the active imperialist groups come certain business interests, not the whole so-called capitalist class, as many an earnest socialist would have us believe, but only a minority of business interests are directly interested in imperialism. They are easily identified. To begin with, there are the exporters and manufacturers of certain goods used in the colonies. The following figures of English exports to India tell the story. Table ends at about 3 minutes 48 seconds. English exports to India average 1920 through 1922. Cotton goods and yarn, £53,577,000 sterling. Iron and steel, tools, machinery and locomotives. £37,423,000 sterling. Wagons, trucks and automobiles, £4,274,000 sterling. Paper, £1,858,000 sterling. Brass goods, £1,813,000 sterling. Woolens, £1,600,000 sterling. Tobacco, £1,023,000 sterling. No other item over £1,000,000 sterling. End of table. Obviously the cotton industry and the iron industry are the most important factors. The imports of most other colonies and backward countries tell almost exactly the same story of cotton and iron, with minor variations. Many colonies provide a sponge-like market for cheap alcoholic beverages, Cigarettes have fifth place in Chinese imports. In some cases, coal is important. 
Kerosene has also played a significant role, but cotton and iron have been dominant. In more human terms, the makers of cotton and iron goods have been very vitally interested in imperialism. Their business interests demand the opening up and development of colonial markets, and in many cases, the exclusion of foreign competitors. Such aims require political control, imperialism. One specific instance may show how important imperialistic control over colonies is to these business groups. India, if free, would long ago have established a tariff to protect Indian spinners and weavers against British competition, but the cotton manufacturers of Lancashire, England, have used Imperial England's authority to prevent any such blow to their business. When, in 1896, a small import duty of 3.5%, was established by the Indian government, the London government, pressed by British cotton barons, insisted that the effect of the duty be nullified by a countervailing excise duty of 3.5% on Indian cottons. Footnote. In 1917, the duty on imported cotton goods was raised to 7.5%, without a corresponding increase in the 3.5% excise on Indian cottons, so that a net protection of 4% was afforded. In 1925, the excise was abolished. Compare Infra, page 310. See Imperialism and World Politics, Part 3, Section 2, Chapter 13b, Imperialism in Southern Asia. End of footnote. As one Indian remarked, There are indeed 60 good reasons for this British interference, for there are 60 Lancashire members who have votes in the House of Commons. Next in line come the import interests, British merchants who import tea from India, the Belgians who import rubber and palm nuts from Congo, the Frenchmen who import wines from Algeria, are vital factors in imperialism. The development of such business enterprises on a large scale requires at least a degree of orderly government sufficient to protect investments in plantations, warehouses and railways. Often it demands expensive public works such as dams, irrigation systems, roads and railways, which a backward native government cannot or will not undertake. Occasionally also, governmental authority is considered necessary to compel natives to work. In short, imperial control by a progressive nation is demanded, and the importers, together with planters and other allied interests, usually desire that the imperial control shall be wielded by their own nation, because it is from there they may hope to receive privileged treatment. There is only one reason why 197 million francs worth of rubber, palm nuts and palm oil, copal and copper, from Belgian Congo are exported to Belgium and handled by Belgian merchants, whereas only 13 millions go to England and 17 millions to all America, and only two-fifths of a million to France. The reason is that Belgium owns Congo, and the Belgian importers are aware of this fact, as are their competitors in other imperialist countries. Of late years, this group of import industries has been enormously strengthened by the demand of giant industries for colonial raw materials, rubber, petroleum, iron and coal, cotton, cocoa. The oil trusts of England and the United States have enlisted the aid of naval and diplomatic officials in their worldwide rivalry. The cotton industry of Germany hoped to obtain from Asiatic Turkey, under German imperialist control, raw cotton for German spindles. The cotton interests of England have been striving for a generation to develop plantations in British colonies. Their French and Italian rivals have hardly been less interested in colonial potentialities. The European cotton industry, it may be remarked, as an export business and as an import business, is doubly imperialist. Shipping magnates form a third powerful business group, the Annals of Empire Building, Bristle, with the names of ship owners. It is no accident that the greatest shipping nation has the greatest of empires. Ship owners demand coaling stations for their vessels and naval bases for protection. They desire development of colonial trade and of immigration. It was William, later Sir William, McKinnon, a little dapper man, upright, with an aquiline nose, side whiskers, a pouting mouth, 
and a strutting manner of walking. Chief owner of the British India Steam Navigation Company, who first proposed that the British should take Zanzibar, and who later organised a group of British capitalists to develop East Africa. To these interest groups may be added the makers of armament and of uniforms, the producers of telegraph and railway material, and other supplies used by the government in its colonies. These have been aptly styled the parasites of imperialism. They do not directly cause imperialism, but thrive on it. Finally, the most influential of all business groups, the bankers, may be said not only to have a direct interest in imperialism through colonial investments, but to represent indirectly all the above-mentioned interests, for banks have financial fingers in every industrial pie. The many billions of francs, pounds and dollars invested in colonies have been invested through banks for the most part. Banks underwrite the loans of colonies and backward countries. The capital issues of railways and steamship lines. They extend credit to colonial plantation owners, to importers and exporters, to manufacturers and distributors. The six largest Berlin banks in pre-war days were represented through interlocking directorates in more than 300 industrial corporations. The Deutsche Bank was the mainspring of German imperialism in the Near East. The Rothschilds, it will be recalled, lent Israeli money to buy shares in the Suez Canal and, more than that, utilised their political influence to bring about the conquest of Egypt. The French conquest of Tunis has been called a piece of high finance, un coup de bourse. The National City Bank has played an important role in the Caribbean policy of the United States. British bankers have established literally thousands of colonial branches. All these business interests taken together may be less important than the interests which have no direct concern in imperialism, since nothing like half the world's commerce, shipping, production and finance is accounted for by colonies. Footnote. In 1922 through 1923, the total international commerce of the world was almost $50 billion, of which the colonies and protectorates accounted for about 10 billions, and other partially dependent countries, Cuba, Nicaragua, Panama, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Egypt and Liberia, which are nominally independent, accounted for another billion. End of footnote. But the imperialist business interests are powerful, well organised and active. Through lobbies and campaign funds, they influence political parties. For example, Mr Doheny, being interested in Mexican oil, gave generous contributions to both of the major parties in the United States in order to make sure that his Mexican interests would be favourably regarded in any case. Cecil Rhodes, the Diamond King of South Africa, contributed to the Liberal Party on condition that it would not scuttle out of Egypt for he needed Egypt as the northern terminus for his projected Cape to Cairo railway and telegraph line. But campaign contributions represent only one of innumerable methods of influencing the government. A Bismarck, a Wilhelm II, a Nicholas II, or a lesser official, may be induced to invest in colonial enterprises. The son-in-law of a president may be paid a handsome retainer to use his influence at the White House in favour of American oil interests in Mexico. A Cecil Rhodes may purchase newspapers to praise his projects. The methods are legion. Subsection. Their allies. Moreover, the imperialist business interests have influential allies. Military and naval officers are often predisposed in favour of imperialism. Rear Admiral Rogers, retired, recently declared that if our successors remain a virile people as the world fills up, they will remain armed to take what they want at the expense of others. The United States, he believed, would have to engage in imperialist conquests when its population passed the 200 million mark. Admiral Dewey urged annexation of the Philippines. Lord Fisher, rugged British sea dog, joined forces with the oil interests to secure Britain's navy an adequate supply of oil. Similar illustrations could be multiplied endlessly for every imperialist nation. Military and naval leaders who have helped conquer colonies usually believe ardently in the desirability of extending the white man's dominion over the inferior races. To think otherwise would be unnatural for an officer who has won his spurs in colonial wars, 
for one of the strongest of our impulses is to find some justification for our own work. Furthermore, by mental processes more often subconscious than conscious, fighting men sometimes proceed from the premise that promotions are more rapid in expanding armies and navies, to the conclusion that in a world of greed and force, each nation must remain armed to take what they want at the expense of others. Rarely is the militarist's belief in armaments and expansion consciously based on class interest or personal advantage, but it would be difficult to find a clearer case of class psychology. Quite similar is the interest of diplomatists, colonial officials and their families. Prestige and advancement are almost assured for the diplomatist who obtains something for his country. Colonial officials make careers and names for themselves, not by prosaic administration, but by adding new provinces to old. As their profession is the governing of backward races, they feel certain their country's mission is to govern more and ever more of the coloured peoples. An altruistic professional faith blends with personal ambition. One needs but mention the name of a Lord Milner, a Lord Curzon, a Lord Cromer, a Sir Harry Johnston to support this statement. Their deeds will appear in later pages, but the host of more obscure administrators should not be ignored in favour of a few celebrities. Thousands of families in England and France have provided recruits for the colonial administration and take a kind of family pride in imperialism. Some of these families are very influential, particularly in England, where so many a proud but impecunious nobleman finds in imperialism a solution of the problem of younger sons for all except the eldest heir must be located in honourable professions such as Parliament, the Church, the Army, the Navy, or the Colonies. To this motley company of businessmen, fighting men, and younger sons must be added another incongruous element, the missionary. The 19th century, following hard on the heels of an age of doubt, witnessed a remarkable religious revival in Europe, and one of the most notable manifestations of increased fervour was the sudden expansion of missionary effort. Going out to preach a kingdom not of this world, missionaries found themselves very often builders of very earthly empires. Sometimes they promoted imperialism quite unintentionally. Being killed by savages, for example, was a very effective, though not a deliberate, patriotic service, inasmuch as it might afford the home country a reason or a pretext for conquest. Thus the murder of two German missionaries in China gave Germany a pretext for seizing a Chinese port. But more important was the direct impetus intentionally given to imperialism by missionaries. Livingston, the famous Scottish missionary to Africa, desired with all his heart that British rule might be extended in the dark continent to wipe out slavery, to spread civilization and Christianity. Fabry, who we have mentioned as one of the leading advocates of colonial expansion in Bismarck's time, was inspector of a German missionary society active in southwest Africa. He probably converted more Germans to imperialism than Africans to Christianity. Time and again, missionaries in some savage land have called upon their mother country to raise its protecting flag above them. Time and again, British missionaries have persuaded a converted chieftain to offer his fealty to the British crown. Protestant missionaries representing national churches have doubtless been particularly predisposed to regard themselves as representatives, pioneers of their own nation. But Catholic missionaries of France, though their creed was international, were hardly less nationalistic in aiding the expansion of French power in Africa. Often, too, missionaries, by teaching natives to wear clothes and use tools, have paved the way for the merchant, who in turn has brought the warship. And while missionaries toiled in heathen lands, enthusiastic missionary societies at home and the leaders of the churches learned to take a direct interest in Asia, Africa, and the South Sea Islands, and to urge upon statesmen the need of extending civilised Christian government over benighted pagans. In all this there is a note of tragic irony. Where grasping merchant and murderous machine gun followed the missionary's trail, the message of Christianity was not always appreciated, nor were Christian morals advanced by the gin and venereal disease brought by trader and soldier. But the fact remains that missionary organisations were among the active groups which promoted imperialism. Explorers and adventurers, if we may couple them with prejudice to neither, 
were conspicuous in the early days of imperialism. Henry Morton Stanley was something of both, and a journalist to boot. By birth he was a Welshman of the name Rowlands. Born in Wales of a poor family, he ran away from school to find work in the city of Liverpool, first in Haberdasher's shop, then with a butcher. When this grew tedious, he worked his way across the sea to New Orleans. There he was adopted by a merchant by the name of Henry Morton Stanley, whose name he accepted and later made illustrious. Young Stanley had begun a prosaic existence as a country storekeeper in Arkansas when the Civil War called him to a more stirring career. Enlisting in the Confederate Army, he was captured by the enemy. With ready versatility, he then joined the Union Army to fight against his former comrades in arms. Toward the close of the war, he discovered a latent talent for journalism, which, when peace returned, led him to Salt Lake City to describe the extraordinary customs of the Mormons, then to Asia Minor in search of thrilling adventure, then with General Hancock against the Indians, with the British against Abyssinia, and to Crete and Spain. When David Livingston, the famous missionary explorer, was lost in the heart of Africa, Stanley was selected by James Gordon Bennett, owner of the Herald, to find him, and Stanley did. This exploit in 1871 converted Stanley into an African explorer. In succeeding years, he made repeated trips into the interior of Africa. We are not concerned here with the details of his explorations, however, but with his influence on imperialism. After making his historic journey in the years 1874 through 1877 across the hitherto unexplored Congo Basin in Central Africa, Stanley became an apostle of imperialism. With eloquent pen and tongue, he portrayed the marvellous economic potentialities of the region he had discovered. But far from being sordidly materialistic, he urged the sending of missionaries, the abolition of the slave trade, and the civilization of the natives. How this extraordinary adventurer, explorer, journalist, failing to arouse the interest of cautious English capitalists, lent his services to Leopold of Belgium and established a huge empire for that monarch, a later chapter will tell. But a speech he delivered before a gathering of the Manchester Chamber of Commerce, chiefly cotton merchants, may perhaps be quoted in part. Assuming that civilization and Christianity would teach the naked Negroes of Congo to wear decent cotton clothes, at least on Sundays, he estimated that one Sunday dress for each native would mean 320 million yards of Manchester cotton cloth. Cheers from the audience. And in time, when the natives had learned the importance of covering their nakedness on weekdays as well as Sundays, the amount of cloth required would amount to 26 million pounds sterling per annum. In his peroration, he fused the mercantile and missionary motives in masterly style. There are 40 millions of people beyond the gateway of the Congo, and the cotton spinners of Manchester are waiting to clothe them. Birmingham foundries are glowing with the red metal that will presently be made into ironwork for them, and the trinkets that shall adorn those dusky bosoms, and the ministers of Christ are zealous to bring them, the poor benighted heathen, into the Christian fold. Stanley may have been unique in his versatility and his logic but as an imperialist explorer he was in some measure typical of scores. It was a German explorer, Gustav Nachtigall, who declared the German protectorates in Cameroon and Togoland. Henry Hamilton Johnston, later Sir Harry, began his career as a scientific explorer, interested in architecture and art and languages and biology, but became an empire builder in Africa, annexing vast territories for England and striving to complete the Cape to Cairo route of which he dreamed. There is no need to lengthen the list beyond the reader's patience. Last, but by no means least, let us add a sprinkling of politicians to our already heterogeneous array of active empire builders, with definite personal interests at stake. Some premiers and presidents have acted more or less unwillingly at the instigation of business and other interest groups. Gladstone, for example, was compelled to seize Egypt, though his heart may have been heavy. Bismarck yielded to the imperialist only after long resistance. Woodrow Wilson opposed imperialism with extraordinary courage, yet was driven to more than one imperialist enterprise. But others have deliberately promoted imperialism, either because they believed in it, or because they felt that it would bring prestige and votes, or campaign contributions. 
Disraeli apparently believed in England's Eastern Empire, and at the same time was very much aware of the strength of the appeal he could make to voters on the issue of national pride. Roosevelt, with his big stick policy and his Rough Rider campaign parades, skillfully stimulated and utilised imperialist sentiment in America. Subsection Interests and Ideas But a sceptical reader may object, imposing as the array of importers, exporters, shippers, financiers, admirals, generals, officials, diplomats, missionaries, explorers and politicians may appear when reviewed in detail. Still, it remains true that these active imperialist interests are minority interests. The overwhelming majority of a nation has no direct business or professional or military interest in colonial empire. Not only is this true of the poorer classes, who of course have no colonial investments, but it applies also to many, probably a majority of capitalists and businessmen. Indeed, imperialism might appear to be directly contrary to the economic interests of many businessmen. For instance, American ownership of Hawaii injures the beet sugar producers by admitting Hawaiian cane sugar free of duty. French ownership of Algeria may injure French wine producers by developing the production of Algerian wine, much of which is used to slake the thirst of Frenchmen in substitution for domestic vintages. The issue is not between capital and the masses. Capital is divided, one section against another, one industry against another. Why then does the majority so cheerfully follow the leadership of the imperialist minorities? Not direct interests, but ideas, not property or profession, but principles, actuate the public at large. The theories spread broadcast by imperialist propaganda are the dynamic factors impelling nations to send out armies, defray expenditures, risk wars, for the conquest of distant colonies and protectorates. It requires ideas attuned to the instinctive emotions to make modern nations fight. The ideas which have been particularly potent in imperialism are the idea of preventative self-defence, which awakens the primitive emotion of fear, the idea of surplus population, resting on the instinct of self-preservation, the ideas of economic nationalism and national prestige, appealing to instincts of gregariousness and self-aggrandisement, and an aggressive sort of altruism, which gratifies our innate pride. These ideas require analysis. Fear, so easily aroused in the human soul, and so powerful once awakened, is a cardinal factor in imperialist world politics. The citizens of modern nations fear attack, defeat, conquest. To persuade them that such calamities may be prevented by preparedness for war is a relatively easy task as the universality of armies and navies all too convincingly testifies. But of what use is a navy without coaling stations and naval bases? Thus the argument proceeds. If hostile fleets are to be held off from a vulnerable coast, the nation must have outlying naval bases and defeat the enemy's squadrons before they approach. That Great Britain has secured naval bases in all the seven seas, every schoolboy knows. But Great Britain is not unique in this respect. The need of naval bases was one of the chief arguments used by Jules Ferry in the 80s to justify French annexations. It is one of the most popular justifications for American ownership of the Philippines, Hawaii, Samoa, Puerto Rico, the Danish West Indies. It has given anxiety to the Japanese, the Germans, the Dutch, the Italians. A kindred theory springing from the same motive of self-protection is that a nation must control raw material in time of war. It is all very well, imperialists argue, to purchase iron and coal, and cotton and rubber and nitrate, and oil from neighbours in time of peace. But in war, a nation must have its own supplies, else its cannon will lack shells, its arsenals will stand idle without coal, its warships, tanks and aeroplanes will have no fuel, its laboratories will look in vain for ingredients for explosives. What argument could be more plausible or more moving. The unimpassioned student may perhaps inquire whether the ownership of oil wells in some distant colony will be of value in war to any except the supreme naval power, that is England, but to the man in the street such doubt rarely occurs. Even more influential has been the idea that the great civilised nations 
being overpopulated, need colonies as outlets for their surplus population. To France, of course, no such argument could be applied, nor was it much used in England. But it has enjoyed an extraordinary vogue in Germany, Japan and Italy, and it is not unfamiliar in the United States. In a densely populated country, where competition for employment is keen and the cost of living is rising, it is easy to believe that overcrowding is responsible for unemployment and poverty, and that additional breathing room for the teeming millions is an absolute necessity. The case is all the more convincing if thousands of emigrants are annually leaving their overcrowded mother country to find homes in more spacious lands. Germany was in this situation on the eve of the outburst of imperialism. In the decade from 1871 to 1880, no fewer than 625,968 Germans forsook the fatherland to become inhabitants of the United States, Brazil, and other foreign countries. And yet, the population in Germany increased, at the same time, from 41 to over 45 millions. After 1880, the figures became even more startling. In the years 1881 to 1884, some 747,168 Germans emigrated, more in the four years than in the previous decade. Such figures the imperialist propagandists in Germany used with telling effect. Germans became so profoundly convinced of their surplus population that the argument was still being mouthed long after the immigration figures had sunk, as they did in the 1890s and after, to an insignificant figure. And after the growth of population in Germany to 50, then to 60, then to 65 millions had demonstrated that the anxiety expressed in the 80s was quite unwarranted. The Italian public likewise was alarmed by the emigration figures, which rose from 94,000 in 1881 to 118,000 in 1891 to 282,000 in 1901, and have continued to exceed 200,000 a year. Most of these emigrants, to be sure, have gone to European and American countries, and many have returned to Italy with their savings. But Italian imperialists have eloquently urged the necessity of African colonies as outlets for this tide, regardless of the fact that emigrants seem to prefer civilised countries where employment is easily found. In Japan, an increase of population from 33 to 56 millions during the half-century after 1872 and the emigration of about 600,000 during the same period provided imperialists with plausible grounds for their thesis that Japan must be permitted to conquer colonies to relieve overcrowding. Curiously enough, this was one of the arguments popularly used to justify Japan's seizure of the Chinese province of Shantung in 1915, although Shantung happens to be more densely populated than Japan. A little reflection reveals the fallacy of using surplus population as an argument for imperialism. Development of industry and commerce enables supposedly overpopulated countries to support ever-increasing populations. For such development, a country needs increased investment of capital at home. Emigrants leave not because there is no room for them, but because they believe they can earn more money or enjoy greater freedom elsewhere and they seek prosperity regardless of flag or nationality in the country that seems to offer the most attractive opportunities. The colonies that were to be had, and were taken, during the imperialist era from 1875 to the present, have been unsuitable for European colonisation, and have failed to attract immigrants. We shall return to this problem later on. But for the present, the point to be made is that the idea of surplus population fallacious as it may be, has been, and still is, a vital factor in popularising imperialism. The third popular belief, which we have called economic nationalism, has already been elucidated, but needs practical application here. The teachings of economists and arguments of Liszt and Fabry and Ferry and Chamberlain and their compeers have sunk so deeply into the popular consciousness that Europeans except socialists and many Americans, take it for granted that there is such a thing as national wealth, and that this thing is increased if a rich colony or profitable concession is secured overseas. The diamond and gold mines of South Africa are regarded as an addition to Britain's store of wealth, 
the resources of North Africa are added to those of France. The profits to be made by an oil concession in the Near East or in Mexico are added to the income of the American nation. Germany, it has been generally assumed, was made poorer by the loss of her colonies in 1919. There might be other ways of looking at such matters. Norman Angel and other persuasive pacifists have endeavoured to prove that conquests do not profit a nation. A sceptic may ask whether national wealth is more than a phrase. Certainly the profits of Cecil Rhodes were not shared by the denizens of the London slums. Nor have the dividends from Mexican oil been distributed equally throughout the American nation. One might even go further and inquire whether the Boer War, while profitable to mine owners, did not prove an actual loss in money to the bulk of English taxpayers. But national sentiment stills all such doubts, and perhaps even a pauper may have some share in the glorious consciousness that we own rich mines here and fertile fields there, that we have billions invested in tropical lands. And certainly national sentiment responds with instant thrill when one's fellow countrymen clash with foreigners in rivalry for a railway concession in some backward country, or for the commerce of a colony. So strong is this sentiment that applause rather than surprise greets the action of the foreign minister or secretary of state who officially takes up diplomatic cudgels to defend against foreign competitors the business interests of certain citizens belonging to his nation albeit he would not think of giving the same governmental support to a private business interest at home. Quite as subtle and as potent is the complex of imperialist ideas clustering around the notion that a nation's honour and prestige must be zealously cherished. The fundamental impulse is primitive enough to be easily comprehended. Each of us naturally desires any group or organisation with which he is identified to be better than rival groups. Our own egotism or vanity may perhaps be at the bottom of the desire, for we enjoy the prestige reflected upon us by our group. We enjoy this prestige whether it is reflected by our family, our fraternity, our college, our club, our team, our city, our state or our nation. Most of all our nation. We are willing to die for that, but not for club or college. The impulse may be simple, but the applications in imperialism are subtle. For example, the desire for prestige, for greatness, impels Italian taxpayers to pour out hundreds of millions of lira on a relatively barren African empire, possessing unprofitable and rebellious but impressively extensive colonies enables Italians to feel that they belong to a great power, that theirs is one of the imperial races. The hearts of true Britons beat faster at the thought of England's world empire and world mission, at the sight of world maps showing Britain's vast possessions all coloured in conspicuous red. Germans, before the great defeat, demanded their place in the sun, meaning a large share of tropical Africa and Asia, as the rightful heritage of a great nation, and eagerly published maps showing Germany's ambitious claims. Frenchmen, learning the phrases of Ferry, repeated the prophecy that unless France built up a great African empire, she would become a second or third-rate power and what patriot desires his nation to be third-rate. The same solicitude for prestige is responsible for the belief that a nation, a great nation, must punish atrocities or insults to the flag and protect its citizens and their property in other countries. To refuse protection, most of us feel, is to sacrifice national honour. No proud nation can tolerate affronts. The blowing up of the United States battleship Maine had to be avenged in blood. If German missionaries are murdered in China, Germany must maintain her honour by seizing a Chinese port, and by exacting reparation and apologies. If British fortune hunters surge into the South African Republic, attracted by the gold mines, and are denied the vote, British statesmen indignantly protest that Englishmen are not to be treated as helots and British armies are sent to conquer the country. If an Italian girl is kidnapped by a Muslim, Italy is justified in seizing Tripoli. If Mexicans refuse a salute to the Stars and Stripes, 
American Marines occupy Veracruz. Footnote. They did not actually refuse. Compare Infra, page 444. See Imperialism and World Politics, Part 3, Section 10. Chapter 16C, The Policy of the United States Toward Latin America, Oil and Turmoil in Mexico. End of footnote. If Chinese officials arrest murderers on a ship flying the British flag, Britain has reason to make war on China and to demand Chinese territory. National honour must be maintained. National honour is at stake also when two imperialist nations contend for the dubious privilege of conquering a backward nation. When, for example, Germany questions the right of France to subject the unruly and bankrupt African empire of Morocco, it would be humiliating for France to yield, and no less humiliating for Germany. National honour is involved. Even though a compromise may be effected, there will be widespread resentment in both countries, for national honour admits of no compromise. Finally, some attention must be given to what may be called, for lack of a better name, aggressive altruism. Kipling styled it the white man's burden. His celebrated poem, written in 1899, urges us to Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness, on fluttered fold and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. The white man's burden in plain prose is to govern and civilise the Asiatics and Africans, the backward peoples who are half devil and half child, sullen and wild. Jules Ferry made it plainer. The superior races, including France naturally, have the duty of civilising the inferior races. France has a mission civilisatrice in Africa. Germans devoutly believed in their call to give German culture to the hapless Negroes of Africa, or more accurately, to impose it upon them by force. Americans, to a lesser degree, take pride in the sanitary, educational and other reforms which they have achieved in conquered islands of the Caribbean and Pacific. President McKinley declared as a reason for annexing the Philippine Islands that there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilise and Christianise them as our fellow men for whom Christ also died. Wilson's Mexican policy was as Ambassador Page told the British government, shooting men into self-government. The British Foreign Secretary found this phrase difficult to grasp, but he had no difficulty in appreciating England's beneficent task of keeping order in India and other disorderly countries. This is altruism, and aggressive altruism, because it means using force, brutal force, to impose on unwilling native peoples the blessings of French or German or British or American civilization. Indeed, this altruism goes to such lengths that the civilizing nations are willing not only to shoot Hindus or Zulus or Filipinos or Mexicans into culture, but even to undergo the hardships of war with equally zealous civilizing nations, and to call upon savages from Africa, as they did in 1914, to join the battle in behalf of the superior variety of European civilization, an altruism so earnest as this is a very important factor in the popular support for imperialism. Altruism, national honour, economic nationalism, surplus population, self-protection, such are the principles or ideas which nerve nations to valiant feats of empire-building. The initiative, to be sure, is taken by interests, but the support is given by ideas. When a colony or a protectorate is acquired, the first steps are taken, as a rule, by the business or naval or missionary interests described in the first part of this chapter. Not infrequently, the public, ignorant not only of what has been going on, but even of the geographical location of the region about to be annexed, is confronted by an accomplished deed a fait accompli, which needs only to be officially solemnified, popularly applauded, and, perchance, defended. 
Then the ideas function. The public rallies to the support of importer, exporter, banker or shipper, missionary, administrator, admiral or explorer. Imperialism, nay, all history, is made by the dynamic alliance of interests and ideas. End of section 5「Section 6 of Imperialism and World Politics, Part 1 of 4, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 5. Clothes, Culture and Couchuk in Congo To the romance and drama in the story of imperialist world politics, no normal human being can be entirely insensible, nor should he be, but the romantic element is incidental and should not obscure the chief goal of this study, a factual analysis of the twentieth century's gravest problem. The aim of the following fourteen chapters is to present the world drama of imperialism, that the reader may judge for himself the roles which ideals and interests have played. The tale may be told more clearly and interestingly, and its significance will be more easily appreciated if we discard the customary chronological method, and instead of flitting back and forth between Asia and Africa, between the West Indies and the East, take one region at a time. Africa may well come first, then, by easy stages, the journey may proceed to the Near East and Middle East, to Southern Asia and the Far East, thence to the Pacific and to Latin America, and finally back to Europe. Then, and only then, shall we be in a position for generalised conclusions. Subsection. The Five Africas. There are five Africas. The northern coastland, washed by the Mediterranean, is temperate more like southern Europe than like central Africa. It does not belong to the so-called dark continent. On the contrary, it is a white man's country, inhabited by Arabs and Berbers, and mixed races, fairly advanced in civilization, and linked with Europe by more than two millenniums of history. South of the coastland lies the desert belt, the Sahara, the Libyan desert, and the Nubian desert, a region of parched and shifting sands, with here and there a palmy oasis to which Arab caravans resort for refreshment. Here the dusky white of Arab and Berber blends and contends with the black of the Sudanese Negro. It is a racial transition region. Farther south is true black man's Africa, stretching across the continent from Cape Verde in the west to the Nile on the east, is the Sudan, land of the blacks, a belt of grasslands, prairies, forests and rivers, a land inhabited by fairly dense and capable Negro populations, skillful in primitive tillage and handicrafts. Next comes Central Africa, an equatorial land of drenching rains, dense jungles, tropical fevers. This, too, is black man's country, inhabited by barbarous Negro tribes, and only the cool uplands are fit for white colonisation. Finally, the southern tip of the continent emerges into a temperate zone, and its highlands, its rolling plains and upland prairies invite the white settler. Before 1875, not one-tenth of this, the second largest continent, had been appropriated by the civilised nations of Europe. France had conquered Algiers on the northern coast in 1830 and had annexed the surrounding region. Great Britain had taken Cape Colony from Holland in 1806 during the Napoleonic Wars and had annexed in 1843 the smaller and younger colony of Natal. Portugal had inherited historic claims to the region called Mozambique on the eastern coast and Angola on the western coast. But the claims were undefined, and Portuguese authority had not been actively asserted in the interior. In addition, along the western coast, there were a number of footholds, barely more than trading posts, in possession of the French, Senegal, Gambun, Ivory Coast, the British, Gambia, Sierra Leone, Gold Coast, Lagos, the Niger Delta, the Portuguese, Portuguese Guinea, 
Angola, and the islands of Principe and Sao Tome, and the Spaniards, Rio de Oro and Spanish Guinea. Better than words, the accompanying sketch map shows how little of Africa had been taken before the mad scramble for colonies occurred in the last quarter of the 19th century. Intrepid explorers opened up the continent for conquest. Exploration was one of the ways in which 19th century Europe gave vent to its scientific enthusiasm and, at the same time, found relief from the prosaic propriety and industrialism which were robbing European life of romance in measure as they added to its comfort. The public was fascinated by the thrilling adventures and bizarre experiences of explorers, while to the minute descriptions of strange beasts, of pygmy races, of tropical flora, at least a respectful attention was given. The returning explorer was received and petted by royalty, lionised by society, listened to by academies of science, and enriched, if fortunate, by the sale of books describing his travels. Space forbids any attempt to do justice to the explorations of Mungo Park, Major Lang, Cai, Clapperton, Denham, Nactigal, Horniman, Roofs and Bath in the Sahara and Sudan. Of Burton and Speak, Grant and Baker, Dr. Schweinfurth and Karl von der Decken in the Nile Valley and the Eastern Lake region. Of de Chaillou in Gabun, of David Livingstone in the Zambezi Valley, of Stanley and de Braza in the Congo. These and many others aroused the interest of Europe in Africa, not only in the scientific aspects of the explorations, in the quest for the elusive sources of the Nile River, in mapping out of hitherto uncharted wilderness, in the discovery of the manlike but ferocious gorilla was their keen public interest, but also in the possibilities of commerce, the question of slavery, and the opportunity for missionary work. Livingston, a missionary at the start, and a missionary at heart, even to the end, felt that he was blazing the trail for the gospel. Stanley, though far from being a missionary himself, was at pains to point out the need and the opening for Christianity in pagan Africa. As regards commerce, most of the explorers were convinced of Africa's immense potentialities. In glowing superlatives, they described the amazing fertility of Africa's rich soil. With ready intuition, they divined the existence of minerals in fabulous abundance. Africa was indeed El Dorado. The question of slavery merits further explanation. From the days of John Hawkins, that pious 16th century sea captain who enjoined his men to love one another and serve God daily, while he kidnapped African Negroes to sell to Spanish colonists in America, down to the 19th century a systemic trade in West African Negroes has been conducted by European slave traders. With awakening conscience, however, France, during the revolution of 1789, had abolished slavery in French colonies, Denmark in 1792, and the United States in 1794 prohibited the slave trade. Great Britain in 1811 had forbidden British subjects to engage in the traffic. Sweden followed in 1813, Holland the next year, and the Congress of Vienna had proclaimed Europe's general but in effective abhorrence of the commerce in men, but an illegal traffic still persisted. Moreover, the Arab slave traders who terrorised tropical Africa were under no compunction to obey European laws and continued their business. Blood-curdling were the tales told by European explorers in the 19th century regarding the Arab slave trade. As I write, I recall reading as a boy descriptions of Arab attacks on unsuspecting Negro villages. The most likely Negroes were seized, the others wantonly slaughtered. Then the captives were linked in a long chain, by a forked stick and a crossbar, holding the neck of each. Those that attempted to escape, or faltered on the long marches across country, were killed, and their bones marked out the trails. Here was an evil for Christian Europe to stamp out, Explorers and missionaries urged their governments to action. How much of the crusade against slavery was sincere, how much mere moral mask for imperialism, 
is not easy to discover. Perhaps the fairest judgment is that a sincere desire to extirpate the slave traffic at first reinforced the economic and patriotic motives for conquest, and later was used to justify it. Subsection Leopold's Altruism The story of the Congo Basin reads like a romance, a romance with its touches of pathos and its lapses into bathos. It begins when Henry Morton Stanley, with his little band of Arab guides and Negro porters, plunged into the African wilderness on the eastern coast to push his way through prairie, jungle and swamp, braving the poisonous darts of savages and the more perilous fever of the tropics until he had reached the upper stretches of the Congo River and followed that mighty stream down its long winding course to the Atlantic. The three white men who had started with him perished before the journey's end, and his 400 porters had dwindled to 115, but Stanley hastened back to Europe with manuscript for his publishers, and for the public, news of his discovery of the vast Congo Basin. Footnote. Henry Morton Stanley, Through the Dark Continent, London, 1878. End of footnote. The news travelled before him. When his steamer stopped at Marseille in January 1878, he was met by Baron Grandel and General Sanford, who came in the name of King Leopold II of Belgium, offering to do something substantial for Africa, and begging Stanley to return to the Congo on a secret mission. Footnote, Henry Morton Stanley, The Congo and the Founding of its Free State, London, 1885, Volume 1, page 20. End of footnote. The Belgian king who thus comes suddenly into the story was an interesting character, rakish in his incognito private life, an eloquent spokesman of mid-Victorian humanitarianism in his public utterances, a shrewd and ambitious monarch, much interested in industrial development, widely travelled, highly intelligent. Years before either his own fellow countrymen or the great powers had been converted to the new imperialism, Leopold had the conviction that Belgium must gain a share in the new and vast market of the Far East and had toyed with various colonial projects. Emile Banning, archivist in the Belgian Foreign Office, had helped to give point to such convictions by directing Leopold's attention to the opportunity for commerce and industry to profit by the opening up of Central Africa. When Leopold in 1876 summoned at Brussels a geographic conference of geographers, explorers and prominent men of many countries, he did not speak of acquiring commercial outlets for Belgium. Rather, he said, to open to civilization the only part of our globe where it has not yet penetrated to pierce the darkness which envelops whole populations, is a crusade, if I may say so, a crusade worthy of this century of progress. Then and there was founded an international association for the exploration and civilization of Central Africa. The name itself is expressive of the disinterested and international spirit in which this new organization seemed to be conceived. And it was from this international association that envoys were sent to meet the returning Stanley in January 1878. Stanley, however, was too exhausted to return at once to Africa as the agent of the association, or, let us say more simply, of Leopold II. Moreover, he wished an opportunity to interest England in the magnificent empire he had explored. Stanley, after all, was of British birth, and fighting on both sides in the American Civil War had failed to obliterate his native allegiance. England must have the first chance. Great was his disappointment when his eloquent descriptions of Congo's wealth failed to rouse any interest in England. Says Stanley in his autobiography, all this, meaning the Congo Basin, could have belonged to Great Britain, but was refused. (sighs) Alas, discouraged, he crossed over to Brussels, saw Leopold, 
and consented to serve the latter's aims. Leopold's plans now began to reveal a less disinterested nature. A prospectus was circulated regarding the opportunity for railway construction in Africa. A group of Belgian businessmen and other prominent persons was organised by Banning under Leopold's direction, with the rather non-committal name of the Committee for the Study of the Upper Congo, Comité d'Études du Haut Congo, and with a capital of a million francs with which to operate. This committee sent Stanley back to Africa in 1879 under the cover of absolute secrecy. He was going now to carve out an empire. Footnote. On the keen interest of the Comité in the Congo's economic future, see Stanley, The Congo, Volume 1, page 26. Footnote ends. To disarm suspicion and to recruit porters, the explorer sailed first to Zanzibar on the eastern coast, although he intended to ascend the Congo from the west. Then, quietly, he slipped back to the western coast and, with five small steamers, sailed up the Congo River. Slowly, the expedition progressed. Leaving the steamers behind at the rapids, Stanley's party had to cross marshes and ravines and forests, often literally chopping a road through the jungle. When at length, in December 1881, after two years of toil and peril, Stanley arrived in the neighbourhood of Stanley Pool, above the cataracts, what was his chagrin to encounter the tricolour of France? A French explorer, de Braza, had stolen a march on Stanley by cutting across from the French trading station of Gabun, a little north of the Congo, to Stanley Pool on the Congo. De Braza had arrived there 15 months earlier and had persuaded the local native king, Makoko, to sign treaties placing the northern bank and part of the southern bank under French protection. Vainly did Stanley sputter that the treaties were worthless scraps of paper. They were promptly ratified at Paris. The northern bank became French Congo, and the town of Brazzaville, conspicuous on the map, still bears witness to de Braza's foresight. Not to be disheartened, Stanley founded Leopoldville on the southern bank of the Pool, and pushed more than 400 miles up the river before he returned to Europe in October 1882 to give his report. He had founded five stations, forts and trading posts, on the Congo. By constructing roads around the rapids and cataracts, making portages easy between the navigable stretches of the river, he had opened up an easy route for the future. Natives called him the Rock Breaker, for through many a rocky obstacle had he blasted his way. But this was not enough. He was immediately sent back to open up and take possession of the upper valley. Seventeen more stations were founded. Four hundred treaties were made with the native chieftains, conferring on the Association Internationale du Congo, the Committee d'Etudes under a new name since 1882, a protectorate over their lands. Such treaties, easily obtained from illiterate natives by presence, cajolery or intimidation, were sufficient to establish before Europe, a claim to the sovereignty over the Congo. Stanley, however, had his own plans. Resigning the governorship of the Congo, he urged the English to take possession of the region. But to his urging, the diplomats of Downing Street were deaf. They too had plans. Gladstone was in power in England, and Gladstone had no desire to annex more colonies. Still, Lord Granville, his foreign minister, did not care to have the Congo fall into the hands of King Leopold, behind whose humanitarian platitudes British statesmen were beginning to perceive a shrewd economic and political purpose. It were better that Portugal, for centuries a friendly satellite of England, should take possession, even though the Portuguese colonial administration was notoriously corrupt and oppressive. On February the 26th, 1884, was signed an Anglo-Portuguese treaty recognising Portuguese sovereignty over the mouth of the Congo and providing for an Anglo-Portuguese commission to control navigation on the river. England, of course, was assured of free navigation and most favoured nation treatment. The manoeuvre was clever. It would nip Leopold's project in the bud, 
thought Portuguese possession of the outlet of the Congo could cut Leopold's projected empire off from commercial access to the sea. Leopold, therefore, turned to France and Germany for help. With the former, a bargain was struck in April 1884. Jules Ferry, his name continually recurs, promised to respect the International Association's territory. In return, the Association gave France an option on its possessions, in case the Association should wish to sell. Ferry accordingly protested against the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty. At this juncture, the ever-watchful Bismarck intervened. Footnote. Documents number 684, 687, 688, 689 in De Grosse Politique, Volume 3, throw interesting light on Bismarck's manoeuvre and on the way in which he and Ferry agreed in advance what the conference was to do. End of footnote. Here was an opportunity to promote better relations with France by supporting the French policy and by placing France under obligations now to earn French diplomatic support in case England should oppose the colonial ventures Bismarck was about to launch in Cameroon, Togoland, and Southwest Africa. And besides, German merchants feared exclusion if Portugal controlled the Congo. Bismarck supported the French protest and adopted Ferry's suggestion of an international conference to deal with the problem. In the face of such opposition, Lord Granville announced that the Anglo-Portuguese Treaty would not be ratified. Before the international conference met at Berlin, the International Association's claims had been recognised by the United States through the influence of General Sandford, who had served on Leopold's committee, and by Germany, and France was supporting it. It was, therefore, a foregone conclusion that the International Association's title to the Congo would be generally recognised, as it soon was. The three months during which the conference was deliberated were mainly devoted to other questions trade, slavery, missionaries, tariffs. At the end, a general act was drawn up and signed by most of the European powers and the United States. The latter, it may be remarked, took a prominent part in the proceedings and employed Stanley as an expert advisor. Subsection. International Altruism at the Berlin Conference. Remembering that missionaries, explorers and statesmen had represented European activity in Africa as a humanitarian crusade to advance science, spread the gospel, abolish slavery, and uplift the natives, we may profitably examine the provisions of the General Act. The signatories promised to protect the natives in their moral and material well-being, to cooperate in the suppression of slavery and the slave trade to further education and civilization of the natives, to protect missionaries, scientists, and explorers. All of this was excellent, as an expression of good intentions. When the discussion approached practical questions, such as forbidding the sale of liquor to the natives, humanitarianism proved weak. It was clear that the Negroes were being debauched by the cheap gin and other civilized beverages, to the use of which they were unaccustomed. But there was a profit in gin, and, as the American delegate wrote home, the Dutch and Germans claimed that, in the portions of this region, commerce is dependent on the exchange of such liquors for native goods. Of the blessings of European civilization, the natives had learned to appreciate only one, gin. Nor was the sale of firearms to the natives forbidden. That, too, was profitable. More care was exercised as regards commercial opportunities. Detailed provisions were made for freedom of trade, for equal treatment of commerce of all nations. This freedom was at first intended to apply only to the Congo. But, at the instance of Stanley and of the American delegates, the free trade zone was extended clear across to the Indian Ocean, between the latitude of five degrees north and the Zambezi River on the east coast. Ships of all nations were given freedom of navigation over the Congo and Niger and all their tributaries. An American proposal that Central Africa should be neutralised and war forever banished from at least this much of the Earth's surface was unacceptable to France and Portugal, who possessed colonies partly within the proposed neutral zone. 
Consequently, the powers framed an optional neutrality clause, which permitted Leopold's Congo state to declare itself perpetually neutral. Such was the work of a conference which, meeting on the eve of the great scramble for African territory, might have safeguarded native rights against exploitation and devised means of international control to prevent greedy aggression and dangerous conflict had the diplomats at Berlin possessed either the foresight or the will. They were but human, and as patriots concerned themselves more with safeguarding the present interests of their own countries, even in the liquor and arms traffic, than with the future. One interesting provision they did make to prevent any one power from excessive land grabbing. No power, it was agreed, should declare a new protectorate without first giving due notice to the others. This would enable the others to either protest or to make equivalent annexations. The territories claimed must be effectively occupied. This would prevent wholesale annexations, but it should not be taken too seriously, as occupation need not mean more than building a rude fort to occupy a vast province. Disputes were to be settled by arbitration. A good intention. Subsection. Altruism or rubber? The Congo Free State. It is high time we return to the broken thread of our story, the story of Leopold and the Congo. Having gained international recognition, Leopold's International Association, which had already undergone so many chameleon-like metamorphoses, transformed itself into the Congo Free State, Etat Independent du Congo, with Leopold as its sovereign in July 1885. The Free State was an independent sovereignty ruled by the Belgian king, but not subject in any way to Belgium. Footnote. The Belgian parliament, not yet won over to imperialism, stipulated that the union must be strictly personal. Footnote ends. The next few years were employed in making agreements with France, Portugal and Great Britain, settling border disputes, and in building forts and trading stations. Establishing the Free State's authority in its vast dominion of over 900,000 square miles was an expensive operation. Moreover, Leopold was determined to buy out the foreign interests in the organisation. He therefore had to borrow heavily from the Belgian government, besides digging deeply into his own pocket. He is said to have advanced 25 million francs in the first five years. At one time, in 1895, the financial difficulties were so grave that Leopold was on the point of turning the whole enterprise over to the Belgian government, but a sudden increase in the production of rubber and ivory occurred, and he continued his rule of the enormous African empire for 33 years. It was a long enough period to show the truth or falsity of Stanley's prediction that this unique humanitarian and political enterprise would be a fruitful blessing to a region that was until lately as dark as its own deep sunless forest shades. One of the first humanitarian acts of the new Free State government, in 1885, was to declare all vacant lands the property of the state, domaine privé de l'état. This, however, meant little until there were issued in years 1890 to 1895 a series of decrees and orders for the more effective introduction of European civilization. One decree conferred on the state a monopoly of rubber and ivory in the vacant lands, and an accompanying order forbade the natives to sell these products, except to the agents of the state. Rubber and ivory, it should be explained, were then looked upon as the chief resources of the region. The vast forests contained countless herds of elephants, whose tusks provided the ivory. The rubber came from the latex, or sap of the rubber vines which grew wild in great abundance likewise in the forests. As the vacant lands included the forests and all land except the small patches actually cultivated by the natives or occupied by their huts, it will be seen that the state was to have a real monopoly. But would the natives willingly go out into the jungle to collect rubber and tusks for the state? Little appreciating the dignity of labour 
The Congo Negroes evinced a marked distaste for the task which their humane sovereign expected them to perform. Accordingly, another civilised innovation was introduced. Taxes. Each native village was assessed so many kilograms of rubber or ivory, and to enforce these decrees, a native army was raised by conscription. This system was introduced gradually in different parts of the domain privé. Leopold found it more expedient for various reasons to entrust the exploitation of parts of his domain to private companies rather than to undertake the gigantic task directly. Concessions were granted to corporations to exploit large blocks, whole provinces, of the state's domain. The concessionaire company was empowered to exact the tax in rubber and ivory from the natives. In some cases it received authority to raise troops and enforce its demands. Despite Leopold's patriotism, foreign capital was welcomed. The American Congo Company, for example, was given a large concession, but regardless of the nationality of the other shareholders, Leopold himself usually reserved a block of stock, usually half. To cap the climax, in 1896, he created, by secret decree, the Domaine de la Couronne, virtually a private estate for himself, comprising about 112,000 square miles of the choicest rubber forests, and formed a commercial organisation, or foundation, to exploit it in his interest. The Leopoldian system produced gratifying results. From the Domaine de la Couronne alone were produced in 10 years 11,354 tonnes of rubber, yielding a royal profit of about $15 million. The following table shows the results of the system. Table ends at about 33 minutes and 11 seconds. 1891 had an export of ivory of 2.8 million francs and an export of rubber of 0.3 million francs. 1892 had an export of ivory of 3.7 million francs and an export of rubber of 0.6 million francs. 1893 had an export of ivory of 3.7 million francs, and an export of rubber of 0.9 million francs. 1894 had an export of ivory of 5 million francs, and an export of rubber of 1.5 million francs. 1895 had an export of ivory of 5.8 million francs, and an export of rubber of 2.9 million francs. 1896 had an export of ivory of 3.8 million francs and an export of rubber of 6.6 million francs. 1897 had an export of ivory of 4.9 million francs and an export of rubber of 8.3 million francs. 1898 had an export of ivory of 4.3 million francs and an export of rubber of 15.9 million francs. 1899 had an export of ivory of 5.8 million francs, and an export of rubber of 28.1 million francs. 1900 had an export of ivory of 5.3 million francs, and an export of rubber of 39.9 million francs. End of table. Besides, Leopold enjoyed dividends from the concessionaire companies. One of these corporations in six years made a net profit of over three million dollars on a paid-up capital of about forty-five thousand. The fortunate shareholders not only received annual dividends averaging more than ten times the original value of the stock, but also profited by the rise of the stock's market value to Empyrean heights. Sir Harry Johnston, an eminent British authority, has estimated that Leopold's humanitarian enterprise netted him $20 million. As an enlightened monarch, he spent his revenue generously in construction of royal palaces, in realty purchases on the Riviera, one of his favourite resorts, and in the laudable endeavour to make Ostend a bathing city unique in the world. All this, however, was a departure from the originally proclaimed intention of piercing the veil of darkness and bringing Christian civilization to the benighted heathens of the Congo. Critics were not lacking, especially English critics, 
to point out the discrepancy between Leopold's professed aims and his practice. As early as 1893, an Aborigines Protection Society of Great Britain raised protests against the treatment of the natives. In following years, foreign missionaries heaped accusation upon accusation. By 1903, the British government was stirred to propose an international inquiry. The next year was published the report of Sir Roger Casement, a British consul who alleged that the natives were being treated with inconceivable brutality. Other investigations followed, although a few travellers found nothing but praise for the work of the Free State. The overwhelming burden of evidence was incriminating. It was charged that when a native village failed to produce its required quota of rubber, the native soldiers were sent to punish the offenders, and often brought back the hands of the villagers as trophies to prove that the punishment had been effective. One writer alleged that officials in some districts employed cannibals as soldiers, and encouraged cannibalism at the expense of unproductive villagers. Some of the accusations were undoubtedly exaggerated. Others were based on occasional atrocities rather than on ordinary practices, but there can be little doubt that in some areas a practice was made of holding women as hostages for the delivery of the required rubber tribute by their husbands. Nor can it be denied that thousands of executions occurred, that native rebellions had been put down in blood, that thousands of natives fled from the country to escape the Leopoldian variety of civilization. Perhaps the actual atrocities were the least injurious feature of the system. Whenever a district was in the charge of an exacting agent, so heavy were the levies of rubber that the natives had no time to cultivate their patches of grain. Famine found its victims, and infant mortality, always high, became appalling. Many a prosperous village fell into decay, and some parts of the Crown Domain, travellers tell us, became deserted wilderness, where the silence of the forest was broken only by the occasional trampling of the elephant and buffalo, the chatter of white-maned monkeys, the scream of the grey parrot. To disarm his critics, Leopold appointed a commission of inquiry in 1904 to investigate the condition of the Congo. The evidence taken by the commission was suppressed. It would perhaps have made too racy reading, but the report and recommendations were published in 1905. That the commission was not unduly captious in its criticisms may be inferred from the fact that it approved the concession system, sanctioned compulsory labour as the only means of exploiting the Congo region, denied that white men had sanctioned mutilation of natives, and praised whatever it could find to praise in the Free State's administration. Yet even so well disposed a commission was impelled to report that the freedom of trade guaranteed in the Berlin Act of 1885 was practically nullified, that no new concessions should be granted, that the concessionaire companies should be forbidden to employ force, that military expeditions needed regulation, that it was oppressive to require more than 40 hours a month of compulsory labour from the natives, that the stationing of military sentries in native villages to exact rubber tribute ought to be stopped, and that the land laws were too harshly applied. But these proposals failed to satisfy Leopold's critics. The British government insisted on effective reforms. The United States Senate offered to support President Roosevelt in efforts to better the natives' condition. The Belgian Parliament began to manifest a determination to take the Congo over from Leopold. Whether for purely economic reasons or to conciliate foreign opinion, Leopold in 1906 granted four sweeping concessions. One to the American Congo Company for rubber, another for minerals in the Katanga district, a third for an ambitious railway project, a fourth for a combination of mining activity with dealings in forest products. As British, French and American capitalists were largely interested in these new concessions, Belgian opinion became more than ever excited, and the Belgian Parliament determined to insist on the transfer of the Congo from Leopold to Belgium. Recognising the inevitability of such a transfer, the monarch shrewdly endeavoured to secure a guarantee of the profitable crown domain, 
and of the concessions he had granted. Such a solution, the British Foreign Minister Sir Edward Grey declared, would be regarded by Great Britain as a violation of the Berlin Act, and Leopold was compelled to abandon the Crown domain, in return for 50 million francs, which he promised to spend in ways beneficial to the Congo, an additional 45 million francs to be spent on his projected works of embellishment in Belgium, and a guarantee of annuities to the royal family. Moreover, the concessions of the American Congo Company and the Compagnie Forestier et Minier were to be respected. On such terms, Belgium took possession November 15, 1908, and the Congo Free State became Belgian Congo, a Belgian colony. Subsection Belgium's Future in Congo with admirable sincerity, the Belgian government endeavoured to substitute a better regime for the grasping autocracy which Leopold had practised. The Belgian Congo was placed under a governor-general responsible to a colonial minister, who in turn must answer to the Belgian parliament for his acts. The first colonial minister, Jules Renkin, visited the Congo, which Leopold had never seen, the natives were given the right to sell their labour freely. Native chiefs were recognised and given local autonomy. Many of the old monopolies were abolished, though not all the concessions could be cancelled. The difference between the new government and the old may be illustrated by one instance. In 1912, a Congo official was sentenced to ten years in jail for his cruelty in arbitrarily executing seven native men, four women, and a child. In the old days, such executions would have passed without notice. Humanitarianism of the new type was less profitable, however, than Leopoldian methods. Throwing the colony open to international trade, abolishing forced labour, relinquishing the profitable Leopoldian monopolies, and assuming the debts of the free state, left the Belgian government with a colony whose revenues were inadequate to defray current expenditures. The annual deficit has averaged 16 million francs in recent years, 1920 through 1924, and the colony's debt was 543 million francs in 1924. Yet King Albert, on New Year's Day 1924, declared that Belgium's chief hope for the future lay in the development of a Congo colony. The Congo, says a Belgian publicist, is overflowing with riches of every sort. It is the vastest reservoir that a country can have at its disposal. Without it, Belgium would stifle. This point of view is characteristic. Present burdens are to be shouldered cheerfully in anticipation of future profits. What prospect of profit does the future offer? Trade, certainly, is increasing with some rapidity, as the following figures show. Table ends at 43 minutes and 15 seconds. 1895, $9,100,000. 1908, $31,770,000. 1922, $40,724,000. 1924, $44,000,000. $500,000. End of table. In these figures, rubber is a dwindling element. The rubber vines ruthlessly hacked to pieces under Leopold's regime, now yield but a small fraction of the colony's exports. The rubber trees, 20 or 30 millions of them, planted by the natives under Leopold's supervision, proved a disappointment. The Congo rubber industry today is a negligible factor in the competition with the rubber plantations of the East. The Belgian Congo's rubber output has actually declined at a startling rate, as the figures show. Table ends at about 44 minutes and 21 seconds. Year 1900, value of rubber output, 40 million francs. Year 1905, value of rubber output, 44 million francs. Year 1908, Value of rubber output, 31 million francs. Year, 1924. Value of rubber output, 3.5 million francs.
End of table. More important now is the mining of copper, and to a less extent of gold and diamonds, in the Katanga district of southern Congo. A chart exhibited in 1925 by the Union Minier de Haut Katanga shows how rapidly the copper production has developed. Table ends at about 45 minutes and 22 seconds. 1912, 3,490 tons. 1914, 14,042 tons. 1920, 18,962 tons. 1921, 30,464 tons. 1922, 43,362 tons. 1923, 57,886 tons. 1924, 85,670 tons. End of table. This Union Minière, by the way, was formed in 1906 as a joint stock company with 10 million francs capital, half Belgian and half British, and obtained the right to exploit all copper mines in a zone about half as large as Belgium until the year 1990, as well as to build railways and roads and to exploit certain coal, mica, iron, and gold mines. As the business of the union expanded, Robert Williams of the Tanganyika Concessions Limited, and the group of British capitalists he represented, was unable to take 50% of the new stock issues, and soon found itself a minority holder. The union is now controlled by a Belgian engineer, Jules Cousin. It is now one of the greatest copper concerns in the world. Copper has become the chief export of Belgian Congo, and has made Katanga the most prosperous and highly developed part of the colony. Indeed, the great mining plants there, and the neat whitewashed, thatched roofed huts of the black miners, present a quite civilised and almost European appearance. As for diamonds, the so called Forminière, Société Internationale Forestière et Minière du Congo, Founded in 1906 with a capital of 3,500,000 francs, with a concession to prospect over nine-tenths of the colony, made important discoveries in 1912, and soon became an important producer. Its capital was increased by jumps to 8 million, then 16 million francs. The output of diamonds in 10 years from 1913 to 1922 was 1,390,500 carats. It will be more than twice that in the next decade if the production remains at its present figure. The actual mining is done by 17,000 Negroes working at a wage from 6 to 8 francs a month, besides food and lodging. Both very simple to use a euphemism. Another infant industry, almost entirely a post-Leopoldian development, is the production of coconuts, palm kernels and palm oil, used chiefly in making soap, candles, and margarine. This industry, by the way, is in the hands of British soap makers, the Lever Brothers, who obtained concessions in 1911, giving them vast areas in which they have a monopoly of oil palms. Although the Lever interests operate through a Belgian company, La Société des Huileries de Congo Belge, Belgian publicists are prone to lament the predominantly British character of the enterprise, for imperialism tends to monopoly. However, these British soap makers have built up a great industry in Congo. They have established plants with hospitals, modern native dwellings, and even football and tennis grounds at Kinshasa and other places. And palm nuts and palm oil now occupy second place in Congo's exports. The fertile, well watered soil of the Congo can also bear cotton, cocoa, and rice but these require the development of plantations, large-scale organisation, railways and waterways and industrious but cheap and plentiful labour. The railways Belgium is building, waterways exist, plantations can be created, but labour is the problem. Footnote 1. The company Cotonier Congolaise, Cotton Co., with 6 million francs capital, has established a number of cotton farms and hopes someday to supply Belgium with raw cotton. Footnote 2. There were 1,268 miles of railway open in 1924. The greatest interest has focused in projects for a trunk line to 
to provide an outlet for the Katanga mining region, which cannot conveniently use the Congo waterway. A line has been constructed which links Elizabethville and Bukama in Katanga with the Rhodesian and South African lines. But plans for a shorter line reaching the sea at Bengala in Portuguese Angolia were backed by Belgian interests in agreement with Robert Williams, the British promoter so prominent in Katanga's development. Williams, however, ran short of capital and appealed to the British government for aid, which was refused at the insistence of General Smuts, perhaps to prevent competition with the South African railways. Accordingly, in 1922, the Belgian government adopted a substitute plan to construct and run a railroad entirely through Belgian territory from Katanga, via Bukama, Ilebo and Leopoldville, to the Matadi, near the mouth of the Congo. Small sections of the line are already in operation. Confer article by G. van der Kerken in Congo, December 1924, page 719. Footnotes end. In the last analysis, the economic future of Congo depends upon the employment of native labour in copper mines and on plantations, and perhaps in exploitation of the immense timber resources. In Belgian Congo, there are now about eight and one half million Bantu Negroes, thinly spread over an area 80 times as large as Belgium. Of whites, there are only 10,000, almost all officials, business agents, missionaries. Nor is it probable that European immigrants will ever be numerous, even in the mountain areas, much less in the sweltering heat of fever-infested lowlands. I have before me an attractive illustrated booklet entitled Alésia Fait Commu, which urges ambitious Belgians to colonise in the Congo, where they can create very fine estates for themselves, where they will lead a large life, free from the cares of Europe. The pictures are attractive, and so are the biographies of successful colonists. The Guthals brothers, for example, have concessions covering 20,000 hectares, part cultivated, and boast possession of un auto ford. They employ 170 Negroes, and each acre cultivated becomes worth about 1,000 francs. But there are not many Belgians willing to emigrate who have the 50,000 francs of capital considered necessary for the prospective colonist in Congo. The Negro population is the all-important element in the situation, and that Negro population has declined. Stanley overestimated it at 40 millions. Other early estimates placed it at 20, but today it is only eight and one half. The Negroes, moreover, have not forgotten the greed and cruelty with which Leopold introduced them to industrial civilization. Occasional revolts still reveal a bitter resentment. If Belgian authorities rely on free labour, there is still a long process of education and civilization to be undergone before the Negroes will give efficient voluntary labour in exchange for wages with which to purchase the goods of civilization. For the prodigal bounty of the tropical climate renders it easy for the natives to live a carefree life, little marred by toil. The booklet which I have just mentioned informs us that Negro labour in Katanga can be had for 25 to 35 francs a month, about 5 cents a day, without board, on a three-month contract. The lever interests employ thousands of natives at 15 to 30 francs a month, with rations provided by the company. Many of the natives work long enough to pay the government tax of 15 francs and to buy a little cloth, then return to their villages. On the other hand, skilled Negro workers, machinists for example, earn as much as 800 francs, about $40 a month, wear European clothes, attend the movies, dance the foxtrot in their clubs, and order their wives' dresses from Paris department stores. In short, the need of work to pay taxes, and in some cases a dawning taste for luxuries, have spurred some natives to work, but the shortage of labour is generally admitted. There can be no doubt that the colony is valuable to some Belgian manufacturers, financiers and merchants. Before the war, it provided a market for cotton cloth, machinery, liquor, arms, and other goods averaging about $10 million in annual value. After the war, the imports rose about 25 millions. Of these, Belgium provided almost half, and has usually supplied by far the largest quantity. 
except during the Great War, when the trade fell into British hands, and Belgians likewise handled the largest share of the Congo's export trade, 43% in 1922, chiefly the palm nuts, diamonds, gold, copper, and ivory. But the copper goes to other countries. How far we have wandered from the original theme of King Leopold, civilization of the natives, not commerce, was the question in the 70s. If civilization means education, it may be said that, according to recent statistics, 1924, the government was spending on the education a little less than 6 million francs a year, less than 1 28th of its budget, less than New York City spends in pensions to superannuated teachers. The Belgian government, nevertheless, boasts that 200,000 Negroes are receiving some sort of education. Many of the schools are conducted by the 1,400 missionaries who are inculcating Christian doctrines. The latter must seem to the untutored native a strange commentary on European rule in the Congo. Subsection Congo Diplomacy A few words must be added about diplomacy concerning the Congo. France, it will be recalled, had obtained in 1884 an option on the Congo, then owned by the International Association. Subsequently, France agreed that this option should not prevent the transfer of the Congo to Belgium, but even after Belgium had annexed the colony in 1908, France still held a first claim in case Belgium should ever wish to dispose of the Congo. In 1911, however, as part of the settlement of the Morocco crisis, Germany demanded that France surrender her right of preemption. It was obvious that German imperialists hoped to incorporate the Belgian Congo, eventually, into a great German empire of Middle Africa. France refused to yield her option to Germany. Instead, a compromise was adopted, providing that should the Congo ever be relinquished by Belgium, its fate would be decided by a conference of the powers which had signed the Berlin Act of 1885. Later on, when England was endeavouring to settle her colonial difficulties with Germany, the English government secretly expressed its willingness to permit the Germans to regard the Belgian Congo as a German sphere of economic action, a region in which German capital would not be seriously opposed by British interests. This secret bargain, of course, was wiped out by the Great War. In March 1914, the German foreign minister hinted to the French ambassador that Congo was too great a burden for Belgium. At the outbreak of war, Belgium desired to maintain the neutrality of the Congo in accordance with the Berlin Act of 1885, but France and England were determined to attack the German colonies in Africa, and presently Belgium, taking a German border raid as justification, used the Congo as a base for military attacks on German East Africa. Over 10,000 native troops were used in the campaign. At the close of the war, Belgium's native troops were in possession of the northwestern part of the German colony, and when peace was made, this region, comprising most of the Rwanda and Urundi districts, about 19,000 square miles in all, was given to Belgium under a mandate from the League of Nations. Another important diplomatic change was the revision of the Berlin Act of 1885, which had provided for free trade and the open door in the Congo Basin. In 1890, by the Brussels Declaration, the powers allowed an import tax of 10% ad valorem, equal for goods of all nations. These open-door provisions, however, were in effect nullified by the Leopoldian system of monopolies and concessions. Moreover, the Declaration did not allow such freedom in adjusting the tariff, as Belgians would have desired. At the close of the war, a new treaty was signed, allowing Belgium to fix the tariff rates freely, subject only to the restriction that duties must be equal for goods of all members of the League of Nations, and the signatories of the Berlin Act, all now members of the League, except the United States and Russia. Footnote. The treaty signed at Saint-Germain-en-Laye on September 10th, 1919, by the United States, Great Britain, France, Belgium, Italy, Japan and Portugal, applies to the conventional basin of the Congo, which includes parts of the Cameroons of French Equatorial Africa, of Portuguese Angola, British East Africa, or Kenya, Uganda, 
Nyasaland, German East Africa, or Tanganyika, and parts of Rhodesia, and of Italian Somaliland. The text is reprinted in Colonial Tariff Policies, pages 120 through 122. End of footnote. End of section 6. Section 7 of Imperialism and World Politics, Part 1 of 4, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 6a, Five Decades of Business and Diplomatic Bargaining in West Africa. When King Leopold sent Stanley in 1879 to obtain an empire in Congo, he unintentionally precipitated what may be described with more accuracy than elegance as an undignified scramble for possessions on the western coast of tropical Africa. Prior to this date, the malarial coastlands had appeared to be anything but prizes of diplomacy. To be sure, several nations had trading posts, scattered here and there, but since the abolition of the slave trade, these had lost their chief reason for existence, and most of them were allowed to languish in neglect. One might, perhaps, make an exception in the case of Senegal, where a gallant French governor, General Federbe, had employed his restless energy in conquering native kingdoms until he ruled the coast from Cape Blanc to Gambia, a stretch of more than 700 kilometres, and the Senegal Valley for 200 kilometres or more inland. But this, after all, was an exception. Stanley's expedition of 1879 was taken as a challenge by Savonian de Brazza, then governor of the little French colony of Gabun. And as we have seen, de Brazza took possession in 1880 of the north bank of the Congo, thus giving France a claim to what later became French Congo. The scramble began. Subsection. Earning knighthood in Nigeria. Simultaneously, keen rivalry appeared at other points of the coast, particularly at the delta of the Niger River, like the Congo and the Nile, the Niger is one of the truly great rivers of Africa. Before railways were built, waterways were the arteries of commerce and of conquest in Africa. River basins were the stakes of diplomacy. And the Niger, with its affluence, was a magnificent highway through the coastal jungles into the far interior. Next to the Congo, the Niger seemed the choicest prize of Western Africa. For its possession, empire builders of three great powers contended. German merchants and explorers, and imperialist writers in Germany, made no secret of their desire to obtain the Niger for their fatherland. But the cautious Bismarck delayed, and the real conflict was between French and English. The conflict began as a skirmish between trading companies. In the very year that Stanley went to the Congo, an English ex-officer by the name of George Goldie Taubman established the United African Company to trade in the Niger Delta. More or less by chance of acquaintanceships and of travels in Africa, Taubman had invested most of his small fortune in a Niger trading company and, anxious regarding the value of his investment, had visited the area in person. In bold imagination, he envisioned the future of the region. With persistence and tact and business acumen, he built up, out of numerous companies doing business in the Delta, the merger which he called United African Company with a capital of £125,000 sterling. He himself became a director, while for the presidency of the corporation he shrewdly selected Baron Abadair, a former liberal politician who had served in Gladstone's first cabinet, and subsequently a president of the Royal Geographical Society, an influential and dignified figurehead. Even with Abadair's influence, however, Taubman long tried in vain to obtain from Gladstone a charter and official protection for the new company. Meanwhile, he had French competition to deal with. A French ex-officer, Count de Semelle, had persuaded several friends to form with him a French company of Equatorial Africa, Compagnie Française de l'Afrique Équatoriale, with a modest capital of half a million francs. Untimely death had prevented the enterprising Count from reaping his material reward, but his friends remained loyal to his project. They went to Gambetta, the great Republican politician and premier, and from him received encouragement and authority to make treaties with native chiefs. 
Their agent then made numerous treaties with the dark rulers of the Niger Valley and established a score or more of trading posts. Between the French and the English company, the Niger was hotly contested, for both were seeking not merely present trade, but also future dominion. The English company, however, had the greater capital resources, a million pounds sterling against a million and a half francs, and capital conquered. By cutting prices 25% in all localities where there were French trading posts, Taubman's concern practically ruined the French. In desperation, the French company asked the Paris government for aid. Gambetin, alas, was dead, and in 1884, the Compagnie Francaise, along with another French concern, sold out to Taubman. Hopefully now, Taubman attended the Berlin Conference of 1884 through 1885, boasting that the British flag, at last, was unchallenged on the Lower Niger. But a new menace appeared. A German merchant named Fliegel had conceived the project of obtaining for Germany the Great Fuller, Negro probably mixed with white blood, kingdoms of Sokoto, Gando and Bornu, which lay north of the British possessions. These were reputed to be fertile, rich and populous. News of Fliegel's plan reached England. Promptly a young Scot, Joseph Thompson, was sent to steal a march on Fliegel. Thompson succeeded, made treaties with the sultans of Sokoto and Gando, and was returning down the Niger when he met Fliegel, hopefully coming up the river with blank treaties and bundles of gifts for the natives. Britain had won, but with a narrow margin. Energetically, Taubman drew up other treaties, more than 400 of them, to be signed by native chieftains, accepting British protection. A protectorate over the coast was formally proclaimed in 1885, and at last, in 1886, he obtained a charter, which converted his company into the Royal Niger Company, authorised by the Crown to acquire and administer territory, as well as to conduct business. Incidentally, Mr Taubman shortly afterwards became Sir George Taubman Goldie, the ruthless merchant, in other words, had become an honoured empire builder. He had won the Lower Niger for Britain. There followed years of anxiety and restless activity, French scientific expeditions coming overland from French colonies farther west were making treaties with native kingdoms in the interior. They had already appropriated the upper and middle reaches of the Niger River and were striving to hem the Royal Niger Company in from the north and west. Meanwhile, German explorers were encroaching from the east on what Goldie regarded as his preserves. Busily, therefore, the British pushed on up the river and spread out in the interior, everywhere making treaties with native rulers so that they might establish England's claim. We may well pause a moment over the narrative one of the British agents, Sir Harry Johnston, has given of a typical case of treaty making. It possesses human interest and it gives some idea of the realities which this brief narrative would else ignore. In a long native canoe, Johnston and his forty crew boys, Negro porters, and Calabars paddled up the cross river through lonely glades, startling an occasional chimpanzee or elephant herd, but seeing no human beings until they reached a large Negro village. Savages rushed out into the water, dragged Johnston from his canoe, and carried him off to a native hut. There, with a hundred human skulls grinning at him from the walls, he had to sit while a crowd of savages stared at his strange complexion and clothes. At length his captors questioned him through his native interpreter. He came, he said, on a friendly mission from a great white queen who was ruler of the white people. He wished to make a book with the ruler of the village, that is, a treaty, to take home to the woman chief who had sent him out. The natives, fortunately, were agreeable. A burly individual carried him back to the canoe, and there Johnston took a treaty form, he had a stock ready for such contingencies, from his dispatch box, while three or four negroes, apparently persons of authority, crowded into the canoe to make crosses on the treaty. The natives, it seems, had consumed enough palm wine to be genial, even boisterous. Seeing their condition, Johnston, was longing to get away. Accordingly, after the crosses had been splodged on the treaty form, and he had given them a present of beads and cloth, he made his adieu, but not before the villagers had generously compelled him to accept a hundred yams and two sheep, and a necklace of human knuckle bones. 
Then, fearing the natives might kill and eat his servants, Johnston made a judicious retreat. Such, in a general way, was the process of treaty-making by which the Negro tribes accepted Great Britain's protectorate, a courageous but nervous explorer bravely concealing his fears, a half-explained treaty of friendship, presence of beads and cloth, and of liquor in the case of less high-minded explorers. These were the typical elements in the situation. Such exploits served to round out the domain of the Niger Company, until, in 1900, the British government was ready to relieve the company of its political functions in return for a payment of £865,000 sterling and to proclaim protectorates over northern and southern Nigeria. Subsection Bismarck Executes the Purposes of Providence While Great Britain was appropriating the Niger and enlarging several minor colonies, Bismarck was planting German protectorates over other parts of West Africa. He had been gradually won over to imperialism in the 70s, but hesitated to raise the German flag in Africa unless he could persuade his public that it was necessary to protect existing German commerce, and under favourable international circumstances. His hesitation was ended by the events of the early 80s, the activity of Stanley and de Bratza in Congo, of the British in Nigeria, and of the French in the Senegal region. Adolf Wormann, called by Bismarck the Royal Merchant, was furiously indignant at the high duties now established by foreign powers to the detriment of his trade in West Africa. Other German merchants were equally urgent, and Bismarck, ear to the ground, decided to act. To Luderitz, a Bremen merchant, he gave a promise of support on condition a harbour unclaimed by other nations could be obtained. Luderitz thereupon, sent an agent, Heinrich Vogelsang, to discover an eligible port. Angra Pequena was selected, far down the coast, below the Tropic of Capricorn, for Luderitz was determined to have a temperate colony. There, Vogelsang landed in April 1883, and purchased from the local chief, for 2,000 marks and 200 guns with ammunition, an area extending five miles in every direction. Later in the year, Luderitz purchased a strip 20 miles deep, extending along the coast as far south as the Orange River, the border of the British Cape Colony. It was a small venture, only 3,000 square miles or so, but important enough to arouse British opposition. A few years earlier, 1878, the British had taken possession of Wolvish Bay, the best harbour on the southwest coast, and British imperialists, particularly the British in Cape Colony, regarded this whole region as their preserve, and now the Germans were establishing themselves between Wolvish Bay and Cape Colony. To Englishmen it was irritating. Bismarck handled the affair with masterly subtlety. As early as November 4th, 1880, he had asked the London government if it would protect certain German missionaries on this coast, and London had replied that it would assume responsibility only for Wolvish Bay. Again, on February 4th, 1883, he inquired whether Great Britain would give protection to a German merchant who intended to set up a warehouse, and London replied that no definite answer could be given until the precise location was known. All this before Luderitz had made his purchase. Bismarck, on the face of the record, would appear to have been scrupulously correct. But the grizzled real politicker took pains also to deceive London regarding his intentions. After the purchase was made, he inquired if England claimed sovereignty over Angra Pequena. Tardily shaking off its lethargy, the Gladstone cabinet replied that any claim by Germany between 18 degrees south, Portuguese Angola, and Cape Colony would infringe England's legitimate rights. Bismarck tartly retorted by asking on what England based her alleged rights. To this pertinent question, answer was delayed while Lord Derby wired from London to Cape Colony, asking whether the Cape would annex the disputed area. And as a cabinet crisis intervened in the Cape, the decision to annex Angra Pequena was not taken by the Cape Parliament until July 23, 1884, almost six months later. Meanwhile, Bismarck had sent a fateful telegram on April 24, informing the German Consul General in South Africa of his decision to take Herr Luderitz under Germany's protection. Here was a delicate situation. 
For a moment we may leave Bismarck and Britain contending for the honour of protecting her Luderitz, while other events claim our attention. At this time, in the year 1884, Bismarck had sent a celebrated explorer, one Dr. Gustav Nachtigall, in a German warship to cruise down the western coast of Africa on a mysterious mission. To the English he announced that Nachtigall was to secure information regarding German commerce. To Nachtigall he gave secret instructions drafted by the royal merchant to hoist the German flag in Angrapakena and other places. Nachtigall arrived at Little Popo on the Gulf of Guinea, July 2nd, 1884, to find British intrigue busy, hastily made a treaty with the local native king, and hoisted the black, white and red flag of the Kaiser, July 5th, for the first time in Africa. This act gave Germany what later became known as Togoland, a small but fertile colony. Then Nachtigall turned the bow of the Mova toward the Cameroon's coast, farther along the coast, in the Cameroons region, German merchants had already made protectorate treaties with some of the native chiefs, anticipating Nachtigall's arrival. When the English missionaries had warned the natives that German rule meant conscription, the Germans had replied that German rule meant freedom from taxes and customs duties. And in fact, writes a German historian, this rashly made promise, unfortunately given in writing, was what, above all, held the chieftains to the German side. When a British warship suddenly made its appearance a few days before Nachtigall was expected. The warship, however, could do nothing except threaten the natives, since the British consul, Mr. Hewitt, who had the treaty forms with him, had not yet arrived. When Nachtigall appeared on the scene on July 11th, he hastily negotiated a treaty with King Bell, chief of a Negro tribe at the mouth of the river, to whom he gave generous presents, about $5,000. He then hoisted the German flag and sent word to the English, thanking them for their kindness in protecting German merchants in the past, but announcing that Germany would assume such duties in the future. A week later, a week too late, Consul Hewitt arrived on the British gunboat Flirt, only to find Nachtigall in possession. Too late, Consul? He was later called in England. However, Hewitt made the best of the situation by establishing British protectorates over several places on the coast which Nachtigall had neglected. If these protectorates were valid, the Germans were left, according to one British authority, with only about 15 square miles, King Bell's realm. Nachtigall next sailed south to Angra Pequena, and there erected a black, white and red post, with the legend, Keslik Deutsches Schutzgebiet. This perhaps was unnecessary. Other German officials had already hoisted the flag at Angra Pequena, on August the 7th, 1884. It was now Bismarck's task to obtain the consent of the other great powers for the accomplished facts. As regards France, this was easy. Bismarck had taken care to inform Jules Ferry, in advance, that if Nachtigall should disobey instructions by poaching on French preserves, no claim opposed to French rights would be supported. In fact, Bismarck was at this time sedulously friendly toward France, he had virtually made a secret agreement with Ferry to cooperate against English pretensions in Africa. This Franco-German cooperation made it more difficult for England to oppose German claims in southwest Africa and elsewhere. The English cabinet found itself outwitted. Like a good loser, it recognised Germany's protectorate over southwest Africa, from 18 degrees south to the Orange River, excluding the British harbour of Wolvish Bay. It permitted the Germans to enlarge their Cameroon's protectorate, by pushing back into the interior, and also by buying out the British Baptist Mission Station at Victoria, which Hewitt had claimed, and Gladstone magnanimously welcomed Germany into the imperialistic arena with the words, If Germany is to become a colonising power, all I can say is God speed her. She becomes our ally and partner in the execution of the great purposes of providence for the advantage of mankind. Lord Granville told Herbert Bismarck in June 1884 that it cannot be otherwise than all right with us if Germany pursues a colonial policy and opens barbarous lands to civilization and trade. We would certainly be glad of it. It is quite different with France, for wherever they colonize, the French introduce high tariffs, up to 50%, and thereby injure us severely. But the elder Bismarck, 
reading these words, wrote an exclamation mark in the margin. Subsection. France rounds out an empire. France, meanwhile, had not been idle. Before the 80s, the only genuine French possessions on the western coast had been Senegal in the extreme west and the Gabon River between the Congo and the Cameroons. During the early 80s, the French, as has been seen, added to their small Gabon River colony the extensive northern bank of the Congo. At other points where French trading posts, or uncertain French claims had formerly existed, they established bona fide colonies. Though ousted from Nigeria by British competition, they established themselves in Dahomey, just to the west of Nigeria. Here, they had obtained a trading post by treaty with the Negro King in 1878. Over another locality, Porto Novo, they proclaimed a protectorate in 1883, when the Berlin Conference in 1885 agreed that all African territories claimed by a European power must be effectively occupied. France promptly sent garrisons to these posts on the coast of Dahomey. Was it too late? In the same year, Portugal notified the powers that Dahomey had become a Portuguese protectorate by virtue of a treaty with the king. Portugal, however, was a weak rival, easily pushed aside. More troublesome was the native king, ruler of a fierce and primitive Negro people. More than once his dusky highness compelled French representatives to approach his palace through a lane of freshly cut human heads. Patience ebbing, the French made war against him in 1889, and four years later, having defeated his armies, they sent him to Martinique, while they formally annexed the coast and set up puppet kings in the interior under French protectorate. A little farther west, France obtained the Ivory Coast, so named because it was once famed for its exports of elephant tusks. Here, there had been French trading posts since 1842, neglected by Paris, until 1883, when the French government suddenly took charge. Still farther west, in the region now called French Guinea, French merchants had been active without official backing, until, in 1884, a German officer proclaimed a German protectorate over part of the region. France immediately protested, and in the next year, Germany relinquished her claims here, in exchange for parts of Togoland to which France had laid counterclaims. Thus, the colony of French Guinea was founded. From these scattered footholds on the coast, France rapidly pushed into the hinterland, the back country. First, from Senegal, the French fought their way into the interior, following the river up towards its source in the Sudan. From the Senegal Valley, they crossed over, in the 80s, to the Upper Niger, which is very close to the Senegal. Soon, they had conquered Negro kingdoms in the upper and middle portions of the Niger Valley, and were overrunning the great sweep of country enclosed by the northward bend of the river. On the north, they conquered Timbuktu, on the edge of the Sahara, to the south, between 1895 and 1900, they connected their Upper Niger territory with the coastal colonies of Dahomey, Ivory Coast, and French Guinea. What had been isolated coast colonies became windows on the sea, or more realistically, commercial outlets for the vast empire France created in the Western Sudan and the Sahara during the 80s and 90s. One remarkable feature of the story is that the work of conquest was achieved by just a few thousands of Frenchmen. Take, for example, the justly celebrated Binja expedition of 1887. This intrepid young lieutenant, then 31 years of age, started out with a dozen Negro followers to win for France the great stretch of unexplored forest and prairie country between the Upper Niger and the Ivory Coast. It seemed a foolhardy venture, Yet, incredible as it might appear, Binger emerged from the wilderness after a year and a half, carrying in his pocket treaties giving France protectorates over Kong and other Negro kingdoms which lay between the coast and the Niger. The mouth and lower course of the Niger were controlled by the British Royal Niger Company, but in the early 90s the French began to push down the Niger and soon clashed with their British rivals. Simultaneously, French expeditions were pushing in toward the Lower Niger from Dahomey in the west, while others were circling around to the north, cutting the British off from further penetration into the interior. How keen the rivalry was may be seen in the case of Borgu. 
This Negro empire, situated on the western bank of the Niger, was coveted by France because it would give French trade access to the navigable lower Niger, below the rapids of Busa. Though the British had a protectorate treaty with the king of Borgu, the French claimed that the king of Niki was the real suzerain of the Borgu country. French and British expeditions were rushed to Niki, but Captain Lugard, forestalling his competitors by five days, obtained a treaty recognising a British protectorate. He had hardly left when a French force arrived. Too late. A few years later, France suddenly sent troops to occupy Niki, Busa, and other places in Borgu. The indignation of British officials may be imagined. British troops were moved toward the disputed borderlands. French troops likewise. War was in the air. Fortunately, however, calmer councils prevailed in London and Paris, and, on June 14, 1898, a treaty was signed which divided Borgu, France obtaining Niki, and the western part, Great Britain retaining the banks of the Niger, and therefore, control of the waterway. Meanwhile, the southernmost French colony, lying along the coast between the Gabun and Congo rivers, had been a starting point for ventures into the hinterland. A plan to connect French Congo with French West and North Africa had been formulated by the Committee of French Africa and popularised in the 90s. Up the northern bank of the Congo went French explorers, while on the southern bank, King Leopold's agents kept pace. Leopold's success in pushing the Congo Free State's borders north of the equator, north even of the Middle Congo to the Ubangi River, a branch flowing into the Congo on the north, stimulated the French in their penetration of the lands to the north. For a time, it was hoped that the hinterland of French Congo could be extended around the rear of German Cameroons and connected with the French possessions in the western Sudan through the country around Lake Chad. The British, however, encouraged the Germans to extend Cameroons inland to Lake Chad, thinking by this means to cut the French off. Instead, they provoked the French to bolder projects. The conquest of the central Sudan, east and north of Lake Chad, and the invasion of the eastern Sudan, which is the Upper Nile Valley. But of these regions, the story must be told in a later chapter. End of section 7「Section 8 of Imperialism and World Politics, Part 1 of 4, by Parker Thomas Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Alistair. Chapter 6b. Five Decades of Business and Diplomatic Bargaining in West Africa. Subsection. The Negro Republic of Liberia and Mr. Firestone. It may be helpful to review the acquisitions of the powers in Western Africa. The entire coast, with one exception, was appropriated by European powers. The exception is Liberia, a Negro Republic, about as big as the state of Ohio, with perhaps 30,000 civilised Negroes settled along the coast, and between one and two millions of savages in the interior. The Republic was established in 1847 by Negroes who had emigrated beginning in 1822 from America, and has been regarded as a protégé, if not a protectorate of the United States. To be sure, France and England have encroached upon its borders, but its independence has been respected by Europe, largely because of the benevolent interest with which the United States was believed to regard the Little Black Republic. For instance, in 1879 the suggestion that France might establish a protectorate over the country was dropped because of peculiar interest taken by the United States in Liberia. In 1908, Liberia sent a mission to the United States seeking financial and diplomatic assistance. After some delay, President Roosevelt in 1909 dispatched an American commission to investigate the situation, and as a result, the United States began to take a more active hand in Liberian affairs. Previously, Liberia had borrowed money in London and allowed British supervision of her customs revenues. Now in 1912, the outstanding bonds were retired, and a new loan was floated, being taken up largely by the British, on the security of customs, rubber, and other taxes. An American receiver general and financial advisor was installed, 
and United States Army officers began to organise a police force. Liberia's independence was becoming quasi-independence. One result of this quasi-independence has been that Liberia has made less rapid economic progress than the neighbouring French and British colonies. The comparison as regards commerce and railways is very striking. Table ends at about 3 minutes and 45 seconds. Area in square miles. Republic of Liberia, 40,000. British Colony and Protectorate of Sierra Leone, 31,000. French Colony of Ivory Coast, 122,000. Population, 1.5 million in Liberia, in Sierra Leone and in Ivory Coast. Trade in 1923. The Republic of Liberia, $2,528,000. The British Colony and Protectorate of Sierra Leone. $17,786,000. French Colony of Ivory Coast. $7,000,000. Railways. In the Republic of Liberia? None. In the British Colony and Protectorate of Sierra Leone? 338 miles. In the French Colony of Ivory Coast? 230 miles. End of table. A great change was heralded in October 1925 when Mr. Harvey Firestone, president of a great tyre and rubber company, announced that the Firestone Plantations Company would invest $100 million in developing rubber plantations in Liberia. The company had a concession, it was reported, permitting it to select 1 million acres of suitable land. It was estimated that when the trees reach maturity in six to eight years, a crop will be. 250,000 tonnes of rubber, more than half of the world's present production. The Firestone concern, controlling this gigantic industry and employing some 300,000 Negro labourers, will be the dominant factor in the life of Liberia, that is to say, if the project is fully realised. Spain, as an old colonial power, still possesses the barren region of Rio de Oro, north of Senegal, and Spanish Guinea, or Rio Muni, a small foothold near the equator, beside the Canary Islands and the island of Fernando Po, and a small share of Morocco, but these are merely the shreds of an empire. Subsection, the value of French West Africa. French West Africa, as it is now called, includes the coast colonies of Senegal, French Guinea, Ivory Coast, and Dahomey, together with the hinterland, Mauritania, French Sudan, Upper Volta, Niger Territory, for which they serve as outlets. Its governor-general, seated at Dakar, on the coast near Cape Verde, rules an empire of 1,400,000 square miles, and more than 12 millions of Negro Berber and Arab subjects, not including mandated territories. On the north, it is connected by the French Sahara with the French colonies on the Mediterranean coast. To the east, it is linked with the hinterland of French Congo. It is an imposing monument to the bravery of adventurous explorers and the methodical, persistent, unremitting aggressiveness of French colonial governors. From the commercial point of view, however, French West Africa is not as impressive as its extent would suggest. Its trade, to be sure, has increased from 79 million francs in 1895 to 155 million in 1905 and 1,418 million in 1924. A popular manual telling what every Frenchman should know about our colonies assures its readers that henceforth its future is assured. From now on, the black Indies of France are in full prosperity. But the increase has been relatively slow. If one allows for the depreciation of the franc since the war, the figure for 1924 means only about 380 million gold francs, or less than $75 million. This is but a third of the value of the trade of the Philippine Islands. This fact is the more surprising, inasmuch as during the years of conquest, French statesmen made commerce the great reason for colonial aggrandizement, and in the Western Sudan, France was generally considered to have won an enviable prize. Railways had to be built before the products of the interior could be poured out in profusion. 
and although France has laid 1,800 miles of rails in West Africa, only a beginning has been made. French official maps show a projected railway network connecting the Sudan with ports on the Senegal, Guinea, Ivory and Dahomey coasts, but only the line from Senegal has been carried any considerable distance into the interior. Automobiles on caterpillar treads have crossed the Sahara, and airplane routes have been planned. But for a large development of commerce, railways or waterways are still required. Moreover, French West Africa has not yet developed staple products for export on a large scale. French imperialists like to think of West Africa as a veritable empire whose resources are immense and whose inhabitants are profoundly attached to the mother country. No important mines have been opened up. Wild rubber, once highly valued, is losing out in competition with East Indian plantation rubber. Cotton plantations have been laid out, more or less experimentally, chiefly on the Upper Niger, but their output is still negligible in world markets, and irrigation is necessary. The capable Negroes of Senegal have learned to use the curious combination of spade and hoe invented for them by an ingenious Frenchman, and some even use French ploughs. They, however, like the natives of other colonies, tend to raise only the corn, rice and manioc they need to eat, and find it difficult to understand why they should exert themselves to cultivate more groundnuts, from which imitation olive oil is squeezed. Nuts form the bulk of Senegal's products. Palm kernels and the oil pressed from them have accounted for a remarkable increase in the trade of Dahomey, and mahogany has begun to overshadow the other products of Ivory Coast. The future may make West Africa a rich land of cotton, coffee and coca plantations, of grain fields and cattle ranches, of lumber mills, of palm orchards, for all these are possible in different regions, but billions of French capital and decades of constructive enterprise will be needed to make this imperial vision real. Subsection. A Colonial Cinderella, French Congo. French Congo, together with the old colony of Gabun and the hinterland, is now known as French Equatorial Africa. Including the part of German Cameroons acquired by the Great War, this colony is almost a million square miles in area. The regions of Gabun and Moyen Congo are covered with dense jungle. To the north lies a zone of broad savannas, pasture lands and semi-desert areas. It is so sparsely populated, however, and its production of wild rubber and palm oil so small in quantity that the colony must be regarded as of insignificant present value and uncertain future worth. Frenchmen call it the Cinderella of our large colonial family. Cinderella before the fairy godmother came. Hoping to make it more profitable, or rather, less expensive, the government adopted King Leopold's system of concessions, forced labour and monopolies in 1899 through 1900. Footnote, C. Rouget, Op. Sit, page 609, and E. Etienne, La Compagnie de Colonisation, Paris, 1893, Brochure. The Freycinet government had brought in a bill to authorise concessions in 1891, but it was killed in committee. Delcasse, later as Minister of Colonies, granted 3 million hectares in the Ivory Coast to Monsieur Verdier, and 11 million hectares, an area equal to a fifth of France, in Congo to Monsieur Dalmas. But when the facts were made known, there were such protests that his successor, Chartin, annulled the concessions. Nevertheless, a later minister, André Labon, allowed Dalmas to keep his land, and compensated Verdier. It was the apparent success of Leopold in Congo Free State that altered the French opinion, and enabled Troyou to grant concessions wholesale. Confer infra El Vignon, L'exploitation de la trompe coloniale, Paris 1900, Henri Laurent, La crise du Congo Francais in Question diplomatique et coloniale, December 1st, 1900. Footnote ends. To 40 companies, about half the total area of French Congo was parceled out, in great concessions, each carrying monopolistic ownership of rubber or other forest products and industry and agriculture of the conceded area. 
Native tribes, suddenly prohibited from selling rubber and compelled to deliver fixed quantities as a tax to the company authorities, rebelled. Punitive expeditions and atrocities followed. Reports of what was going on leaked into the press in 1905. Natives were being flogged to work. Their wives were taken as hostages. Idlers were being mutilated. One official wrote, in a letter, that natives had been used as targets for pistol practice. De Bratza, former governor and founder of French Congo, was sent to investigate. He died on his way home. Of heartbroken disappointment, it is said. The commission he headed was forbidden to publish a report, and the evidence collected was suppressed, even though its publication was loudly demanded by some members of the French Chamber of Deputies. In connection with the exploitation system, the following population figures are not uninteresting. The decline of population, it must be explained, is partly due to sleeping sickness, alcoholism, and abortions. Undernourishment has lessened resistance to disease, so it is claimed. 1900, estimated, 8 million to 10 million. 1913, estimated, 9 million. 1921, census, 2,845,936. The total commerce of the French Congo before the concession system averaged about 10,900,000 francs, average of 1897 through 9. During the transition period, it was 18 million. From 1903 to 1905, it averaged 20,800,000. In 1922, it was 65,028,576 francs, but the franc had depreciated. In the first five years of the system, six of the companies made a profit of 2,645,045 francs, while 26 others lost 12,510,219 francs. The net loss of all the companies taken together averaged almost 200,000 francs a year. In a word, it was speculative business, and on the whole unsuccessful. Partly because of this practical reason, partly because of criticism in France, and partly because of English protests, the concession system has gradually been weakened. By 1923, only 11 concessionaire companies remained in the field, and the total area of concessions had been reduced from 730,190 square kilometres to 152,390 square kilometres. Moreover, native rights to till farm plots, pasture animals and hunt were partly protected by the Forest Decree of December 31st, 1919. And labour was declared free, though contract labour was allowed under certain safeguards, by the Labour Decree of May 4th, 1922. Subsection, Cocoa and Palm Oil in British West Africa Less than a fourth as extensive, but 50% more populous, and at least twice as valuable commercially, are the colonies and protectorates which Great Britain took for herself in West Africa before 1914. Of these, Nigeria is by far the largest and most important. In itself an empire as big as France and Italy, with a population of 18,500,000 Negroes, more than in all French West Africa. The other British colonies, Gold Coast, Gambia and Sierra Leone, were cut off by the French from expansion into the interior, and remained small. In these British possessions, the districts along the coast are colonies administered by British officials, while the less easily governed regions back from the coast are protectorates, ruled by native kings, and chieftains, subject to a varying degree of British supervision. The system is characteristically British in its flexibility and admirable in its success, especially from a commercial point of view. British imperialism is epitomised in Sir Harry Johnston's statement. Since we have begun to control the political affairs of parts of West Africa and the Niger Basin, our annual trade with these countries, rendered secure, has risen from a few hundred thousand pounds a year to about ten million pounds. This is sufficient justification for our continued government of these regions and their occasional cost to us in men and money. 
and since he wrote, the figure has increased to £25 million sterling, 1924. The relatively superior economic condition of the British, as compared with the other colonies on the western coast, is due chiefly to the fact that instead of resorting, on a large scale, to forced labour and to monopolistic rubber concessions as means of exploitation, the British have allowed native industry to develop more naturally and freely. In Nigeria, for example, the production of palm kernels and palm oil has rapidly grown until it far surpasses that of other colonies, not entirely because of Nigeria's size or fertility, but because the natives, being free to sell their output, have gradually learned the advantage of earning money in this way. Similarly, in the Gold Coast, a few natives began to cultivate cocoa about 50 years ago. They were allowed to own small farms and to sell their crops to traders, and in course of time the industry expanded. By close of the century, about £715,000 were annually exported. By 1913, the quantity was 113 million. By 1923, it was 443 million, worth about $33 million. Compare this last figure with the total exports of all products from the neighbouring and larger French colony of Ivory Coast, namely 35 million francs, about $2,125,000. The little colony of Gold Coast became, with its 2 million Negro inhabitants, through the voluntary efforts of the natives, the world's largest producer of cocoa, and Nigeria rapidly becoming a competitor. Nothing could better demonstrate the folly of Leopold's Congolese system, or the capacity of the Negro for advancement. Incidentally, natives working freely for what they can earn are able to buy more European manufactures than natives compelled to work for nominal wages, or none. The imports of the Gold Coast, where natives are prosperous, were in 1920 almost ten times as great, per capita, as those of Belgian Congo or French West Africa. To simple common sense, these figures seem both astonishing and significant. Their demonstration of the economic and human fallacy implicit in the Leopoldian type of exploitation is so plain that it will not be obscured by adding a reservation or two. First, pessimistic but expert opinions have been quoted to the effect that in about a decade the climate will be too dry, because of deforestation, for the cocoa tree and certain diseases will practically ruin the crop. Second, the governor, Sir H. Clifford of the Gold Coast, is quoted, Cocoa is notoriously one of the least exacting forms of permanent cultivation known to mankind. The trees may be allowed to grow without care till they bear the cocoa pods, which the natives strip off. Yet it remains true that the natives, without forced labour, have produced immense quantities of cocoa, and also that they have purchased more manufactures than the natives of Congo. Sir Frederick Lugard, a recognised authority on African problems, believes, There are few races which are naturally more industrious than the African Negro, and quotes with approval Captain Orr's assertion that, When the African native is given an incentive to work, he will work in a way that is sometimes almost astounding. Subsection. Germany's Share. The share of West Africa obtained by Germany between 1884 and 1914, but lost by the Great War, was larger superficially than that of Great Britain, though not more than a third as large as that of France. German South West Africa was larger by half than Germany. Cameroons, Cameroon as the Germans styled it, was larger by half than France. Togoland, on the other hand, was only a small colony. But commercially, the German share was less valuable than either the French or the British. Cameroons, though it might appear on the map to be as important as British Nigeria, was a tropical wilderness with only about two and two-thirds million Negro inhabitants. Handicapped by its scarcity of labour and its lack of natural waterways, Cameroons exported only about seven million dollars worth of goods before the war, and these were chiefly forest products such as rubber and palm kernels. Moreover, the attempts of the Germans to introduce cotton, cocoa and other staples, employing the plantation system, encountered two obstacles. Native labour was difficult to obtain, 
and Germans with the capital and the wish to found plantations were even scarcer. Southwest Africa, on the border of the temperate zone, had a healthful climate suitable for white colonisation and was expected to become a prosperous land of German ranches. Water was too scarce for agriculture, except in certain regions. But here again it was discovered that few Germans were able or willing to establish cattle ranches, and native labour was a problem. The natives, finding themselves expropriated from their tribal lands, and angered by the overbearing attitude of the German officials and ranch owners, gave continual difficulty. Until the Herreros, one of the native races, desperately rebelled in 1904. The Herero and other rebellions were crushed with efficient ruthlessness at the cost of 5,000 German lives and 600 million German marks. More than half the Herero race was exterminated or driven into exile. The population, small enough before the war, was reduced to less than 100,000. Had it not been for the accidental discovery of diamonds in 1909, Southwest Africa would have been little short of utterly unprofitable. On the other hand, it should be recognised that the Germans were exceptionally earnest in the building of railways, roads, bridges and harbours. Their government buildings were substantial and stately. Their cities were distinguished by order and cleanliness. In sanitation and medical work, they were leaders. It was in their dealings with the natives, and hence in the development of prosperous industries, that the Germans proved relatively unsuccessful. The German government and German imperialists were far from satisfied with their share of West Africa. Repeatedly after the main lines of partition had been roughly staked out, they endeavoured to obtain more. Two possibilities presented themselves, the Portuguese colonies and Belgian Congo. Portugal had on the western coast a large colony of Angola, sterile enough near the shore, but with valuable interior plateaus and forests, and with four million Negro inhabitants, thousands of whom were drafted as labourers for neighbouring colonies. As England was the recognised ally and patron of Portugal, English consent would be necessary for any German designs on Portuguese Angola. Such consent was obtained in 1898 by a secret Anglo-German treaty, which divided the Portuguese colonies in Africa into economic spheres of influence, Germany's share being the southern part of Angola, adjacent to German southwest Africa, besides the northern part of Mozambique on the eastern coast, the remainder being for England. At the time it was anticipated that financial difficulties might compel Portugal to sell her colonies, in which case Germany would be able to purchase her sphere of interest. Portugal, however, suspecting the purpose of the agreement, became so alarmed that England signed a Treaty of Windsor, 1899, reinforcing the Anglo-Portuguese alliance of 1661 and years passed with no sign of willingness to sell on Portugal's part. Becoming impatient, the German government proposed a revision of the Anglo-German bargain. In 1913, Sir Edward Grey agreed, and a new secret treaty was drafted. As Germany's share, the new pact marked out most of Angola, except the part east of 20 degrees east, besides the rich cocoa-producing island of Sao Tomé and its small neighbour, Prince's Island, Principe both lying off the western coast of Central Africa, and also on the eastern coast, the part of Mozambique north of the river Lesango. This time it was agreed that it was unnecessary to wait upon Portugal's voluntary offer to sell. The great powers might step in, ostensibly because of Portuguese misgovernment, and as soon as either Germany or England took its share, the other could occupy the rest. Sir Edward Grey's willingness to conclude such a bargain disposing of the property of a small and allied nation behind the latter's back may be explained partly on the ground of his strong desire for a general agreement with Germany. He was at this same time settling the Anglo-German differences in the Near East, and partly on the ground that English publicists had given Portuguese colonial administration a reputation for corrupt and cruel inefficiency and for inhumane treatment of the natives. The bargain, however, was never fulfilled, nor was it even ratified. Germany opposed its immediate publication, whereas Grey insisted on publication as a condition of ratification. As a result, the draft treaty, initialed by the negotiators, lay in a pigeonhole awaiting signature until the outbreak of war in 1914 made signature impossible. Since then, the Portuguese colonies have increasingly become English spheres of influence, exploited by British capital. 
Another German project was the acquisition of Belgian Congo and French Congo, the possession of which, together with Angola and northern Mozambique, would connect German Cameroons, Southwest Africa, and German East Africa in an unbroken empire of German Middle Africa, sweeping from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean, and from British South Africa to the Sudan. This was not, indeed, an openly avowed aim of the German government. It was the grandiose dream of imperialists, more or less shared by the government in secret, as an ultimate goal. An important step towards its achievement was taken in 1911, when the German government demanded compensation for permitting France to take Morocco. At first, Germany asked for the French Congo, and an option on Belgian Congo, and on Spanish Guinea, wedged in between French Congo and German Cameroons. She obtained 100,000 square miles of French Congo, giving Cameroons a long arm reaching down to touch the Congo River, and another to touch the Ubangi. The option on Spanish Guinea was also granted, but France refused to transfer her option on Belgian Congo, and a compromise was arranged, whereby if Belgium should ever willingly relinquish Congo, the colony's fate would be considered by a conference of the powers. Taken altogether, these German demands of 1911 show clearly the secret aim. In this connection, it is interesting to add that in 1913, Sir Edward Grey of England secretly offered to include Belgian Congo, along with most of the Portuguese colonies, in Germany's sphere of interest. So the German ambassador Lichnowsky claims, but Germany refused to incorporate this offer into a treaty intended for publication. That her refusal was a matter of diplomatic tactics, not of self-denial, may be proved by the conversation which the German foreign minister, Herr von Jagor, held with the French ambassador in the spring of 1914. With the obvious purpose of sounding France regarding Belgian Congo, von Jagor declared that only great powers had the strength and resources needed for colonisation. Smaller competitors must disappear or gravitate into the orbits of the great. The Great War brought such German aims out into the limelight. Imperialists in Germany openly and enthusiastically demanded the creation of a German Middle Africa, extending from the Sahara in the north to the Zambezi in the south, and from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean, and including all the Belgian, Portuguese, French and British possessions in this vast region. But the ordeal of arms decreed that instead of gaining, Germany should lose an empire. The former German colonies were to become mandates of the Allies, Togoland and Cameroon being divided between France and England, Southwest Africa assigned to British South Africa, and, we might as well add now, German East Africa being given to Great Britain, except for a small corner in the northwest, which was handed over to Belgium, and a narrow strip on the south to Portugal. End of section 8 End of Imperialism and World Politics Part 1 of 4 by Parker Thomas Moon